Chapter 51, Wormhole Creation for Dummies Ashlock watched Stella reluctantly get up from the bench with the scroll still in her hands. From how she looked at it, like a boomer trying to read a textbook about coding, Ashlock concluded she was struggling to understand it. Her deep frown, furrowed brows and random huffing were also a clue. This makes no sense. Stella tossed the scroll onto the bench and sat in a cross-legged position on the floor. Calming her breathing, Ashlock saw purple flames appear around her fingers. With her eyes closed, Stella reached forward and brought her fingers together. She then slowly pulled them apart with spatial chi violently arcing between her fingers. The area between her fingers shuddered and crackled like space tearing apart. Then it popped, collapsed, and exploded in her face, sending Stella falling onto her back. She pouted at the sky, stupid technique scrolls written by overhyped idiots that can't make their instructions clear. Ashlock sneaked a peek at the scroll. It was clearly written in a language he had never seen before, but his language of the world allowed him to get the general gist of the text. And sadly, he had to agree with Stella. It was a load of mumbo-jumbo that was of little help. He would even go so far as to call it a scam, as it read like a suspicious pamphlet advertising a nonsense meditation technique mixed with sci-fi terms. But this was a cultivation world, where a scam back on Earth could be a disguised treasure. Assuming Stella wasn't totally scammed and this was indeed a technique that worked, then he had all the intention to try and learn it. The scroll had a mixture of complex diagrams showing hand movements and how to circulate spatial chi to achieve the desired effect. From Stella's actions, Ashlock assumed she had just looked at the pictures and ignored the text since the words clearly stated you had to mark the target node first. A portal had an exit location that had to be anchored before the tunnel through space between the portals could be established. Stella was trying to do it in reverse meaning she opened a crack in space that didn't go anywhere so it would instantly collapse. Another explosion went off Ashlock saw Stella fly across the courtyard before crashing into the far wall. Ah! Stella pushed herself out of the wall and stomped toward Ashlock. Dust dyed her blonde hair, and her white clothes had become filthy, but she didn't seem to care and instead sat on the bench with a huff and angrily picked the scroll back up. She stared at it while mumbling about cursing the author's nine generations and how much she hated reading. It was at this moment there was the sound of rushing water. Stella slightly lowered the scroll and looked over the top. Her eyes wandered to the hole in the ground that led to the hollowed out root. She then yelped as Diana shot out the hollowed root in a ball of dark blue flames and showered everything in water. She landed perfectly in the courtyard's center and shook her hair to remove the water. Oh hey, Stella. Diana waved at the drenched and frustrated girl. Stella just glared at her over the top of the technique scroll. Oops let me clean you up. Diana opened her palm, and all the water in the surroundings rushed toward her hand and gathered in a murky ball which she then dropped to the ground. She came and stood beside Stella and peered at the scroll in her hands, the technique scroll we bought from those merchants. Did you try and teach the patriarch yet? Diana then shuddered, after seeing what he did in the mines, maybe giving him portals would be unfair on the world. Stella shoved the scroll into Diana's hand, I don't understand it. Why are the words so cryptic? Create a fold in space, puncture a hole, connect to the anchor node, stabilize rift, blah blah. To Ashlock, those sounded like simple to follow instructions, well, as simple as creating a portal out of soul power could be. Was his language of the world helping him translate the true meaning behind the metaphors and flowery language that seemed to puzzle Stella? Stella crossed her arms and leaned against Ashlock's trunk while Diana read through the scroll. So, what was down there? Did anything interesting happen? Stella asked while closing her eyes and trying to calm down. Diana chuckled, nothing much, just some pest control. Found an abandoned mining town, and Ashlock started controlling a massive slime and used it to pulverize the rodents. Oh. Stella nodded as if it all made sense, MHM, yes, as expected of Ash. Stop acting like everything that tree does makes sense. Diana rolled her eyes, and are you really allowed to keep calling the patriarch that name? What name? Stella blinked innocently and waved Diana off, just tell me how to decipher the meaning of this scroll. You know how to read them, right? Nope. Diana handed it back, not a clue, and even if I did, this technique is for spatial chi users, not water chi like myself. Comprehending this may negatively affect my understanding of water chi, so it's best I don't even look at it. Stella frowned as she took the scroll back, that's a thing. I have never heard of it. It's superstition. Diana shrugged, but it's not worth it for me to test if the theory is true or not. 
the one thing I have going for me is my deep understanding of water chi and my high level techniques. So I am not willing to throw that all away, why don't you ask Ashlock for help? He has almost perfect spatial chi. Stella stood up and showed the scroll to Ashlock, which was funny because so long as the scroll wasn't face down, he could see it from all angles. Tree, can you read this? Ashlock ignored that Stella had switched her naming convention and flashed his chi a single time for yes. He could read it and even slightly understand it. See? I knew Tree was smart. Stella nodded to herself, and Diana grumbled from the side. There was just one big problem. He had no fucking arms to do the hand techniques. He remembered when the Grand Elder that visited all those years ago said there were no meditation techniques designed for trees, and it seemed that problem carried over to the other techniques. They were designed with the human body in mind. But Ashlock was skeptical of how vital these hand movements truly were. Even from the descriptions, they seemed superficial at best. What I really need is a cultivation for dummies book. I have no idea what I'm doing or how to use my chi away from my body. Even though he understood the scroll on a fundamental level due to his knowledge of science, he was sadly not a protagonist that could use water magic just because he knew how a water molecule was structured. He needed to build up his knowledge, start from the ground and work his way up. And the first step of that process was working out how to either adapt human techniques to ones applicable to trees or create entirely new techniques. How? He honestly had no idea and it was infuriating. Chi was his one ticket to being independent of the system's gotcha draws. So Tree, if you can read it, can you show me the technique? Stella asked with expecting eyes. She looked so excited. He flashed his chi twice for no, and Stella's face fell into a state of contemplation. She looked back at the scroll, scanned the diagrams, and then a realization dawned on her, he has no arms. Day. Diana quipped from the side, can't he use his branches instead? That was like being told to make hand signals with two sticks. His branches did have a vague human arm shape, but he lacked fingers, flesh, or really anything an arm really had. He was a tree, and trees didn't have arms. But without having an open mind, he wouldn't get anywhere. If he doesn't have arms, how can he get arms? His spiritual sight drifted to the silk bag containing a few corpses left over from earlier. Human corpses had arms, and he could control human corpses. Picking the body emitting the most chi, Ashlock cast Root Puppet and within ten minutes, he had control over a tall man with a bare chest that made him think of a monk. Dame, I miss controlling the slime, slime is a bad name. Ashlock liked to name things, so they felt more personal to him, let's call him Blob? Bob? Yeah, Bob sounds good. Okay, so I miss controlling Bob, human bodies are icky. Something about feeling every inch of a human body, brain mush, and organs included, made him mentally shiver likely because he was once human. His soul still had some phantom feeling of what being a human had been like, and this feeling was so far from what was correct that it was jarring. Bob was better. Controlling the slime felt like putting his hand into a bowl of warm soup, much more pleasant. He could still feel the distant sensation as he had never entirely cut his connection with Bob and left him down in the cavern. A choice that was consuming an enormous amount of his chi. It was hard to convey just how much chi it cost to move up a single stage in the soul fire realm. How humans were walking this planet in the higher realms baffled Ashlock no wonder they were willing to face beast tides just to live in the most chi-dense areas, otherwise, ascension would take thousands of years. Anyway, keeping control of Bob was using around half of his chi. The rest was split between digging deeper through the mountain to have the entire mine under his roots control and furthering his cultivation which at this point felt like dripping water into a swimming pool. He needed more chi generation. A problem for another time. Ashlock got the root puppet to stand on shaky legs and wander to the center of the courtyard with a black root snaking out his gormlessly open mouth. The two girls gave the corpse a wide breadth and watched from the side with excited chatter. As unsettling as it was, Ashlock focused entirely on the corpse, trying to use its senses to see and hear rather than just command it from afar he wanted to get the full human experience in hopes it would shed light onto cultivating as one. It was disorientating, to say the least, but he bared with it. There was a moment of silence as the corpse stood deathly still, until its eyes snapped open. Ashlock could see like a human for the first time in a decade. It was limiting and blurry, which was to be expected. Ashlock looked left and right, rolled the man's shoulders, and clenched his fist into a ball. The body felt strong the muscles barely bulged but produced such strength. 
still have no idea how to cultivate as a Ashlock shut his mouth as he realized he was trying to talk aloud with the corpse and sounded like a dying bagpipe. The judgmental and intense stares from the two girls didn't help make it any less embarrassing. He lowered his head and looked at the floor. Wait. Why was the grass glowing? It was subtle, but there was a faint green glow. Ashlock switched his view to his main body and opened the forbidden eyelid. Both Stella and Diana shuddered and summoned their soul fire, which appeared as blindingly bright blobs of chi in his red-tinted sight. Looking at the corpse with his demonic eye, Ashlock confirmed his suspicion. This cultivator is an evergreen with a green soul core, no wonder the grass glows green for him. Ashlock's spiritual sight allowed him to see the faint flow of chi in the air, but his demonic eye could see elemental chi. Such as the wind chi in the air, water chi around Diana, and spatial chi around Stella. Through his demonic eye, capable of seeing the threads of all types of chi, Ashlock used the corpse as a puppet to be his arms and went through the steps of the technique. His demonic eye shifted to stare at Stella. He saw thin waves of spatial chi wafting off her into the surroundings before dissipating. Identifying the area right next to Stella's head as having the densest waves of spatial chi, he picked that area as the node or anchor for the portal's destination. He then made the hand movements with the corpse and realized a fatal issue. The corpse had residual nature chi, not spatial. Deciding to go for it anyway, Ashlock searched spatial chi from his own soul core through the connection, shattered the corpse's soul core, and flooded its body with spatial chi. The corpse's skin melted as it set on fire, but Ashlock persevered for the final few seconds. The stupid hand sign was done, spatial chi arched between the corpse's fingers, and for the briefest of moments, a tunnel through space had been formed. He then made the corpse poke its flaming finger through the portal, and to his delight, Ashlock saw it reappear and poke Stella's face causing her to understandably yelp. Ashlock had cast his first ever cultivation technique in the most roundabout way possible. But there was little time to celebrate as both portals collapsed, and the corpse's severed finger fell to the ground beside Stella. Oh, not again, Stella shouted and tried to leap away. What the portal exploded in a brilliant wave of spatial chi, and Diana was thrown through the wall. As the dust settled, Ashlock decided using corpses that melted and then exploded after just a few seconds was less than ideal. If only he had something he could control that was also attuned to spatial magic. Wait. What about Bob? Chapter 52, Stupid Hand Gestures Ashlock mentally frowned at the idea. Although Bob had a body of almost pure spatial chi, he was a glorified jelly with an unsurprising lack of limbs, which hampered his plans big time. Without hands, the human technique scroll was annoyingly useless but he absolutely refused to believe creating literal wormholes through space was only possible through some stupid hand gestures. Once again, he was stumped. But there was good news, which was hard to ignore. He had done it. No longer was he a mere bystander, unable to wield magic and bend the natural laws like other cultivators. He was now an actual cultivator. To some in this world, a botched spatial tunnel may be so-so, but to him? A human mind from Earth stuck in a tree? It was fucking fantastic. He had quite literally cast magic, almost without the help of the system. He was a space-manipulating tree. Now, if only he could figure out the secret behind hand gestures, all of his problems would be solved. Right? Alas, that was far from the truth. It was becoming more apparent with every passing day that he needed to increase his chi intake somehow. If casting just a single portal or controlling a slime took so much of his chi, how could he face the beast tide? Or fight toe to root with another cultivator? Naturally, he needed a solution. Upping his cultivation stage increased his maximum chi pool but had less effect on his chi regeneration. One major bottleneck was his cultivation technique Transpiration of Heaven and Earth, which was C-grade. If he could pray to the Gacha Gods and have this upgraded, then his chi generation should increase. Another reason to curse the system. But blaming others was a poor man's excuse. He had a golden finger in this world, and despite its faults, the system did give him a wide range of valuable tools. He just needed to use them. How did he currently generate chi? Through his roots and leaves. As his roots burrowed deeper, he linked up with more spirit stone ore, which he could siphon for more chi. A finite resource the spirit stone ore was sparse as most were already mined. So he needed a more scalable and reliable solution. The ley line? If he dug deep enough, he should reach the planet's chi highway, but that was risky. It sounded like trying to touch a power line and expecting not to be fried alive. His mind drifted as he browsed his skills for a solution. Other than his roots, 
his next source of chi was his leaves. He had already grown so large, but he could always grow bigger all he had to do was invest more chi into growth. More leaves, and a bigger trunk. A limiting solution, he could only grow so big before he risked standing out. If the heavenly lightning had taught him anything, standing too tall was asking to be struck. There had to be something he was forgetting. He needed more leaves, like one of those solar farms. Wait. Aren't there solar farms with a tower in the center holding up a tank of water, and then there are hundreds of mirrors in a circle directing the sunlight at the water tank to heat the water? Ashlock didn't have mirrors or a water tank. But he did have hundreds of trees surrounding his mountain, and some were even his offspring. Could he link up to them and use their leaves to gather chi? Was that even possible? There was only one way to find out. Ashlock identified the closest baby demonic tree and began to send a root toward it. However, since the birds didn't die instantly to his poison, the demonic tree was a few hundred meters away from the base of the mountain, so it would take around a day to reach, especially with his chi spread so thin between keeping the slime under control and his deep roots burrowing into the mine. All the more reason for him to increase his chi intake. It might even help him cultivate faster and reach the next realm. This is why there are no high realm spatial chi users. Diana's shout broke Ashlock from that trail of thought. Ashlock peered through the dust cloud swirling through the courtyard. He saw the black-haired girl hacking up her lungs and staggering through a hole in the wall she had been thrown through. Considering the structural quality of these inner courtyard walls which had survived the Grand Elder's supernova, the fact Diana had literally gone through the white brick like a wrecking ball was a testament to the explosive power of a spatial portal collapsing. While Diana was coughing up her lungs, Stella lay on the ground near the doorway that connected the central courtyard to the training one. Her hair was disheveled, and she was blinking away a headache or concussion she was clearly disorientated and confused. Ashlock took a moment to rethink his actions. Cultivators were strong, but they could still get hurt. Even though Stella's chi waves were the only way he could set up an anchor, to open the portal so close to their heads was a terrible idea in hindsight. Diana's words also interested him. So there were no high realm spatial soul core masters out there? Or just a lot less compared to other soul core types? Ashlock looked around at the destruction he had caused from such a small experiment. The puppet was nothing but a melted puddle on fire, an arm burning in lilac flames poked out the sludge as if gesturing to the sky, and it was missing a single finger, which was over near Stella. What if it had been an arrogant cultivator instead of a puppet? Or, to go a step further instead of a finger, a person's head? What if a spatial chi cultivator made a portal and stepped through, but then it collapsed? Would they be sliced in half? Ashlock couldn't help but think of Stella. She had a spatial chi soul core and had tried to learn this technique only moments ago. What if she had successfully created the spatial tunnel and poked her head through it? Spatial chi, was dangerous. The applications were hard to ignore. They could achieve things the other elements could only dream of. But it naturally came with significant downsides. Luckily, they were ones he could avoid, so long as he took the proper precautions. For example, puppets. They were perfect for experiments, but from now on, he would conduct them away from the girls. You all right, Stella. Diana half limped toward Stella her stride already returning after such an accident. Yet. Yeah. Stella replied with a distant expression. Her eyes wandered between the melted corpse and the severed finger below where the portal had exploded. I. I think I understand why father forbade me from learning the more advanced spatial techniques you know, when I was a kid. Her hands were shaking a little, and her eyes darted to the still open scroll left behind on the bench. But if I could wield spatial magic, I could be more useful to tree. Diana rolled her eyes, you will be no use dead. Stella stood on shaky legs and walked toward the bench, not if I kill my enemies first. Even if I can't use the portals to travel around, just exploding one in someone's face should smack them off their feet. Ashlock had to agree. After seeing the destruction, he stopped associating spatial chi with just portals to move around, hell, even with only portals, could he create them around people's necks? He thought back to when he used the technique. The presence of spatial chi around Stella was vital as an anchor. So I can only decapitate other spatial types? That doesn't sound right. Nothing made sense. Ashlock needed more techniques to work from. For his entire life in this world as a tree, he had lacked options to be proactive, but now he had a soul core and actual techniques to look at. MHM. Diana contemplated Stella's words. I can see the potential, but that technique might be slightly too high level. 
didn't you take out some basic technique manuals from the library? Ashlock had never heard such sweet words in all his tree life. How could Stella be so considerate to bring him so many presents whenever she left the pavilion? He almost forgave her for leaving him alone for a year. But only almost. Stella was busy scowling at the scroll and only murmured to herself, how did he do it? Hey! Are you listening to me? Diana asked in a bored tone and tapped Stella on the shoulder. Ah! Stella jolted, don't do that, and stop sneaking up on me. I'm concentrating. Sure you are. Diana smiled, why don't you show our patriarch the other spatial techniques you have? Oh, the ones from the library. Stella blinked in confusion. Diana nodded, yep. Stella didn't seem enthusiastic. She just shrugged. They are nothing compared to this technique, and if Ash can understand this one, the others will surely bore him. You called him Ash again. Diana sighed, not to be rude, but Ashlock's control over his spatial chi is amateur at best. But his potential is astounding. Show him the easier techniques. He might even be able to teach them to you too. Diana's hand rested on the top of the open scroll and pushed it down, so give this one a break for now. She smiled, but it wasn't a kind smile, okay. Fine. With a flash of power from Stella's ring, the scroll vanished, and a leather-bound book engraved with the golden text spatial techniques of the Azure clan took its place. Perfect, you read that to Ashlock, and I'll clean this mess up. Diana walked off toward the rubble littering the courtyard with blue flames shrouding her skin. Stella didn't even respond, and after a big sigh, she sat on the bench and cleared her throat. Ash. I will try my best, but reading this flowery nonsense has never been my forte. If you don't get something, flash your chi, and I'll try to explain my own terms. Ashlock desperately hoped this old-looking book from the Azure clan would answer his confusion about hand gestures and their significance to casting techniques. Chapter 1 Cultivation Basics Stella sighed before continuing on to the rest of the text. Cultivation is the art of assimilating with heaven's will. Through meditation, one's body and mind gain a more profound connection with the heavens. After the manifestation of one's own ego in the form of a soul core under a particular domain the heavens acknowledge the chosen path. Allowing cultivators to manifest their will upon the world and bend the natural laws to their desire. None of that sounded particularly useful except a single phrase. To bend the natural laws to their desire suggested the use of chi was unscientific. To approach the techniques of cultivators with his analytical and scientific mind was potentially foolish. Maybe the hand signs were merely superficial a simple way for cultivators to focus their will while learning a new technique. Had he been focusing on the wrong things all along? Stella's voice became background noise as his mind focused. He felt chi flow through his body. Between heaven and earth, he was the connection. His soul core hummed converting the untamed and wrathful will of the heavens into spatial chi. After the manifestation of one's own ego in the form of a soul core under a particular domain the heavens acknowledged the chosen path. Had the heavens acknowledged his chosen path? Didn't the system randomly decide his path for him after he spent his credits for a random draw? Maybe the system's rewards weren't so random after all. Ashlock then heard a loud sigh, followed by Stella turning the page. Chapter 2 Basic Technique, Telekinesis Chapter 53, An Enigma Arrives Ashlock ignored the sound of Diana working in the background to clean up the mess after the portal explosion and focused wholeheartedly on Stella's reading as the title of Chapter 2 made his demonic eye, sealed within his trunk, flash with interest at the mention of telekinesis. Portals were neat and would give him more range, such as casting devour through a portal to bring a corpse back for him to eat. But telekinesis fixed another issue. His lack of hands a problem he had somewhat circumnavigated with his root puppet skill but to be able to write on a wall with a piece of chalk via telekinesis or move corpses into piles so he could section them out before devouring them would be a big boon for him. Also, not to mention the offensive capabilities. Earlier, he had played with the idea of flame-covered leaves and using them to kill birds. What he had been lacking was a technique to control the leaves. Wait, telekinesis wouldn't just solve my issue of no hands. It would quite literally give me hands. Could he use telekinesis as a substitute for hand gestures? After frowning at the book for an entire minute, Stella began to read very slowly, telekinesis, the most basic form of spatial manipulation. The natural world is filled with interactions demonstrating all things interconnectedness. For example, the grass breathes life into the soil, the flap of a bird's wing seeks the heavens for greater heights, and the warmth of fire are manifestations of the heavens will to provide comfort and sustenance. 
actually a surprisingly helpful piece of text. It spoke of how the heavens will affect it all of reality and also told Ashlock what he was missing. Enlightenment a word Ashlock's superstitious and logical mind despised. The art of cultivation should make sense. The fact grass produced nature aligned chi or a bird flapping its wings resulted in air chi it made sense on a pseudoscience basis. But this wasn't a world of science but one under heaven's supernatural will. A force that seemed to work in mysterious ways. Comprehending these mysteries of the universe should lead to eventual enlightenment allowing him to wield and bend the will of the heavens to his desires. Stella grumbled to herself about something being complete nonsense before continuing, Spatial Chi is a unique and ever-present presence that permeates all objects and environments. However, to access it, one must learn to look beyond the physical form of objects and not be constrained by preconceived notions of how the universe should behave. By doing so, one can learn to manipulate objects and events on the spatial plane, tapping into the subtle yet powerful forces that govern the universe. Ashlock could tell his language of the world skill was doing the heavy lifting here and converting the flowery nonsensical language in the book into something he could understand. Stella was struggling. It may have felt like reading a scientific paper mixed with ancient poetry to her. However, for him, the book talked about gravity in a roundabout way. Wait. Stop thinking like that. Ashlock mentally smacked himself he had to change his way of thinking. It felt so easy to leap to the conclusion of gravity. But the text, helpfully translated, clearly stated that he should not be constrained by preconceived notions of how the universe should behave. He needed to somehow reach enlightenment. If only someone could tell him how. Ashlock had cultivated for years, sat in complete silence, and absorbed chi to further his cultivation. Yet, he never once felt enlightened. What more could he do? As the great monarchs of old have preached since the cultivation era, we all reach enlightenment by staying off the narrow path in our minds in different ways. No two people will achieve the same conclusion. What matters is how the heavens interpret our understanding of its mysteries and what we believe to be true. Stella threw the book to the side, stood up, and faced Ashlock with a pout. Did you understand any of that? Because I sure as hell didn't. Diana chuckled to the side while collecting the rubble into her spatial ring which Ashlock thought was rather neat. If only people back on Earth had spatial rings, they would have many uses. For example, rescue efforts would be a breeze after natural disasters. And going on holiday would be a bagless affair. Ashlock still didn't know the total capacity of those rings, but what if they could fit a car inside? Wouldn't it be neat to summon a car out of thin air at any moment? You could even take it on holiday with you. What's so funny? Stella frowned over her shoulder at Diana. Nothing, nothing. Diana waved her off. It's just that all my cousins had the same reaction as you when they were given those technique manuals rather than a personal tutor. I am so glad I never had to read one of those. You lived in a rich family. Stella furrowed her brows, why couldn't everyone have a tutor? Diana rolled her eyes, didn't you just read a passage on why that doesn't work? We all reach enlightenment in our own way by straying off the narrow path. Some people, such as myself, respond very well to outside guidance while others can form a deep connection with the heavens will on their own. Also, tutors are ridiculously expensive as they sacrifice their own cultivation time to teach. What the young lady said is correct. A man's voice filled the courtyard. Everybody paused. An elderly-looking chap with a cane stood in the open doorway to the pavilion which had been closed a moment ago. His countenance bore a kindly, almost grandfatherly air that was hard to resist. He was clad in a white robe that, at first glance, seemed plain and unremarkable. However, upon closer inspection, one could discern that the fabric was of superior quality, though purposefully made to look unpretentious. As he entered the courtyard, the man's wooden cane tapped out a soft rhythm on the stone path with each measured step. The oddity of the situation held everyone's attention as they watched him amble past Diana and then Stella. Finally, with a grunt of effort, he lowered himself onto the wooden bench beneath the welcoming shade of Ashlock's canopy. His almost withered hand, with bulging veins peering through his sun-kissed skin, reached over and picked up the half-open technique manual. Telekinesis, I? Is someone here a spatial chi user? The man's sharp eyes darted between Stella and Diana. Both stood in silence, neither offering an answer to the intruder. Nothing made sense. Ashlock hadn't heard him open the door. The man's confidence was uncanny for someone without a hint of chi coming from them. Was this man truly a mere mortal? Or was he hiding his cultivation somehow? Ashlock then saw Maple blink out of existence and reappear at the far end of the courtyard, 
as far from the man as possible. Larry was also creeping backward across Ashlock's branches as if trying to escape. Ah, come on, this old man doesn't bite. The man broke down into a hearty chuckle that diffused the tension somewhat. Ashlock didn't believe for one second the man came with good intentions. He had enough superficial knowledge of this world to know people don't help each other out of the kindness of their hearts. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Survival of the fittest. Especially the demonic cultivators, and if this man's withered appearance was anything to go by, he might even dabble in the darker arts. Yes sir, I don't believe we are acquainted. Stella furrowed her brows as she saw the old man sitting on her bench and holding the technique manual she had been reading. From Stella's respectful attitude, Ashlock deduced she was also suspicious of the man's true cultivation realm. Old monsters were eccentric fellows and easy to anger, the true enemy of any protagonist due to their unpredictability. Oh. Silly me. The man shook his head, where are my manners in my old age? The name's Senior Lee, or at least that's what my buddies call me. Lee then waved the book in front of Stella's face, I have met quite a few spatial chi cultivators in my travels. Maybe I could be of some assistance. Stella looked utterly stumped. Her mouth moved, but no words came out for a while, much to the man's apparent amusement. Senior Lee, your offer is most generous, but I fear I have nothing to offer in return. Lee chuckled and waved her off, my life will end sooner rather than later. What use have I for worldly desires? Rather, I seek fulfillment from teaching the next generation. Passing on my knowledge, and hopefully, seek a cure to this dying world. The silver ring on his hand flashed with power a teapot and teacup appeared. Just like his robe, they were plain white without any remarkable details, but anyone could tell the china was of excellent quality. Without taking his eyes off Stella and keeping a relaxed composure, the teapot and cup remained floating in front of the man as if they were perched on an invisible table. The teapot then tilted, and steaming hot golden tea carefully filled the teacup to the brim before vanishing in a flash of silver back into his ring. Ashlock didn't have a sense of smell, but just from the liquid's color, he guessed it was lemon tea. The man took a careful sip and seemed to relish the taste as it wet his lips. It was a fantastic display of telekinesis, assuming that is what he used. But most important of all, there were no hand gestures. So unless he had managed to do them secretly from within the folds of his robe, away from prying eyes, Ashlock had further evidence the hand gestures were pointless. Stella shifted nervously on her feet clearly unsure of what to do. Diana was hanging in the back, also unmoving. Ashlock couldn't blame them for their indecisiveness. The stranger's strength and true purpose were unknown. There was a saying that if you are the dumbest person in the room, allow the smarter ones to yap away their secrets and learn until you are the smartest there with your cards held close to your chest. The man was the same. Rather than flaunting his wealth or cultivation, he gave subtle hints that kept you second-guessing. Another example was he gave such a generic name and didn't boast about his family or sect. He was an enigma. A dangerous and confusing individual of unknown skill and origin. This was how a true cultivator should act. The hidden masters that kept to themselves lived long, while the arrogant young masters flaunting their family's wealth and fame inevitably met the same fate. An early death. In a way, Ashlock followed the same principle since that night Stella murdered all the servants in the pavilion to always observe before taking action. As a tree, unable to run away, if Ashlock attacked the man and he turned out stronger than expected and escaped, he could return later with friends or an army and decimate the Red Vine Peak. The tension was running high. Ashlock had always observed from afar, and those that visited Red Vine Peak in the past were either arrogant young men without the cultivation to back up their ego or that one time a grand elder from the disciplinary committee visited. But he had been an old friend of Stella's parents. Was Lee a friend or foe? If Diana could somehow bait him into the mine below, he could use Bob to overpower him, considering he is alone and displayed talent in using spatial chi, but what if Lee was a dual core? Or so strong he could just slap Bob into another dimension. Maybe he could try and use his demonic eye to inflict the same mental damage that Stella and Diana suffered? Or could Larry chomp Lee's head off? Probably not. If only he knew Lee's true strength. For all he knew, the man was using artifacts to imitate telekinesis which is why he emitted no chi signature. Or maybe Lee wasn't even human. Despite the tension, Lee sat happily and drank his tea. He was completely unbothered, and a cheery smile never left his face. Either this guy was an Oscar-level actor, or that tea was really that good. After the awkward silence became unbearable and Lee showed no interest in engaging in idle chatter, Stella gathered the courage and asked, Senior Lee, 
do you mind if I have a cup of tea? Without another word, the old man summoned a teacup and poured tea with the still hot teapot. Of course you can. Here, catch. Wastella stumbled forward as Lee threw the teacup to the ground in front of her Stella's purple chi flared to life, and the cup of tea paused a mere inch above the ground before it could hit the stone and shatter. Ashlock watched the elderly man chuckle to himself, which made Stella shudder. He took a final sip of tea before the teacup vanished into his ring. He then leaned back and looked at the purple flames coating Stella with an amused expression. So you were the one with spatial chi all along. Lee smiled. Let's talk. Chapter 54, A Rare Breed Stella felt a wave of relief as she managed to mobilize her chi just in time to catch Senior Lee's teacup before it smashed. Why had he thrown it like that? So you were the one with spatial chi all along. Lee. Smiled. Let's talk. Stella could hear her own blood rushing through her ears. Her heart raced, and her hands felt clammy. What did this man want to talk about? Why was he so interested if someone was a spatial chi cultivator? Stella felt a shiver run down her spine as Senior Lee casually sat on the bench, looking at her with an amused smile. She straightened herself and used her spatial chi to bring the teacup up from the floor and into her hand. The strong lemon scent wafting from the tea tickled her nose and smelled delicious. But she resisted taking a sip and asked, what does Senior Lee wish to speak about? Her soul core hummed, and her finger itched, ready to summon a sword from her spatial ring at a moment's notice. Her mind raced with battle plans. The most important for her was to draw the man away from Ash, and she trusted in her mobility to run away due to her Lightning Deo greatly empowering her speed. For her, Lightning meant violent speed, whereas, to others, it may be a form of overwhelming power. Why the serious face? Senior Lee said warmly, Do you think I came here to rob you? Cultivators are all so suspicious these days. Senior Lee shook his head with mock sadness, It brings a tear to my eye, I tell you. Although I will be the first to admit, hand on my heart, I did some dishonorable things in my time. But. My ex-wife was an absolute backstabbing bitch and deserved everything that happened to her. Ahem. Senior Lee coughed awkwardly, got a little off topic there, sorry about that. Anyway, how's the tea? Stella was perplexed. She looked down at the tea that was still warm in her hand and debated if she should drink it or not. Then, deciding not to offend the odd man any further, she took a sip, and her eyes went wide. It was delicious, and the warm liquid was filled with chi. Stella couldn't believe it. Had precious chi-filled lemons been used to make this? Good, right? A close friend of mine from the Celestial Empire has lemon trees on his estate. Whenever I visit, he is always excited to give me his newest batch of chi-soaked tea leaves. Senior Lee chuckled and looked past Stella, Young lady, would you also like some tea? No, Senior. I am quite all right. Diana's voice came from behind Stella. It was a good move. If the tea was poisoned and they both drank it, then they would both be compromised. Senior Lee seemed nice enough but so were most cultivators until they stabbed you through the heart with a rusted blade and stole everything you possessed. Also, the off-handed mention of the Celestial Empire threw Stella off. Only merchants were known to travel the wilderness between the Empire and the demonic sex. Is Senior Lee a merchant from the Celestial Empire? Stella studied Senior Lee's reaction, but he just shrugged. Merchant would be the wrong term, as I have no interest in buying or selling anything. But I often travel searching for something interesting during my free time. Senior Lee chuckled heartedly, when you have lived far too long, life becomes dreadfully dull. The same mundane routine over and over and over again. It's why, much to my family's annoyance, I randomly disappear and go on adventures searching for things to stimulate my mind. Stella took another sip of tea and thought over Senior Lee's words. In summary, he was old, traveled the wilderness for fun, and knew a friend in the Celestial Empire. However, he also seemed to have a relatively carefree attitude. What is the Celestial Empire like? Diana walked on over and stood beside Stella. I heard some rumors but have never gone there myself. Senior Lee's mood immediately soured. Far too much politics and backstabbing. He sighed and leaned back on the bench, enjoying the clear blue sky. I prefer it out here in the demonic sex. At least you know the blade is coming. His light smile returned as he lightly shook his head, enough about that annoying place and my blabbering. What chi do you practice? young lady. Me. Diana pointed to herself, my cultivation path lies with water. She summoned a swirling ball of dark blue flames, 
although I have inferior spirit roots. Senior Lee nodded sagely, MHM, I see. Your control and cultivation stage are still impressive for your age. I always find demonic cultivators growth interesting in that regard. Compared to celestial cultivators that have far less explosive growth. He then turned to look at Stella, you also seem to have inferior roots, but was that always the case? Stella blinked. The question completely caught her off guard. What do you mean, Senior? Senior Lee kept one hand on his walking stick and held out his other hand as if waiting for hers. I can check for you, but I believe you used to have normal or maybe even superior spirit roots. Stella felt apprehensive about giving her hand to the old man, but it felt awkward making him hold his arm out, so she obliged. To her surprise, Senior Lee didn't reach for her hand. Instead, he gripped her wrist with two fingers and a thumb and closed his eyes. She felt nothing, and a second later, Senior Lee opened his eyes and removed his hand. Not a hint of tainted chi and your growth his eyes flickered to Diana, is even higher than a demonic cultivator a few years your senior. Before Stella could enjoy the compliments, Senior Lee shook his head, what a silly girl. Why did you force your cultivation so quickly without establishing a strong foundation? I... Stella couldn't believe it. She didn't even know her spiritual roots had degraded so far. However, she did remember that cultivation had been far easier in the past and that her bottlenecks were getting harder to overcome. But with nobody guiding her and no cultivation techniques other than the one taught by her father when she was so young, she found the only way to progress was to just push her body harder to get stronger. I had no choice. Stella's eyes drifted to the floor as shame plagued her mind. I had to get strong as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, my environment here was less than ideal. Senior Lee looked around the wrecked courtyard and seemed to come to a conclusion. Are you a social outcast? His eyes softened a little, don't worry. As wrathful as the heavens are to the wicked, it smiles kindly upon the faithful. Your tribulation will be a breeze, but your future potential will be forever stunted as you are now. Stella's eyes widened, and a feeling of indescribable doom overcame her. Being told your cultivation was stunted was like being sentenced to death. In a world where near immortality for those in the nascent soul realm and above was possible, knowing you could never reach that level and would die of old age in just a few hundred years was devastating. Senior Lee's silver ring flashed, and a bottle of pills appeared. These are Golden Stream pills. Quite rare, especially out here. The pill bottle floated up, likely from telekinesis, and dropped into Stella's awaiting hand. You can take them. I have no need for such things. Stella felt the smooth porcelain pill bottle in her hand. It was cold to the touch, and she could feel the weight of some pills inside. They shifted around as she rotated the pill bottle to take off the cork stopper there was an audible pop and a wave of cool air that smelled of damp grass. Her nose twitched involuntarily, and Senior Lee seemed to find her reaction amusing. Pretty nasty stuff that tastes almost as bad as it smells. Senior Lee said, although their effects are worth it. I can't guarantee they will fix you considering the extensiveness of the damage, but they should help slow the degradation at least. Stella's ring flashed, and the pill bottle disappeared inside. I am deeply grateful to Senior Lee for his infinite kindness, she expressed as she bowed deeply, her gaze fixed on the ground before her. Blah. Senior Lee waved her off, I hate all this formality crap. To me, those pills are worthless. But Senior. It still feels wrong to accept such a gift. Then give me something in return. That way, it's a trade rather than a gift. Stella wondered if she had anything of value to give. From the top of her head, she owned a pair of black wooden daggers, red maple leaf earrings, her artifact clothes, and that portal technique scroll. When she thought about it like this, she didn't own much. Even the red vine peak could be taken away at any moment from her by a stronger cultivator. It was only due to the patriarch's twisted kindness that she hadn't been kicked out by another family. Senior. Stella bowed again, I am a few worldly possessions and have nothing to offer out. Ashlock dropped a large fruit on Stella's head. It was one of his non-poisonous ones and was a beautiful red color, like a warm sunset. He had poured a lot of chi into it, and it was only due to its size and a hard outer casing that no bird came to take it yet. Also, flaring his chi to keep them off had helped. Ashlock found it hard to believe, but Senior Lee might be one of the first generous people he had met in this world and just for that refreshing perspective, he was happy to give up a fruit. At first, he had been suspicious, and even now, he still harbored on the edge of caution. But Lee had demonstrated compassion and generosity. 
two emotions he had rarely seen from cultivators other than Stella and maybe Diana. Stella rubbed her head and then noticed the fallen fruit. Oh oh. It must have been ripe already. Stella then used telekinesis, the most basic spatial cultivation spells, and passed it to Senior Lee's hand. Ashlock appreciated her attempts at covering up his stunt. Although he wished to award a fruit, he still wanted to keep his identity hidden away from Senior Lee if possible. Oh! What a magnificent fruit! Senior Lee seemed genuinely happy with his gift. I'm sure my friend will be able to make some fantastic fruit tea with this when I return home. I'll come by again and let you taste it. The fruit, larger than Senior Lee's torso, vanished in a flash of silver. He then leaned against Ashlock's trunk and closed his eyes for a second. A floating ethereal wisp appeared in Ashlock's mind, thank you, spirit tree, for the gift. I will make sure to use it well. His voice sounded weird. Everyone else's voice was distant, as if they were talking through a wall. So why could Ashlock hear Senior Lee's voice inside his mind? Was this telepathy? Or was that wisp thing speaking? You're welcome. Ashlock replied. He didn't know what else to say or if Senior Lee could even hear him. Senior Lee's jolly laughter echoed throughout his mind. Now, this is interesting. I have never encountered a talking tree before. Chapter 55, Starboy Ashlock hadn't been the most social man back on Earth, but he'd never had issues striking up a casual conversation. But there were limits and boundaries, likely for any person. Having an old dude likely an immortal grandpa laughing inside his head and floating around as a wisp made it impossible for Ashlock to think straight. How fascinating. Senior Lee noted as he flew around. The wisp then looked down the trunk and saw the demonic eye looking curiously back at him. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the man seemed unbothered by the eye. Ashlock switched his view to the eye and looked up at the wisp. He could see a colorless tendril of chi that linked to a spot in his trunk, likely connecting the wisp and the elderly man outside which he couldn't see through his bark. Despite the temptation to open his trunk and use his demonic eye to stare Senior Lee right in the face, Ashlock hesitated. He didn't sense any hostility from the man. While Senior Lee's wispy body seemed impervious to the eye's effects, Ashlock couldn't be certain that his actual physical body would be as resilient. Therefore, Ashlock decided against using his demonic eye for the time being, choosing instead to observe Senior Lee more closely before deciding how to proceed, as he didn't wish to anger the man especially considering he was inside his head. Through his eye, Ashlock watched Senior Lee tilt his head upwards and stare at Ashlock's soul core, which hummed as Chi funneled in from above and then poured down the side of the tree trunk like lilac waterfalls into the roots below. Not only a talking tree but one with spatial Chi. Senior Lee said as he frantically looked around, but why am I inside your body rather than your mind? What do you mean? Ashlock asked, and the wisp whirled around and stared wide-eyed at Ashlock. Not his body but his floating consciousness a hazy cloud of blue nodes that interconnected everything. Two souls in one body? No. That doesn't seem right. Senior Lee tilted his head and looked around, your consciousness it seems incompatible with your body. Is that why you can talk? That seemed very worrying but also made sense. Ashlock had gotten increasingly used to his life as a tree, but he still thought like a human. So was Senior Lee saying his human mind and tree body weren't intertwined? Senior Lee continued rambling to himself. Were you once human and then stuck inside a tree? That would explain why you can talk like one. Have you really never met a talking tree before? Ashlock countered. If possible, he didn't want to disclose his true identity as a reincarnated human. Senior Lee seemed nice enough, but it was always good to be cautious, especially about an unusual and personal topic. I have conversed with spirit trees before but even one at the Star Core realm couldn't form coherent words. Rather, they spoke through emotions like anger or sadness. Well, that was interesting and also very awkward. How could Ashlock explain his situation now? He'd hoped that saying he was a spirit tree would convince the old man that nothing was abnormal. Have you ever met a spirit tree at a higher realm than Star Core? Ashlock was curious about what his future may look like. The wisp seemed to enter a state of deep contemplation for a while, occasionally flashing like a firefly. Then, after a while, Senior Lee broke the silence. Now that you mention it, there was only a single time. But I am oath-bound to never speak of the horror we unleashed on the world that day. However, even that tree was unable to talk. But we did feel its wrath and sadness with every fiber of our beings. It still haunts me to this day. Senior Lee's gaze fell upon the demonic eye, and as he looked down, 
he noticed it staring back at him, fixated and unblinking with its eldritch curiosity. His composure wavered only slightly, a momentary flinch before he regained his steady demeanor. How long have you had this eye? Senior Lee wondered. Ashlock wasn't sure of the purpose behind the question, so he kept his answer vague. Recently. I see. It's all starting to make sense. Senior Lee's wisp nodded to himself, in truth, I didn't come here on a whim. Ashlock tensed up, and Senior Lee seemed to sense it as he quickly added, Don't get me wrong here, spirit tree. I mean you no harm. My words simply meant something drew me here, but my intentions are not nefarious. What drew you here then? Well, I was on my way to meet an old friend from the Void Mind family. Senior Lee replied, We have been sworn brothers for many years, but he decided to live out here in the wilderness to continue his crazed pursuit of knowledge. Anyway, as I passed by, I detected a spatial anomaly I haven't felt since. The wisp dimmed for a second, sorry that memory still enrages me to this day. Anyway, my insatiable curiosity got the better of me, so I came to investigate. I thought maybe the girl was the cause as she had spatial chi, but her realm was too weak and her roots too inferior to produce such a phenomenon. So you suspect this phenomenon was caused by me? Ashlock was very nervous. Well, yes. In fact, I hope it was caused by you. Why? Ashlock was baffled. So I can right my wrongs in this world and set it on a path of recovery. I can't say any more, as affecting another's path is to challenge fate itself. The wisp flashed with silver, and an obsidian fragment appeared. Spirit tree, please accept my gift and relieve my shoulders of this guilt. Received an SSS grade item? Divine fragment one ninth. The fragment was large, about the size of a person, and shaped like a shark tooth. It was obsidian with a glossy, almost glass-like surface and glowed with power. As he accepted the fragment and deposited it in his inventory, Ashlock felt a wave of power wash over him. His mind was immediately flooded with a torrent of images that seemed to come from another place and time. He saw jagged cracks in the fabric of space leading to unknown worlds, and he glimpsed the watchful gaze of immortals beyond his understanding, entities that seemed to peer down upon him from another realm with anger. He could feel their rage at his existence. Why? In the midst of this strange and overwhelming experience, Ashlock felt a sense of exhilaration wash over him, like the rush of adrenaline. He knew that he had been changed by this encounter, that something profound had shifted within him as if a piece of his past had returned. Chi flooded his body, his trunk shuddered, and his soul core glowed like a pulsing purple star, bathing his insides in bright lilac light. A rush of power like no other engulfed his mind, and moments later, his system flickered into view, confirming he had risen a stage. Soul fire, fourth stage. But then it flickered again, updating the stage. Soul fire, fifth stage. Ashlock felt his soul core burn even brighter. Soul fire, sixth stage. The rapid rise in cultivation was intoxicating. His body could barely contain the chi rushing around in a torrent. Senior Lee's wisp watched the spectacle in mute silence, unfazed by the chi threatening to cause Ashlock's trunk to split and collapse. Instead, he raised his wispy limbs, and Ashlock felt a cool breeze that calmed the chi slightly. Soul fire, seventh stage. The chi rushing around like a wildfire condensed into liquid and pushed up against the trunk as his soul core sent out waves of power like a drum. The liquid rippled up and down like a tide as if his soul core had become the moon. Soul fire, eighth stage. Ah, Ashlock screamed. A soul-wrenching scream that made his entire body shake, mountain included. A cataclysmic wave of spatial chi went through his entire body, causing Senior Lee's wisp form to be obliterated. Senior Lee's eyes snapped open and he found himself staring up at the sky. As he gazed upward, he saw nimbostratus clouds gathering and massae, their dark and dense forms blocking out the sun. A frigid breeze blew past, sending a shiver down his spine. As he turned to look around, Senior Lee met the terrified faces of the two girls. They stood nearby, their eyes wide with fear as they took in the ominous scene unfolding before them. Just moments ago, it had been a warm, pleasant day with clear blue skies, and now the tree was on fire the mountain was shaking, and the heavens seemed furious. But that was not all. A mythical white squirrel stood on its hind legs on top of the blonde girl's head. Its golden eyes were swirling with curiosity and concern at the darkening skies overhead. Also, a spider the size of an outhouse that Lee noticed earlier had vacated the trees ablaze branches of lilac chi and instead hid away in the corner of the courtyard, its many scarlet eyes watching on in concern, 
and its fangs twitched nervously. Is Tree okay? The blonde girl asked, tears forming at the edge of her eyes. He should be fine. Senior Lee lied. But stand back. The spirit tree may break through to the star core realm any moment. No. This can't be happening. He will die. The blonde girl screamed over the roaring wind, her own spatial chi flaring to life. You have to help him. He isn't strong enough to face such a strong tribulation. Senior Lee shook his head as the girl stood there in fear, not even looking at him anymore. If he dies, then he dies. To help might hinder your tree friend's future potential. Tribulations from the heavens are not something to be avoided or protected from but rather something to face head on with one's own strength. It is a test, and to cheat a test will only lead to incompetence down the line. Senior Lee moved to stand before the spirit tree. His white robe rustled in the violent winds, and his wooden cane felt heavy in his hand. Nevertheless, it appeared his assumptions were correct. To inherit a fragment of that divine being is to insult the heavens and to entice their wrath. But this was his heaven-chosen path. He'd held onto that fragment his entire life, never finding a worthy inheritor until today. Either the tree prevailed and became what it was destined to be, or it never had the potential in the first place. Senior Lee's eyes flashed with power as he watched the chi build up. Everything is going to plan so far. He whispered as his ring flashed with silver, and a gold paper talisman appeared in his hand. Raising the talisman above his head, he roared, Emperor Land Sealing Talisman. It exploded in a shower of golden characters that shot up into the sky before falling back down like snowflakes and blanketing everything in a few mile radius. That should keep the land safe from heaven's wrath. His wrinkled hands rested on the handle of his wooden staff as he saw a flash of lightning illuminate the dark clouds overhead, and a roar of thunder rung in his ears. The spirit tree was utterly engulfed in lilac flames and illuminated the darkened courtyard. Not even the black trunk or scarlet leaves could be seen through the inferno. But then things began to change. The flames began to condense and climb up the tree's trunk, gathering in a swirling mass above the tree. At first, it was unnoticeable, but as the wind picked up and Senior Lee had to use his cultivation to not be swept away, the lilac flames condensed into a molten ball. Senior Lee was witnessing the birth of a star core. An event he had observed many times, but this one felt special like the closing to a long dark part of his history and the beginning of a new era. The heavens made their opinion on the matter known. The sky shifted from black to brilliant gold as lightning filled the sky. Over ten bolts arced toward the baby star core that was hardly formed. Senior Lee closed his eyes. He wanted to help, but he knew from experience that helping only affected a cultivator's foundation. The heavens test for a reason. They only let the worthy ascend. No. Tree. Senior Lee's eyes snapped open from the cry, and he saw the blonde hair girl race up the tree's trunk in a ball of purple flame and appear in the air above it. Her fist was coated in lightning and purple flames, and she looked up at the sky with a grim determination that Senior Lee had only seen on the face of cultivators prepared to die. Leave Tree alone, you bastards. She screamed as her fist punched the incoming lightning bolts. Senior Lee blinked. What just happened? Chapter 56, Divinity Reborn Stella could feel Senior Lee, and Diana's eyes bore into her back as she charged toward the burning tree. Of course, they would call her insane, ignorant, or downright stupid. But Stella didn't care about any of that shaking her head, she felt the wind howl and the thunder roar in her ears as she dashed up Ash's trunk. She had heard Senior Lee's speech, but she disagreed. Why face the wrath of heaven alone when people are willing to die and grow alongside you? To live as a cultivator is to listen to your heart. If it tells you to fight, you fight. Run? Then run for the hills. And Stella's heart was filled with nothing but a grim determination to keep Tree alive. If she wavered here, let Tree face the wrath of the heavens alone, and then he perished under their might, she would rather die with him than live to mourn the charred remains. She squeezed her eyes shut as her legs burned from Ash's lilac flames. She knew she was being stupid, but with every fiber of her being, this just felt right. As she reached the top branch, her eyes snapped open. The self-doubt was gone, with every ounce of courage coursing through her veins. She drew her fist back as the sky lit up and golden lightning descended. She screamed, challenging the heavens. Her soul core roared to life, and her comprehension of the lightning deo rippled through her mind. She had challenged this lightning once before, and at that time, she had been furious the lightning had picked on something that couldn't move hence her desire to be able to move so fast, so she could always get back home and protect Tree from anything. To her, lightning wasn't overwhelming power. 
she simply didn't believe that. Instead, it was a contest of speed. As the lightning arced through the sky, Stella pushed herself off the branch and rocketed up with speed incompressible to mortals to meet the incoming threat. Her fist, primed and ready, shot forth and made contact. Her eyes burned, and an unimaginable pain engulfed her mind as a force smashed her down as if a god had swatted a fly she felt a branch smack into her back, and she tumbled uncontrollably until she finally crashed into the ground. She blinked, trying to remove the burning light. Slowly vague shapes populated her sight, then colors, and finally, some definitions. Her ears were still ringing, but she could just about make out the looming shadow over her and words she didn't want to hear. Well, that was rather silly. Senior Lee's gentle voice caressed her ears, and then she felt something pushed into her half-ajar lips. It had a revolting medicinal taste, making her instantly sit up and cough violently. Someone had clearly fed her a healing pill. The pain faded, her sight returned as her eyes' pupils regrew, and her ears stopped ringing. She flexed her hand blown off by the lightning and saw the freshly rapidly knitting itself together in a mesh of flesh and blood. Unfortunately, it was not a painless process, but she refused to cry so she gritted her teeth. The howling wind whipped her hair around, but she saw Senior Lee flanked by Diana through the obstruction, looking at her with concern. The lilac flames of tree illuminated their faces, and they were also feeling the high winds as Senior Lee's plain white robe fluttered, and Diana was also struggling to control her hair, but it was far shorter than hers. Blat. Stella spat the side in a vain attempt to remove the awful aftertaste. Senior Lee chuckled, don't worry about your tree friend so much. His gaze wandered to the skies above that were getting more agitated, although I have to admit this tribulation is looking more extreme than any star core one I have seen before. Stella almost struggled to hear Senior Lee over the violent wind, but his words filled her with concern. She staggered over to his side and looked up, and although she had never seen a star core tribulation, she also had to admit it wasn't looking good. The clouds blanketed the entire sky, not just Red Vine Peak, but she couldn't even see blue sky over Dark Light City. This was a big event. If the cultivators around them hadn't been suspicious before, they would be now. Senior Lee stroked his chin while resting one hand on his wooden cane. His eyes flickered, and a low hum of concern escaped his lips. I have seen many tribulations before, and this one looks closer to one for a nascent soul cultivator. I wonder why. His words were washed out over the roar of thunder and flash of light as more golden lightning bolts descended. Stella could only catch a glimpse of its might through the branches and dense canopy. They all struck the swirling mass of purple that gathered above Ashlock, which looked like a small star. It pulsed like a beating heart as if alive. Before the lighting made contact, a solar flare struck out, meeting the lightning and slapping it away. Stella wanted to rush in and help, but she felt a hand firmly on her shoulder. Do whatever you wish. I won't stop you. Senior Lee's stern voice carried over the howling wind but do not misunderstand your Deo Heart's intentions. The best way to help the spirit tree in this scenario is to step back and protect it from other cultivators if they come. Depriving it of heavenly lightning will only hurt it in the long run. His wrinkly hand then let go and pointed over her shoulder at the forming star core, look, with every strike of lightning, the soul core only grows larger. So the lightning is both a test and the fuel source to jumpstart forming a soul core. Stella could see the logic in Senior Lee's words, but it still felt wrong. The memory of spending many months checking on Tree, and finding it unresponsive to her presence every time, after it had faced the heavenly lightning, was one of her childhood's most traumatic memories. The smell of scorched wood and burned leaves had ticked her nose, and she remembered never knowing if Tree would wake up again. She didn't want to hinder Tree's growth, nor did she want to hurt herself doing so. She wasn't crazy or stupid. She just wanted to, protect. Clenching her fists, she stayed rooted in place watching the lightning lash out at the forming star core in groups, and with every passing barrage, the star core grew in size and glowed brighter. Everything seemed to be under control, but Senior Lee's murmuring made Stella follow his line of sight and catch a glimpse of another cluster of lightning, but this group of strikes wasn't aimed at the soul core but at Ash's branches. The attack struck at Ashlock's branch like a coiling viper, and there was a loud explosion followed by splinters of wood raining down on them, and a loud thump as a branch many meters long slammed into the stone below. For a moment, the stump of the cut caught fire, and Stella's eyes went wide. She then felt something being pushed into her hand. Looking down, she saw Senior Lee's wrinkly hand depositing some pale blue pills in her hand. Those are heavenly chi resistance pills, and these his silver ring flashed, and a few herby-scented dark green pills appeared, are healing pills. 
His smile was warm, go protect your tree but leave the lightning strikes aimed at the star core alone. Those are beneficial. Stella hesitated slightly. The pain she had just experienced from trying to punch heavenly lightning had not been minor. Rather, it was one of the most painful single moments of her life. Her eyes darted to the branch lying on the ground, still clad in fruits of various colors. Ash is defenseless. He can't run and needs a guardian. Her eyes flashed with determination. Why should Tree have to suffer in silence? She had told Ash she was weak in the past, and that had inspired her to train heavily from dusk till dawn without a break in hopes of keeping up with him to stay useful. But now Tree was about to ascend to Starcore, a realm she might never reach with her inferior spirit roots. So now might be the last time she could provide meaningful help. If this is what his star core tribulation was like, what about his nascent soul or monarch realm? Would she just be a harmless annoying fly to tree in the future? Seeing more clouds flashing with lightning off to the side, aiming for Ash's branches, Stella gulped down all the pills in one go and charged. Requirements for the star core realm have been met, ninth stage soul fire, 100%. Commencing upgrade to star core realm, 0%. Ashlock was barely conscious to acknowledge the system messages flashing in his mind. He felt like his body was being stretched toward the sky. His bark creaked as Chi bubbled up to the surface, moving through his branches and then collecting overhead. He had no idea how an average cultivator went through this process, but he was darn glad his system was here to manage it somewhat. Ashlock could hear the rumbling of an incoming storm, but it was hard to care. He was lethargic and just wanted to sleep. Warning, wrath of the heavens invoked. Ha Ashlock snapped awake as heavenly lightning struck toward the forming star core. Leave Tree alone, you bastards. Ashlock heard Stella shout over the roaring thunder and leap to meet the incoming lightning. What the fuck are you doing? Ashlock shouted and tried with all his might to teleport her, but alas, he still couldn't use his cultivation without a corpse. He watched in horror as the lightning obliterated Stella's arm to the bone. Sadly it didn't stop there and badly damaged the rest of her body, including burning out her eyes which popped like tiny balloons. She then crashed down as if she had been slapped by a god and smacked his branches on the way down. Having finished with Stella, the lightning continued onto his star core. It felt like being electrocuted and punched in the stomach simultaneously with every strike, and they kept coming. But Ashlock didn't give a fuck about the pain. For a second, he genuinely thought it was all over. Stella was dead. She lay unmoving on the ground under his canopy as a burned, hairless, armless corpse with empty eye sockets and a slightly ajar mouth. It was by far the most horrifying thing Ashlock had witnessed in his two lives. An indescribable rage bloomed in his dulled mind and body. The mountain trembled as his entire body united in defying one thing. The heavens. They dared to kill his best friend. Flawless lilac chi set his trunk aflame, the star core pulsed with power, and his body groaned from the power. Despite his best efforts, the lightning strikes kept coming and his star core furiously fought the assault off, growing strong and stronger with each strike. He knew he should have distanced himself from Stella, told her to go out into the big wide world and grow without him. None of this would have happened if he hadn't been selfish and wanted her to stay by his side forever. Why did Senior Lee appear? What use is a gift or higher cultivation if the people you hoped to spend the rest of eternity hanging out with were dead? That bastard had ruined Ashlock's future. Ashlock hated everything. Everyone especially heaven. Why had he been put into the body of a fucking tree? Did someone up there enjoy his pain and suffering? Taking away one of the few things he cared about. Well, that was rather silly. Senior Lee's voice was like a cool breeze for his raging soul. Ashlock seated as Senior Lee walked over and shoved something in Stella's mouth. Just for a brief moment before the pill dissolved in Stella's mouth, Ashlock could tell that it was no normal pill. In fact, it carried a whiff of the divine. The same feeling he got from the Divine Fragment SSS. Had Senior Lee just given a divine pill to Stella's corpse? Then in real time, Ashlock watched Stella's body regenerate in a golden glow. Blonde hair sprouted from her bald head, and her flesh wiggled and knitted itself together around a reforming bone. It was horrendous to watch, but anticipation kept Ashlock observing. The heavens kept smiting him, but he didn't give a shit. Those cosmic bastards could wait their turn. Seconds later, Stella sat up and spat to the side. Blat. She was alive. Ashlock had never felt the phrase you don't know what you have until it's gone more in his two lives until this moment. The last time he had felt this much despair was when he woke up in this world as nothing but a small sapling, 
poking out the purple grass and unable to move, see, or talk. Confused and alone. While distracted, Ashlock felt a sudden shock of pain followed by a thump. Ow, what the hell? He glared at the fallen branch. His lightning chi protection and fire chi resistance worked over time but to little effect. The heavenly lightning seemed to just rip straight through. Worried about how he could survive hundreds of lightning bolts aiming for his branches rather than the star core, Ashlock could see the heavens preparing for another strike. He could also see a freshly healed Stella charging up his trunk again with renewed vigor. Why did she have to play with his non-existent heart like this? She will kill him from stress before the heavens can. What the fuck was she doing? Does she want to die? The distant cloud flashed, lightning as golden as Stella's hair went to meet her mid-air, once again, her fist was drawn back coated in purple flames and lightning, but this time, rather than a grim determination on her face, there was nothing but a beaming smile. Her fist struck the lightning, and the lightning yielded. It was diverted and hit the mountain instead, but golden characters flashed, and a barrier protected the ground. Ashlock was speechless. What the hell had been in that pill Senior Lee had given Stella? Spirit Tree, I will return with that new fruit tea sometime soon. Senior Lee said while patting his trunk, I have gifted two divine items today and fear I cannot stay on this realm for much longer before the heavens turn on me. Wait! Ashlock shouted. But Senior Lee was already gone. Chapter 57, Eyes in the Sky Senior Lee smiled as he watched the blonde girl strike down the heavens lightning. He always enjoyed seeing the heavens being defied by mere mortals. However, that smile soon turned into a frown as he felt a looming presence bearing down on him. He had angered the heavens far too many times over the years and knew sticking around for a second longer would be a terrible idea. So, walking briskly over to the spirit tree, he touched its trunk and mentally spoke. Spirit tree, I will return with that new fruit tea sometime soon. He said while patting the spirit tree's trunk, I have gifted two divine items today and fear I cannot stay on this realm for much longer before the heavens turn on me. Wait. The tree's weird distorted voice shouted, but Senior Lee had no plans to stick around for even a second longer. So, with a simple thought, he vanished from the lower realm and reappeared in his inner world, floating above a flat meadow that spread out in all directions until the horizon. Picking a direction, Senior Lee began to fly over the meadow at high speeds. The lush grass blurred beneath his floating feet. However, the looming pressure he aimed to escape only increased no matter how fast he flew. Senior Lee's eyes widened as he looked over his shoulder and saw the clear blue sky of his inner world transform before his very eyes. The peaceful expanse was rapidly consumed by creeping darkness, spreading like wildfire across the horizon. As he watched, thousands of glowing eyes appeared in the distance. The eerie lights multiplied rapidly until they seemed to occupy the entire sky, creating an otherworldly, ominous spectacle that seemed to herald the end of days. Senior Lee's inner world shuddered under the intense gaze of the heaven's will. Persistent bastard. He muttered under his breath as even the sky right above him became corrupted. Giving that spirit tree a divine fragment was always within heaven's plan, as they hadn't cared when he gifted it. In fact, the heavens had even rewarded the tree with a burst in cultivation and a tribulation. What wasn't within heaven's expectations was his saving of the girl. The pill he had given her was nothing too special in the upper realms, but it would make her a future powerhouse down here. But having one more powerhouse in a lower realm shouldn't warrant this reaction from the heavens? Senior Lee had given the pill for one simple reason. He had felt a sudden surge of demonic chi corrupting the spirit tree when lightning struck her. Clearly, the girl meant something to the tree, and having her nearly dead caused the tree to show signs of the demonic path. Unless that had been heaven's plan all along? Did you want the tree to form heart demons and resent the world? He shouted at the thousands of eyes, which seemed to anger them even more. They glowed with furious light, and the entire small world orbiting his soul shook. Reality cracked like stained glass, and tendrils of pure chi snuck through the gaps in the shattered sky. They slammed down as if trying to crush him. Senior Lee gritted his teeth, kept his speed up, and even burned his cultivation to forcefully rotate his inner world faster. All High Realm cultivators eventually cultivated their own world that lived inside them, and these inner worlds had many uses. Other than providing insight into the natural laws, a realm of power above mere chi manipulation, it also allowed for fast travel as the inner world mirrored the outside world. With every inch Senior Lee crossed in his inner world, many miles were passed in the physical world. He was an entire continent away from the spirit tree by now, but heaven was still chasing him. With a huff of annoyance, Senior Lee accepted he needed to realm shift to avoid heaven today. 
It was a catastrophic waste of energy, but it had to be done as almost the entire sky was a sea of eyes and tendrils aiming for his life. With a flash of dimensional chi, Senior Lee was gone from his inner world. Ashlock looked in awe at the empty spot where Senior Lee had been a second ago. He had literally just watched a man vanish into thin air. There was no trace of chi or sign of a magic trick. He had literally just disappeared as if he had never existed. Commencing upgrade to Star Core Realm, 50%. Ha, take that. Stella shouted as she punched another cluster of lightning, causing it to arc and strike the mountain, and once again, mysterious golden letters flashed and blocked the strike. Ashlock had no idea what was in any of those pills Stella had taken from Senior Lee, but he hoped they didn't come with side effects befitting their miraculous effects. She had literally gone from near death to a lightning punching demigod. Ever since Senior Lee appeared, fewer things made sense. His worldview had been shaken once again, which he thought wasn't possible after witnessing the fight between the Grand Elders of House Ravenborn and Winter Wrath. This time, the only difference was that Ashlock got to speak with this guy rather than watch from afar as a spectator to a conflict. Wait, speak. I spoke to someone. I actually spoke real words and had a conversation. With that grandpa out of his head, he could finally rejoice about how monumental of an occasion that had been. Now he just needed to figure out how Senior Lee did that and if Stella could replicate it. The storm overhead became even more fierce, and Ashlock braced as best he could as hundreds of lightning bolts descended on him. Like a lightning rod, the swirling ball of lilac chi floating overhead that was his forming star core took the brunt of the strikes and seemed to grow stronger. The real issue came from the lightning bolts that refused to follow the script and aimed at his body instead. His trunk could somewhat resist the strikes, only suffering fist-deep burning holes that quickly extinguished due to his fire resistance, but his branches were another story. Ow, fuck me. Ashlock grimaced as yet another smoldering branch tumbled to the stone below with a thump. The dull grey stone was dyed in a myriad of colours as the branches crushed the fruit that had been dangling from them. It was a sad sight to see. And also slightly dangerous as the stone was now caked in poisonous juices. Lightning Chi Protection B Lightning Chi Barrier A Fire Resistance C Fire Chi Protection B Ashlock's system flickered to life after that latest hit, alerting him to his newly upgraded skills. It had been a long time since he last saw any of his skills naturally upgrade without credits, so it was nice to see free upgrades especially in a scenario like this. Instantly deploying his new and improved Lightning Chi Barrier, Ashlock could immediately tell the big difference between the two skills. Lightning Chi Protection had provided a passive barrier but was rather weak. If Lightning Chi Protection was like wrapping his trunk in bubble wrap, his new skill was a sheen of bulletproof glass that he could repair with Chi. Unfortunately, most of his Chi was taken up by the forming star core, but of the little he had left, he spent it all on deploying a barrier along his branches. Commencing upgrade to star core realm, 70%. The system countdown continued in the corner of his mind. In a way, wasn't it weird that the system knew precisely when a tribulation would end? Senior Lee giving him a divine fragment from an unknown entity made Ashlock question things more. The guy had appeared so suddenly, dropped two divine items, and then dipped without a proper goodbye? Ashlock watched as more lightning exploded out of the sky and struck one of his branches. A lilac shield rippled and then showed cracks before shattering. With just a bit of chi, Ashlock could redeploy the shield and prepare himself for the next strike. Everything was going smoothly, minus Stella almost dying and the storm's ferocity. His star core, which had reached a few meters in diameter, bathed the courtyard in its flickering lilac glow. Commencing upgrade to star core realm, 80%. Ashlock noticed his star core suddenly ballooning in size the second the countdown hit 80%. Did star cores follow the life cycle of a real star? If so, this was the red giant stage where an average size star rapidly expands and gobbles everything up. Luckily for Ashlock, his star core didn't eat him alive and rose into the sky instead. Considering the sky had been replaced with dark clouds with nothing but streaks of lightning to illuminate the valley, a sudden massive lilac ball of fire in the sky was rather noticeable. Especially since, as it grew larger, it attracted more heavenly lightning, causing it to grow even faster. After that, it just kept growing and growing. Within seconds it had ballooned to be a hundred meters in diameter. Patriarch. Diana yelled over the roaring rain, we have company. Ashlock used his eye of the tree god skill, and sure enough, from his vantage point, he could see multiple balls of green and white flames dashing up the side of the mountain and breakneck speeds, and he highly doubted they were in such a hurry to be the first to congratulate him on his advancement. And in the distance, hundreds of cultivators were sprinting over. 
commencing upgrade to Star Core Realm, 85%. Well, shit. Ashlock had all of his chi tied up in the tribulation, actually it made sense why they would choose now as a perfect time to attack. A Star Core Realm cultivator would be a significant threat, considering they could blow themselves up and take out a chunk of a city or summon valley-sized blizzards and stand upon the shoulder of thousand-meter-tall ice golems. Do they know it's a tree ascending to the next realm, or do they think it's Stella? Ashlock wondered as he thought up a battle plan. Stella didn't need to spend effort protecting him from heavenly lightning anymore as his enormous star core attracted all the lightning for hundreds of miles. Currently, my best forms of attack are puppets and my demonic eye. Ashlock was still unsure what they saw when they looked at his demonic eye, but he could guess it was similar to how he felt when Stella used her earrings. Annoyingly, Ashlock couldn't tell Diana to fight. But she seemed ready to defend the Ash Fallen sect anyway. Blue flames shrouded her body and sword. Also, mist poured around her and began to obscure the central courtyard. Stella seemed to notice the situation, and she dashed back and stood under Ashlock's canopy. Tree, hurry up and ascend. We will have nothing to fear with you at the Star Core Realm. Ashlock appreciated her optimism and trust in him, but he wasn't so sure. He still couldn't control his spatial chi without a corpse, but something told him there would be a lot of corpses for him to control soon. An explosion went off at the doorway to the pavilion, which had blown shut from the ferocious winds, but to everyone's surprise, the entire building lit up with golden characters. They are using a defensive formation. Someone shouted from the other side. Another explosion went off, and the building flashed with golden characters again. Hey, aren't those ancient runes? Stella commented as she withdrew a sword from her spatial ring. She squinted as they continued flashing with every hit from the invaders waiting on the other side, I should ask Senior Lee about them when he comes back. We have to survive this first, you know. Diana grumbled, where is Senior Lee anyway? Stella shrugged as she stood beside Diana and watched the shaking door, no idea but I don't think this battle will be too hard. Why? Diana squinted at Stella. She seemed a tad too confident. Stella laughed and gestured with her chin to the area above the door. Diana followed her line of sight and saw the titanic spider excitedly twitching its fangs. Diana smiled but then yelped as she heard something wheezing beside her. Looking to the side, she saw a human corpse standing with a black vine trailing from its mouth and lilac flames burning in its eyes. Diana gripped her sword tighter and watched the door flash with symbols once last time until an explosion shook the entire pavilion, and the door flew off its hinges in a shower of splinters. It was time to fight to the death for the future of the Ash Fallen sect. Chapter 58, The Ashen Devourer Tristan Evergreen rushed up the side of Red Vine Peak with viscous green flames enveloping his form. Ever since the science of Evergreen and Winter Wrath betrothal one another, his life had been flipped upside down. With their combined strength and a beast tide on the way, the Grand Elders of the two families mutually agreed to team up on the Ravenborn family, which had seen a sharp decline in recent years. They wanted to secure more spirit stones and advance their youth's cultivation in anticipation of the move. After what happened last time, the Evergreen and Winterrath families refused to be reduced to second-rate families. So why not eliminate one of their competitors while also boosting their youth? It was a win-win scenario. Furthermore, there had also been rumors circulating that the Grand Elder of House Ravenborn was on the cusp of ascension to nascent soul, which worried the Patriarch as he didn't want his position of power contested as the only nascent soul in the sect. So to avoid outrage among the families for executing a competitor, the Patriarch gave his blessing for the war behind closed doors. That way, the Patriarch got rid of a potential rival, removed a declining house from power, and furthered his support with two upcoming families. Politics Tristan Evergreen felt like rolling his eyes. There was nothing he hated more than people. In fact, he hated everyone. Ever since butchering his cousin Wayne Evergreen, the previous scion of his house, he had set his eyes on eliminating his deceased cousin's sister. He wanted the whole main bloodline in the Evergreen family dead. Period. Years of mistreatment and being deprived of resources by the main bloodline had only fueled his hatred. It was only due to his new position as a first stage star core by consuming the Ravenborn Grand Elder's wandering soul after the supernova, that he had been clued in on this information by the other chatty Grand Elders and that they took him seriously. As his mind wandered, he kept his eyes glued to the prize floating overhead. The pulsing lilac star of Chi was about to be the source of his second biggest increase in cultivation. All he needed to do was get close enough to siphon some of that dense Chi. 
Tristan gritted his teeth as he had to keep low to the ground to avoid the violent waves of chi pulsing off the titanic lilac star overhead. How a single girl managed to store so much chi inside her body was beyond Tristan, but he cared little. As a newly formed star core cultivator, he needed a lot of chi to forcefully expand it and climb the stages to nascent soul. Only at the nascent soul would he unlock true immortality, as he could transfer his soul from his dying body to another vessel every few thousand years. That enormous floating star core out in the open was a guiding light to a free lunch for all the cultivators for many miles. He would go up a whole stage if he could absorb even one-tenth of the chi in that star core. Brother. Someone called out to him, and he looked over his shoulder at a plain-faced man he despised. Is the Grand Elder really not coming? Tristan snorted, was his brother really this stupid? Of course, he was. They all were stupid. To be referred to as brother by such an incompetent fool was the peak of insults. Turning back to look where he was going, Tristan shouted over the roaring storm. Do you see how stupidly big that forming star core is? Do you think a newbie girl can handle forming such a monstrous star core? It's at least a hundred times the size of mine. A hint of anger showed on the man's plain face running behind. Isn't that all the more reason they should head over like you? Don't they want to absorb the chi for themselves? Fool. Tristan spat to the side, when forming a star core, there are only two outcomes. In my case, I condensed the star core to the size of a fist and managed to anchor it inside my body. Tristan then pointed up at the lilac star, almost the size of the peak that blocked out the entire sky above them. Do you think Stella Crestfallen can condense that and fit it inside her body? No. The man admitted flatly. But. Tristan cut him off, exactly, so the most likely outcome is that the star core explodes, and there is another supernova. Which will kill everyone nearby, even star core experts such as the Grand Elder. What if she succeeds? The man asked skeptically, I mean, if she is doing her ascension so openly, I think she can do it. Tristan rolled his eyes. If she succeeds, the Grand Elders will rush in and either try to secure the girl to give to the Patriarch or take her forcefully and shove her into the center of a formation and use her star core to power it. There is no way for her to fight against multiple mid-stage star core experts. She is doomed either way. The man remained silent for a while as the winds became more fierce the closer they got to the peak. Finally, after a moment, he shouted. So if it's going to explode, why are we charging at it exactly? A wicked smile appeared on Tristan's face, you will find out soon enough. Then before his brother could retort, Tristan sped up. The reason was simple, he wanted him to die. His eyes darted between everyone present. There were more Winter Wrath cultivators than Evergreen, and he honestly didn't give a shit if his useless brothers and cousins perished here today. He cared for nothing now that he was in the Star Core realm. With his new power, only a few other Star Core realm Grand Elders threatened him. If the family stopped wasting resources on these buffoons and instead spent them all on him, he could be a mid-stage star core expert within a decade. Tristan's eyes once again drifted to the lilac star overhead. He couldn't help but lick his lips in glee. Once he absorbed some of that star core chi floating overhead, he would be on PAR with his father and be able to take over the family. Explosions rang out ahead, and Tristan saw the entire mountain light up with golden symbols. A defensive formation. That was highly suspicious. They were costly to deploy and maintain, and last he checked, the Red Vine Peak was stripped of everything valuable a long time ago. Tristan debated slowing down and letting those ahead lead the charge, but his star core gave him confidence that nothing could threaten him around here. Only the Patriarch was in the Narcist Soul Realm, and he was in closed-door cultivation. As he reached the pavilion entrance, he saw over ten cultivators in robes huddled around the wooden door. Their fists were aflame, and they all struck at the door in unison with a shout. The golden symbols flashed again, so the cultivators hit one time. The door flew off its hinges and dispersed in a shower of splinters into a, mist. Tristan furrowed his brows as he slowed to a walk, his hands were clasped behind his back, and he held his head high. The cultivators noticed his presence and parted ways to allow him to pass. He had seen this type of mist before. It was one of the secret techniques of the now-deceased Ravenborn clan had abandoning the coffin of stone that supposedly encased Diana Ravenborn come to bite him in the ass? Had she survived the supernova and escaped to Red Vine Peak? Tristan narrowed his eyes, searching the mist with his spiritual senses, but the dense mist and the pulses of chi emanating from the forming star core overhead muddled his senses. Moments passed without anyone willing to move. Deciding time was of the essence, 
Tristian flexed his first stage star core realm cultivation on those around him, making everyone tense up as gravity descended on them. I think a Winter Wrath brother or sister should lead the charge, don't you think? He had a sinister grin, and everyone gulped. A Winter Wrath girl that Tristan recognized stepped forward with some effort to defy his presence. She had been eyeing him up for a while now. From his recollection, she was the elder sister of the woman his cousin married. Tristan, as the strongest here, why don't you lead rather than bully your juniors? Isn't abusing your cultivation in this situation rather uncouth and dishonorable? Tristan snorted, if I tell you to go first, then you go first. How can the words of a star core cultivator be dishonorable? Silently, Tristan seated. Everyone was just here to grab just some free-floating star core chi. Why did they act so presumptuously? Since most of the people present were in the soul fire realm, they could get a few years of cultivation at most due to their inability to absorb enough in just a few minutes. But for Tristan, this was a great opportunity, as one of the most significant advantages of a star core is its high absorption rate. It was why advancing in the star core realm was so difficult. It required a cultivator to cultivate in only the most expensive runic chi gathering formations or seek a rare opportunity like the one before him, as the chi requirements to ascend were stupidly high. Tristan felt impatience fester within him. What was the chance that something that could threaten him really existed within the mist? If he had to guess, the mist was caused by someone from the Ravenborn family in the middle of the Soul Fire realm. But something seemed off. The mist was not the only suspicious thing. Why would Stella Crest fall and willingly conduct her Star Core ascension in the open like this? Tristan ascended to the Star Core realm deep underground within a formation to mask and resist the heavenly lightning. However, the arrogance of Stella Crest Fallen could almost be justified by the purity of the spatial chi and the size of the forming star core. Tristan really didn't want to go first. Every instinct he had honed over the years that had led him to this stage of power screamed at him that a monster lurked in the mist. To enter first would be a death sentence. Nicole, I'm not a man of dishonor. If you go first, I'll speak to my father, and maybe I can help arrange a marriage for you. Tristan recoiled slightly as he received a death stare from the Winter Wrath woman that had stepped forward. Tristan knew using force here would be less than ideal. He wanted someone to enter willfully. But, from the impatience in everyone's gaze, he knew they just needed a little push. So, fishing around in his spatial ring, which he had stolen from Wayne Evergreen's corpse, Tristan searched for something he could give as an incentive. Honestly, he felt beyond frustrated. Why couldn't these imbeciles charge in without a second thought? A helpless girl forming a star core was just beyond the mist. Why did they only just now grow a head on their shoulders? Deciding he didn't care about anything in the spatial ring of his deceased cousin compared to the boon he would get from the star core, Tristan threw out the entire contents of the spatial ring into the mist. Swords clattered on the stone, porcelain bottles smashed, causing pills to be scattered, and technique manuals fell with a thud. A herby scent wafted with the roaring wind from the storm overhead. With immediate rewards being laid out before them, and their desire to siphon off some chi from the forming star core before it went supernova, they all scrambled to be the first through the door with their spatial rings glowing, ready to gather as many of the scattered resources as possible. Tristan stood back with a sneer. Those items had taken his cousin decades to collect, and he had thrown them away like trash. But to him, they were junk compared to advancing his cultivation to the second stage of the star core realm. So it was worth it if their sacrifice helped ensure the path through the mist was safe. His eyes went wide as there was a brief scream through the dense mist, Tristan saw a looming shadow descend from the wall, and before he knew it, two cultivators had vanished, and another two were pulverized into the ground by something heavy. One had been a winter wrath, and the other an evergreen. I knew it. Tristan cursed under his breath as his star core empowered his body. He had been asked by the Grand Elders to hunt down the spider that had been terrorizing the forests a while back and he could recognize its hunting style anywhere after witnessing the same thing happening in front of him many times. However, this time, it was a dense mist instead of the signature ash cloud. Tristan looked up and debated jumping the wall. If he encountered the spider on the roof, he could catch it mid-snack. Deciding that was a good idea, Tristan gathered some chi into his feet and leapt up, leaving a dent in the stone and shooting up a few meters. From the air, Tristan saw the star core forming above an enormous tree. Stella Crestfallen must be hiding among its branches. Tristan thought to himself. He couldn't see much else as the entire central courtyard of the pavilion was blanketed in that same dense mist that restricted his spiritual senses. Looking around, he spotted the spider. He had never actually seen the thing, 
only heard what it looked like from witnesses that it had let escape. Its body was a pale, ashen color, with many red eyes the size of a child. Eight limbs jutted from his titanic body, each as thick as a small tree. Tristan couldn't help but gulp as he landed gracefully on the rooftop and stood mere meters away from the behemoth. It turned to him with an eerie silence that didn't match its gargantuan size. White and green shreds of robes coated in blood dangled from its drooling fangs, and its face twitched as if it was happy to see him. You monster! Tristan's ring flashed, and an enchanted blade with an ornate handle appeared in his firm grip. You think you can evade this young master for eternity? The spider's eyes gleamed its chewing slowed, and a single shoe fell out of its mouth. Then before Tristan knew it, ash began to swirl around them. Lightly at first, hardly noticeable due to the storm, but a literal dome of ash encircled them after a few seconds. It was challenging him to a duel. But, as the ash blocked out his spiritual sense and the sunlight, Tristan was left in the complete dark with nothing but the sickly green glow of his soul fire illuminating an area of one meter around him. Tristan couldn't help but feel a little intimidated as a shadow loomed within the ash. It was time to face the ashen devourer in a life and death duel. Chapter 59, Fighting on Home Turf Tristan Evergreen stood rooted in place as the dome of ash swirled around him. Within this cage was the ashen devourer, a monster of unknown strength and origins that had evaded and slaughtered cultivators with the strength and tactics of an apex predator. And now, Tristan was alone, in a one-on-one -on -one with the monster. His star core flared to life, and chi flooded every fiber of his body, which was intoxicating. He noticed the weight of his sword had lessened, and his body felt light and full of power. This was the cultivation realm he had worked so hard and sacrificed so much for. Seeing the monster's shadow loom through the darkness of the Ashen Dome, Tristan couldn't hold back a sneer as he raised his sword and pointed it at where he thought the monster lurked. Shaking off self-doubt and fear of the monster, he steeled his resolve and decided to face it head on. You think I'm trapped in here with you? His star core roared to life, and green flames burst out, filling the entire dome with its sickly light. His sword turned into pure flames, and he cut a slit in the dome with a horizontal slash. Faint sunlight poured in, and Tristan could see the chaotic sky through the crack. The ash dome quickly repaired itself, but the spider should stay within the dome if I also stay inside. Tristan smiled. His greatest annoyance when hunting this monster in the forests had been its ability to run away. He refused to believe it would be as good at fighting in a duel compared to its hit-and-run tactics. So it was right where he wanted it trapped in a cage of its own design. With his star core producing enough flames to illuminate the space a few meters around him, Tristan felt confident he could react in time to a sneak attack. He dogged to the left as a limb blurred past where his head had just been. He looked over his shoulder and met many curious red eyes. He was so close he could smell the scent of iron due to the blood dripping from the monster's fangs. Vile beast! Tristan yelled as he spun around and sliced at one of the spider's limbs. He had half been expecting the spider to dodge or have a defensive ability, but instead, he was sprayed with purple blood and a shrill scream from the spider. Tristan mobilized his chi to protect his ears and resisted covering them. Was this some kind of sound attack, or was it actually that injured? The spider stumbled back, clearly struggling to get used to missing a leg. Purple blood spewed from the severed limb like a punctured barrel. After a moment, it stopped screaming and glared at him with hatred. Gone was its curiosity. Only primal rage remained in those blood-red eyes. It bared its fangs with a hiss, and instead of fading back into the darkness, it charged at him like a raging bull. Tristan tried to slash back at it with his sword, but a surge of ash blasted him and took the brunt of his swing, meaning that as the sword hit the spider, much of its momentum was lost, and it only cut an inch deep into the spider's tough fur, which only seemed to anger it more. Digging his heels into the stone below, Tristan tried to push back the spider, but even with his sword half embedded into it, the ashen devourer refused to relent and continued barreling down on him, forcing his back into the dome of ash. Tristan furrowed his brows. Never had he expected the spider to be this ferocious and strong. It was hard to estimate its exact realm, as monsters worked on a slightly different system than humans, and the Deo of Ash was a rare one that was more support-based and lacked fighting power. But if Tristan had to guess, it was weaker than him. Peak Soul Fire Realm, perhaps. Tristan thought as he summoned a dagger to his free hand from his spatial ring, shrouded it in chi, and rammed it into the spider's face causing it to reel back and scream again. Can't use your hunting tactics in here. Tristan sneered, now stay back. Tristan decided it was time to use a technique to keep the monster locked down. Connecting with the heaven's will, 
it acknowledged his deep comprehension of nature Dao and understood his intentions to entrap the monster. Before the spider even knew what was happening, as it was so focused on its pain, Tristan had mentally connected to the hundreds of red vines that grew along the pavilion's walls. Tristan raised his hand, and as if directing a musical performance, he directed hundreds of vines to shoot through the dome of ash and latch onto the spider's seven remaining limbs, head, and abdomen. It unleashed another cry as its limbs were pulled to the side and fell to the ground. Tristan twirled the dagger as he approached the behemoth mummified in red vines. How does it feel to be the one caught in the trap for a change? He asked with a sly smile, not so fun to be on the receiving end, is it? A pulse of green fire went through the vines and set the spider's fur ablaze. It shrieked, and the smell of burning flesh tickled Tristan's nose. It was glorious. The ashen devourer had made a fool out of his incompetent family for months. And sure enough, he was the only one capable of killing this foe. He had to jump up to stand on the spider's head. It struggled against its restraints, but he could tell it had no way to escape. He raised his foot and slammed it down on the spider's head, clamping its mouth shut to stop its ear-piercing screams. It silently seated, its many eyes glaring up at him. Tristan relished in the moment of triumph. This was the power he had sought for so long. He deserved this position atop an opponent's crown, where they could do nothing but look up and marvel at him. As Tristan was feeling on top of the world, he heard a snap and saw a red vine fly in the corner of his eye. Followed by another, and then another. He blinked, finding it hard to believe what he was seeing. The spider's leg snapped his vines, which were empowered by his star core realm chi. Without wasting another second, Tristan raised his sword in an executioner style and prepared to decapitate the monster before it could fight back. Die. Black vines coated in lilac chi shot through the dome of ash and slammed into him, sending his sword flying from his hand. Tristan tumbled off the spider's head and rolled to the floor, where the vines kept up their pursuit and wrapped around his waist. Tristan looked down at the vines coiling around his waist as they shredded and singed his clothes with the thousands of thorns coated in lilac flames. Stella Crestfallen is a dual core. Tristan wondered. He couldn't believe it. Not only did Stella Crestfallen have such pure spatial chi, but she had even better control over vines than him. A nature star core cultivator. Just how talented could one person be? Tristan gritted his teeth, grabbed the black vines, and tore them off his body with raw strength. His clothes were partially torn, but there was no blood as he suffered no injuries due to his thick skin. With the vines off him, Tristan straightened his back but then he noticed a new issue. The dome was rapidly closing in. As a tree, Ashlock may not be able to pursue attackers or run away, but he did have an enormous advantage over people of similar strength who found trouble on his home turf. Even with most of his chi being sucked up by his forming star core, Ashlock had found a workaround. He used Bob, the giant slime in the mine, as a battery. He had recently shoved a lot of chi into the slime, so he decided to take it back out to fuel his fight. After the door exploded into pieces, many items were thrown into the mist. Which confused Ashlock at first, but then he saw a dozen cultivators rush in and tunnel vision onto the discarded items. Naturally, Diana and Stella didn't wait for the invaders' permission, and the pair practically teleported through the mist and began to slaughter the cultivators. A few put up a good fight, but none stood a chance, with the mist confusing them and Ashlock assisting with devour. It went exactly as Stella had predicted. Easy. These cultivators ranged from the lower to mid-stage of the Soul Fire Realm, so Ashlock impaled them with black vines coated in ninth stage Soul Fire Realm Chi. While they were busy fighting off the vines, Stella or Diana would dash past and decapitate them. Clearly, the dozen or so cultivators that entered were not a fan of teamwork, and they were all half-focused on collecting the items discarded on the ground. Whereas Stella and Diana were a ruthlessly efficient duo and knew each other's strengths well, likely due to their time spent training together. Three cultivators did slip past Stella and Diana, aiming straight for Ashlock and assumably the forming star core rather than being slowed down for the rewards scattered on the floor. However, before they could reach him, he mobilized his zombie and had it confront them. What the hell is that thing? A buff man with green hair shouted as the zombie with lilac flames pouring from its ears, eyes and mouth emerged from the mist and charged at them with a creepy jitteriness. Just stab it. Another shouted. It's so slow the zombie leapt at the guy and fell just short of him before exploding, dispersing the mist and sending that guy flying back with a wave of lilac chi. With the mist gone, the remaining three could see the many corpses and two girls approaching them with blood-coated blades. Wait. A white-haired woman called out, but it was too late. 
Vines erupted from the ground, which she barely managed to slap away then Diana appeared before her sliced at her legs. The woman tried to fight back, but Stella hurled a lightning bolt at her face and cleanly decapitated her with a sword swing. The corpse toppled to the ground, and Ashlock felt mid-stage soul fire chi flow through his vines. The other two remaining cultivators suffered a similar fate. Ashlock couldn't wait for more cultivators to arrive. Weren't they basically like lambs to the slaughter with his home advantage and allies? He almost felt giddy about how many sacrificial credits he would receive after this fight, but he also needed this darn ascension to the Star Core realm to hurry up. More competent cultivators might arrive soon, and his chi reserves were quickly being diminished. With the immediate fight in the central courtyard concluded, Ashlock had seen more cultivators on the way with his Eye of the Tree God, so he quickly got to work using Root Puppet on a few of the lower stage corpses as they wouldn't give him that many credits anyway. Ashlock then felt a feeling of deep pain and terror shoot down the black tether he had with Larry. Immediately he followed the tether and found a storm of ash swirling around on top of a wall. A sudden wave of green flames caused a slit in the top of the dome, and Ashlock saw the situation inside. He noticed Larry was injured and an evergreen cultivator was fighting him. Ashlock cast Devour without hesitation, and his black vines shot out from a flower bed below the wall and curved over the top. However, due to the far distance, they moved slower than Ashlock wanted. By then, the line of sight on the evergreen cultivator had been lost, but like a homing missile, the vines shot through the ash dome and seemed to hit the person inside. The swirling dome of dense ash began to contract, and Ashlock saw Larry emerge, and he was instantly filled with rage. His summon's fur had been burned off, leaving charred dark purple flesh covered in deep lines resembling rope burns. But worse than all that, Larry was missing a leg, and blood spewed from the tip. Ashlock controlled his silent fury and tried to tell Larry through the link to retreat. But the only emotion he received back was a chaotic primal rage like an intense static noise. Larry had gone berserk and could only see red. The spider ignored Ashlock's commands and dived back into the storm. Does that monster think it can trap me here and escape? Tristan thought as the dome collapsed on top of him. Tristan reeled back his now free hand as his sword had been knocked to the floor somewhere and punched out at the dome. A wave of green flames opened a hole through the wall, and he briefly saw hints of the ongoing fight in the central courtyard. The mist was gone, and he saw many corpses lying face down on the ground. But then the hole rapidly closed before he could see much else. Tisk. Did they lose already? This will be annoying. Tristan muttered. It was a less than ideal situation. Ideally, he wanted the spider to stay in the dome with him so he could fight it face to face in an enclosed area, as his nature Deo thrived in close combat. Whereas the spider relied on sneak attacks and area control. The dome had contracted to only a few meters in diameter, so Tristan concluded there was no way the spider was still inside, so he reeled back his fist to punch a hole through the ash, but then he felt a sudden burning pain. Looking over his shoulder, Tristan saw many red eyes and a fang the size of a sword skewering his fist, which gleamed in the light of his green soul fire. The spider then reared its head, dragging his impaled hand with it. To make things even worse, the dome had collapsed entirely around him, so he couldn't see anything the ash filled his lungs and burned his eyes. Tristan used the dagger in his still free hand to lash out through the ash storm at the spider's face, causing it to shriek through its clenched mouth around his fist. Die, 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 die. Tristan cried as the pain became intolerable, and the spider refused to let go of his fist. How the hell had it suddenly become so strong? Had it gone crazy? Tristan decided this wasn't working, so he burned a large part of his chi reserves to disperse the ash around him by cranking up the ferocity of his soul fire. The flames that had coated his skin roared up to a few meters in height, and Tristan became a column of green hell fire that dispersed all the ash with a wave of his free hand. With his eyes no longer burning. Tristan blinked and saw his surroundings. The spider was still firmly biting his hand, but now two girls stood on either side with swords drawn and an indescribable fury in their eyes. But Tristan was confused. One of the girls was Stella Crestfallen. So who the hell was ascending to the Star Core Realm? Chapter 60, The Abyss's Cold Embrace Ashlock felt a surge of pain through the tether with Larry and also through his devour s vines. The swirling dome of ash that had contracted around the evergreen cultivator suddenly began to glow red hot as if trying to contain a star. Is the evergreen guy going supernova? Ashlock wondered, and his mind raced for a solution. At such a close range, would his trunk even survive? Would Stella and Diana perish? Maybe they could escape down the route into the mine below and survive. 
but there was also a chance the cultivator wasn't in the star core realm. He didn't know the cultivator's strength, but it wasn't looking favorable, as he could make an educated guess if he considered how easily Larry dealt with Soul Fire Realm cultivators in the past. He had assumed Larry's strength as a B-grade summon was somewhere around the upper end of the Soul Fire Realm or perhaps even the early stage of the Star Core Realm. So considering Larry hadn't eaten the guy yet, he was definitely a strong opponent. The Dome of Ash continued to brighten, and then suddenly, the ash exploded outwards in a wave, and a column of green fire erupted over 20 meters into the air. What is that? Stella shouted and began to dash toward the column of fire, is that a Star Core cultivator? Ashlock wanted to shout at them to come back. Why were they running toward the guy? Are they insane? Diana seemed a bit more apprehensive about charging toward a Star Core cultivator as she stood in place for a second, watching the demonstration of power. Still, she soon followed, with mist pouring from her back like a cape and a sword held firm in her hand. Should be with that volume of soul fire. I think I saw the spider going up to deal with someone that had jumped the wall. Diana said as she caught up to Stella. Ashlock watched the two girls jump onto the wall, and they saw Larry and the intruder there. To his surprise, they rushed to Larry's side without hesitation and stood on either side of the behemoth. The spider Ashlock knew they had found so creepy was almost unrecognizable due to its severe injuries. Half of Larry's face had been melted to the bone after the latest explosion, and only two of his eyes seemed functional. Yet even in such a state, Larry refused to let go of his prey and still had a fang impaled through the man's flame-covered fist. Larry was dying. He could feel it through the tether. Only pure rage and hatred were fueling the beast and keeping it alive. Stella Crestfallen, I can recognize those features of the Crestfallen clan anywhere. The man of pure green flame spoke seriously and turned his head to look at Ashlock, I had no idea another of your family survived. A hidden prodigy? An elder that was busy tempering his foundation. The man then snapped Larry's fang by twisting his hand, causing the spider to whimper and then gripped Larry's face and hurled him toward Ashlock. The spider crashed into the tree with a sickening crunch, and his legs slumped as if he was dead. Ashen Prince Larry wishes to evolve. Yes slash no. It would appear that eating a few cultivators before fighting with the evergreen cultivator had given Larry enough chi to evolve into an A-grade monster. Naturally, Ashlock pressed yes. Allowing a summon to evolve took none of his chi or credits. A thin line of silk emerged from Larry and he lethargically wrapped himself to begin his evolution. From last time, Ashlock knew he would get a prompt to select Larry's next evolution path once the cocoon was finished, but it could take hours at this rate. So Larry was out of the fight. That just left himself, Stella, Diana, his zombies, and Maple Wait, where was Maple? Ashlock looked around with his spirit sight but couldn't find the bugger anywhere. Did he run away? Surely not we have a mutual pact of coexistence. So where was he? Sure, the pact didn't explicitly say Maple had to save him, but it seemed the right thing to do. Commencing upgrade to Star Core Realm, 90%. Ashlock was distracted from his search for the darn squirrel by a notification about his ascension, followed by the entire mountain trembling once again. The Star Core, which had been endlessly expanding as the heavens poured thousands of lightning bolts into it, began to shrink as if an invisible force was squashing it. The dark clouds swirled as if affected by the gravity of the star core, and the heavens only escalated their assault, with the golden lightning ramping up in its ferocity. Ashlock had feared that the evergreen cultivator would fight with Stella and Diana but instead the man turned his back on them as if they were mere insects. Neither attacked the man's exposed back as the fierce green flames kept them at bay. The man hopped down from the roof and began to walk through the central courtyard. He didn't even glance at the corpses on the ground mummified by black vines and the three zombies Ashlock had managed to raise were obliterated with a single punch. Stella and Diana had hopped down from the wall and cautiously stayed near the edge of the central courtyard. Ashlock could hear them silently discussing a battle plan with gestures only they seemed to understand, but they didn't seem optimistic about its potential success. The difference between realms was simply too high. Despite not even being in the Star Core realm yet, just looking at the density of the chi from his forming Star Core, Ashlock could estimate it to be over a hundred times greater than his old soul core. As the man walked across the courtyard, Ashlock tried to cast Devour on him again, but the vines coated in his ninth stage soul fire chi couldn't even get close and simply disintegrated and flattened by the intense gravity surrounding the man. He must be burning his chi reserves at a stupidly high rate to maintain that column of fire. Ashlock thought to himself. Was there a way to distract or slow him down? 
The man's eyes which had been glued to the rapidly shrinking star core overhead, flickered between Ashlock's branches as if he was searching for something. Don't want to show yourself. The man mocked. Then I'll help myself to the fruits of your labor. The man raised a hand, and a tendril of green chi shot out and snaked through Ashlock's branches before latching onto his forming star core. Warning, star core ascension unstable. Ashlock could feel himself being drained. It was a bizarre feeling but the star core was a literal manifestation of his soul. So to have someone siphon his soul was naturally horrific. Warning, soul integrity at 99% impending risk of memory loss and soul death. What the fuck? Ashlock cast devour at the man repeatedly, but his flames only became more fierce. They couldn't even get within a meter of the guy before disintegrating. Warning. Ashlock drowned out the notifications and cried out in his mind. Someone help me. What the fuck? Where is Mabel? Had he put too much trust in his allies? What were they doing? Mist filled the courtyard, likely from Diana, and those haunting shadows reappeared. Ashlock had thought this technique was rather overpowered before, but now watching the mist, unable to get near the evergreen cultivator, and the man easily tracking Diana through the mist made him re-evaluate what was powerful in this world. What chance did a mid-stage soul fire realm cultivator have in the face of overwhelming might? The man's mere presence exerted so much gravity on his surroundings that Ashlock doubted Diana could even swing a sword at his neck let alone his intense green flames that incinerated anything that got too close. It seemed almost hopeless. Was he going to die here? Sucked to death by some evergreen bastard? Leave Tree alone. A lone female voice grabbed the man's attention. Stella stood before Ashlock's trunk with a sword held firmly in both hands coated in purple flames and lightning arcing along its surface. Her expression was grim and Ashlock could tell her chi was nearly depleted from the flames flickering. No, run. Leave me. Ashlock cried out. He was convinced that no matter what, he could regrow from the ashes and rise again, but if Stella died, there was no coming back. He had already experienced seeing her corpse and thinking she was dead. Never again. He didn't want to experience it again. Ashlock had no idea what her plan was until she had got the man's full attention, and a shiver ran down Ashlock's spine. Stella's two eyes became swirling abysses, and the evergreen cultivator immediately cancelled his siphoning of Ashlock's star core. Star core ascension stable. Commencing upgrade to star core realm, 91%. The evergreen cultivator seemed clearly affected as his green flames faltered. He immediately bolted at Stella and punched at her stomach which she blocked with the hilt of her sword but was still sent flying back into Ashlock. Luckily, the half-dead Larry cushioned her fall but caused the spider to whimper. Stella coughed violently, and blood spewed from her mouth, but she wiped it away with the back of her hand and glared at the man of green flames that strode toward her. I was always interested in that artifact I heard rumors about it from my brothers. Eye of the Demon they called it, a rather fitting name after experiencing its power. S stay back! Stella shouted, raising her sword with shaking hands and trying to distract the man from Diana, who was approaching from behind. Stella, you told me to leave Tree alone. The evergreen cultivator casually backhanded Diana and sent her flying into one of the walls of the central courtyard not even breaking his stride. Is it the tree that is ascending? A tree with spatial chi. Stella spat blood to the side, as if I would tell a bastard like you. The man chuckled, rich coming from an orphan. Just tell me, and maybe I'll spare you, for the patriarch, of course. Stella remained dead silent, so the man let out a long sigh. His flames died down to a normal level, and he brought out a sword from his spatial ring. Was his chi finally running out? Ashlock did have one trump card remaining but had been waiting for the perfect moment to use it. A shame. The man sighed as he raised the sword up above his head. Stella shuffled back with her sword still held out, but she clearly had little fight left. A tear escaped from the corner of her eye as she gritted her teeth and hissed, This is goodbye, tree. Ashlock ignored her. This was not the end. He would never let death befall his lifelong friend again if he could help it. I am short on time, so I will end it here. Tristan's sword felt heavy and cold in his hand as he raised it above his head. His star core was running on fumes, and the chi in the air was too thin due to the forming star core overhead, so he struggled to regenerate fast enough. Killing Stella Crestfallen was less than ideal as the Patriarch may ask questions but he needed to remove all the obstacles in the courtyard so he could ascend to the second stage of the star core in peace. Other elders may arrive soon with the star core avoiding the supernova stage and now condensing. 
he simply didn't have the time to entertain others. He looked down at the girl. Her blonde hair was haphazardly covering her face, and purple blood likely from the spider corpse she rested on dyed her white clothes. Nevertheless, he somewhat admired the look of determination on her face. But that just made the anticipation of the kill that much more pleasurable. To snuff out the life of someone destined for great things so early on was one of his life's pride and joys. He licked his slips as the euphoria rushed through him. He was superior. The girl knew that and waited for her death at his hands. This was what cultivation of the demonic path was all about. Crush those beneath to rise to a new height. It was all part of heaven's will. To devour, conquer, and rule others. Reach and become the apex. To be the ultimate predator in human form. That was the path he had chosen. A lonely road to the top littered with corpses, blood, and broken promises. Tristan sneered as the girl tried to shuffle away, and he spiritually sensed the other girl pushing herself out of the hole in the wall behind him. It had been but a moment, but the superiority he felt was undeniable. He was the executioner the decider of their fate. But then he heard a crack. His eyes naturally followed the noise. It was coming from the trunk of the tree. Its smooth glossy black surface trembled and split apart. Intrigued by what may lie beyond, Tristan kept watching the spectacle. He had never seen a tree open up before, after all. What he saw beyond the crack was black. It was not darkness caused by a lack of light but rather an unfathomable abyss. It was deep and endless but not empty. Something resided in the abyss. An eye many eyes. All looking at him with alien curiosity. He felt enchanted by their depth and hidden insight. It was as if they had gazed upon the stars, seen universal tyrants birth and extinction. He was totally enthralled. He wanted to know what they knew. See what they saw. He took a step forward and then another. The eyes watched his every move as if inviting him in. He felt a sudden pain in his chest but ignored it. What was a little pain compared to the salvation and wisdom into the divine that these eyes could provide him? They were so peaceful and calm until they weren't. They turned ferocious. Savage. A primal rage that seemed directed at his very soul. Had he angered them somehow? Finally, he couldn't endure their scrutiny and looked away down at his feet. His foot was planted on the chest of a girl he recognized who looked up at him with those same eyes once of an abyss. He shuddered. Why was it so cold? The girl grinned. He followed her gaze and saw a metal blade with blood trickling down its length and tarnishing the girl's pale hands with their sickly color. As the blood flowed, he felt colder. Tracing the blade, he saw it was connected to him, no. Connected was the wrong word. Impaled would be more fitting. He had been impaled through the heart by a sword. Black vines dug into his shins and slowly crawled up his legs like coiling serpents. They shredded his clothes and cut his skin. The pain was terrible he felt so sluggish as if sleep he had been evading for so long had finally caught up to him. His hands reached up and gripped the blade, trying to pull it out, but the girl pushed it in deeper. His mind began to drift. Would going to sleep be such a bad thing? He hadn't rested for so long. The vines wrapped his head and obscured his eyes. He didn't even have the strength to circulate his chi anymore. Suddenly, he felt a sharp pain in his neck, and breathing became impossible. He gasped, but only the gurgling sound of blood reached his ears, and his vision blurred. Finally, he lost his balance as he became lightheaded and tumbled, landing hard on his back. He tried to raise his head, but he felt the weight of the world dragging him back down. A brief moment passed before everything went black. Chapter 61, Not the Time for Alchemy Ashlock waited for the perfect moment to strike. When the evergreen cultivator's chi had run dry, and he stood only a meter away Ashlock unleashed his demonic eye. It was his trump card, and he had no idea if its bizarre effects would even affect the cultivator, but he was desperate. If this failed it was all over. The sound of his trunk cracking open seemed to draw the man's eyes. However, he didn't shy away or shudder like Stella and Diana, rather, he appeared enthralled and drawn in by his demonic eye. The evergreen cultivator kept walking closer and lowered his sword as if hypnotized, he took another step, and Stella groaned and coughed up more blood as the man's foot pressed on her stomach, likely on the same spot he had hit moments ago. Ashlock naturally became enraged. How dare he hurt and step on Stella like that? The man took one more step closer, and to Ashlock's surprise, Stella had managed to raise her sword, balance it on the evergreen cultivator's knee, and thrust it into his upper chest where his heart should be. The man's eyes went wide, and he broke eye contact with Ashlock's demonic eye and stared down at the sword impaling his chest. 
For a brief moment, Ashlock feared the man would kill Stella before he died, so Ashlock cast Devour. The man's chi had completely died down, letting the thorned vines fully mummify him. He tried to reach up to pull away the blade, but Stella just thrust it deeper, causing his arms to go limb. Was he dead? Ashlock feared the cultivator could survive, but then Diana came and sealed the deal. She snuck up from behind, summoned a dagger to her hand, and thrust it between the coiling vines where the back of the man's neck should be. The evergreen cultivator fell backward, the dagger still lodged into his neck, and the blade went all the way through his neck when he hit the floor. The man remained motionless. Dead. Commencing upgrade to Starcore Realm, 95%. It was over, the fight had been won. Ashlock tore his sight away from the corpse being devoured by his vines and looked to the skies above. The star core that had been hundreds of meters across had condensed into a dense, glowing ball the size of Stella's head. It looked so small, floating above his branches. Yet it let out enough light to illuminate the entire mountain range. Suddenly, all the lightning ceased, and dark skies overhead parted. Through the cracks rays of sunshine illuminated Ashlock's scarlet leaves with their warming glow. Heavenly tribulation survived. A tendril of chi emerged from his body like a lasso, grabbed onto the small floating star core that was burning white hot, and dragged it down toward his body. For a second, Ashlock thought the star core would burn a hole through his trunk, but it passed harmlessly through as if it were a ghost. Upgrade to star core realm complete. Damage calculated at 37%. Repair with credits? Yes slash no. Ashlock hesitated on the system prompt. He didn't care about repairing his branches nor the charred holes in his trunk, as he knew they would be regrown with time. What did bother him was the 1% missing part of his soul. He could feel it, a vacant fragment of himself. Casting his spiritual sight back to the courtyard, he saw Diana furiously rummaging through his coiling vines, getting cut in the process. Finally, after a few seconds of wrestling with the vines, she managed to sneak a hand through and, with a tug, pulled a golden ring free. The evergreen cultivator's spatial ring, coated in a thin sheen of fresh blood, shone in the sun as she held it up. Got it. She then pocketed the ring in a safe place and quickly used her own ring to summon some pills. Stella. Are you alright? She dashed over to Stella, who lay sprawled on Larry's abdomen. Blood trailed from the corner of her mouth, and her eyes were closed. Her hand was still limply grasping the sword handle that had killed the cultivator, and a thin smile accompanied her shallow breaths. Diana pushed Stella's lips apart and shoved the pill she was holding into Stella's mouth. Chew this. Your internal injuries might even be fatal if left alone. Stella's eyes snapped open, and she sat up while choking on the pill. W what act the hell she then stopped blabbering as a blast of cold water hit her in the face. Less talking. More cultivating. Diana ordered, cultivators are on the way, I can feel their presence closing in on the base of the mountain, but they are loitering around for some reason. Stella blinked as the frozen water seemed to snap her back to reality. He watched her look around the half-destroyed courtyard littered with corpses being devoured by him as she chewed on the pill. Then, with water still dripping from her face and hair, she sluggishly pushed herself off Larry, sat cross-legged, and began cultivating. Ashlock could tell since she became the central point of a small vortex of chi that had flooded back into the area after his ascension finished. With Stella and Diana sitting cross-legged and busy cultivating, he focused inwards on himself. Floating in his trunk was the new star core. It was captivating, and its immense chi generation flooded every inch of his body nearly instantly. If his previous marble soul core had been a filter that took in the untamed chi from the outside world and forcefully converted it into spatial chi, this star core was a spatial chi generator. However, it didn't rely on chi from the outside. Instead, it produced it all by itself but could be refueled from outside chi if needed. He basically had a power station inside himself now. Spatial Chi rushed down his roots and seemed to endlessly flow into Bob, the slime in the mine, who had almost fully reverted to its previous state as the Spatial Chi had been extracted. Plus 50 SC. Plus 62 SC. Plus 49 SC. Plus 54 SC. Plus 71 SC. Plus 40 SC. Plus 84 SC. All of a sudden, a string of system notifications appeared. Looking back at the central courtyard, Ashlock saw his vines retreating into the ground. Seven of the thirteen corpses had been consumed. That left two more three, including the star core cultivator. Three other corpses were in the courtyard, but Ashlock saved them for the root puppet skill, 
as they would be worth almost zero credits due to their low cultivation realm. It felt weird for Ashlock to see first stage soul fire realm cultivators as ants and deem them worthless, but it was true. To him, blowing up their corpses to get a leg up in the upcoming fight was far more valuable than the few credits they would provide. Plus 63 SC. Plus 59 SC. The final two soul fire cultivators were devoured. Now only the star core cultivator remained. But, to Ashlock's surprise, the devour skill consumed the evergreen corpse much faster, despite the meat's higher chi content. Was this one of the many advantages of his new cultivation realm? Around 10 minutes passed, and then the notification came in. Plus 540 SC. The one star core cultivator had netted him slightly more credits than all of the other corpses combined, yet only a single realm separated them. Was the gap between the star core realm and soul fire realm that great? Would he get zero credits from something in the chi realm now? It was a sad realization, but it made sense. The chi he could absorb from a chi realm bird would be like a drop of water onto the sun. But perhaps most worrying of all his soul was still missing a small chunk, even after absorbing the evergreen cultivator that had siphoned his soul. Would he never be able to get it back? Ashlock summoned his sign-in system for the first time in what felt like ages to see if it held any answers to his dilemma. Idle Tree Daily Sign-in System Day, 3472 Daily Credit, 0 Sacrifice Credit, 1072 Sign-in Hey? 0 Daily Credits It was only now that Ashlock realized how busy today had been. Only this morning, he unlocked his demonic eye which led to him investigating the mines, and then Senior Lee visited for an hour or so, and his gift caused this battle by forcing him to ascend to the Star Core realm. And the day was far from over if what Diana said about the cultivators was true it would be a long night of fighting. Casting eye of the tree god, Ashlock confirmed that more cultivators were gathered around the mountain base, but they seemed to be waiting for someone by how they impatiently tapped their feet and looked down the dirt path that led to the old Ravenborn mountain. Well, whoever they are waiting for. I hope they take their darn time, Ashlock grumbled. Stella and Diana were depleted of chi, Larry was half dead, and Maple was missing. Even Ashlock had issues. A third of his branches had been blasted off, and his trunk was covered in charred holes. Moreover, his chi was still somewhat chaotic as he got used to controlling his new star core. I should sign in. A thousand points should get me an A grade draw, at the very least. With the prompt still floating in his mind, Ashlock said yes. Sign in successful, 1072 credits consumed. Upgraded Chi Fruit Production B Chi Fruit Production A. To see that one of his most valuable and versatile spells had upgraded to A grade filled Ashlock with anticipation. Last time he had gained the ability to add seeds, a power he hadn't fully tapped into, but his roots would soon reach the baby demonic trees, and he would find out the fruits of his labor. As the information flooded his mind on the potential of his upgraded skill, he opened the production menu. Sure enough, a new option had been added. He could now perform alchemy, meaning he could create pills, but with his fruit. Unlike his other fruit, which grew from his branches, these cauldron fruits grew from the ground via his roots. Despite the situation, Ashlock decided to try growing one. His star core pulsed with power, and in real time, Ashlock watched as a round black fruit that seemed to have a hard shell emerged from the ground, drawing both the girls' attention. They both got up from their cultivation and wandered over. The large black fruit came to their waists and had an open top like a cauldron filled with lilac fire. Tree, what is this? Stella asked, looking toward Ashlock with a confused expression. Maybe it helps us cultivate. Diana tapped her chin, or does it shoot fireballs at intruders? That would be very useful right now. Sadly, that was far from the case. The system always gave him useful skills just rarely perfect for the present situation. But he could see the vast potential of his now upgraded fruit production skill. He could picture it now, the courtyard filled with expert alchemists gathered around his cauldron fruit, throwing in ingredients and letting him merge them into the perfect pills. Did he mention that this skill produced the highest grade pills from the provided ingredients due to his soul flame's purity? What if he threw his own truffles and fruit filled with his skills into the cauldron? Maybe Ashfallen was destined to become an alchemist sect? It would be an excellent way to bring in some profits since all the spirit ore had been mined. He needed to tell the girls about it as they were still standing near the cauldron fruit, looking baffled, and they were wasting time. As enemies awaited at their doorstep, now was not a good time to dawdle on alchemy. It was regrettable, 
but Ashlock used one of the corpses through Root Puppet to write with blood on the wall. Stella stood for a while, glaring at the words as if struggling to piece them together. But after consulting her notes, she finally understood. Alchemy Furnace Stella twirled around on her foot and looked at the lone fruit, that thing is for alchemy. She turned to Diana, do you know anything about alchemy? Diana shrugged, not a whole lot. It was never really my thing. You don't even know the most novice information about it. Stella seemed skeptical. I literally know nothing about alchemy, so anything you know would be useful. Oh, of course, you know nothing about a super common topic. Diana rolled her eyes, simple answer is a cultivator uses their flames and carefully combines ingredients in the heat of their soul flame. That is indeed a simple answer. Stella narrowed her eyes. Diana sighed, returned to the cauldron fruit, and looked down at the lilac flames within, usually, alchemy is done within a furnace of some kind. So I guess this is the furnace? But why are there already flames? Well, maybe tree will perform the alchemy for us. Stella frowned, is that even possible? Diana shrugged, who knows? You don't seem very enthusiastic about this. Stella pouted, wouldn't alchemy be great for us? Why aren't you more excited? Maybe because we are in the middle of a war with one of our clanmates half dead and the other missing. Diana retorted and gestured to Larry, without that spider and the squirrel off somewhere, it's just the two of us without much chi left and the tree versus, possibly the entire evergreen and winter wrath families. Oh. Stella looked toward the ajar door to the pavilion, that does make sense. Diana immediately sat back down and got into a cross-legged position, if you don't want to die, stop worrying about alchemy and get to cultivating. Stella glared at Diana briefly before sitting down with a huff, fine. Ashlock was glad Diana refocused Stella. She always got far too distracted by anything concerning him and was quickly drawn to new shiny things. In contrast, Diana was more goal-orientated and focused on the task at hand. With the girls cultivating again, Ashlock also focused back on himself. The missing fragment of his soul needed more investigating, and he also needed to test something. Could he use Chi outside his body now that he had become a star core cultivator? Chapter 62, A Step to Divinity Ashlock had a problem one that Senior Lee had pointed out. There was an apparent disconnect between his consciousness, a hazy blue cloud of nodes that connected to everything, and his soul, which was now a star core. Senior Lee had initially believed there were two souls in his body and had claimed his consciousness was incompatible with his body. This was an assessment that Ashlock agreed with as the more he thought about it. The concept that he was a mind trapped in a tree rather than a tree with a human mind made sense. Lilac flames that were denser than ever flickered to life across his branch, drawing the brief attention of Stella, but she soon returned to her cultivation with a smile. Unsurprisingly the flames of his soul refused to leave the confines of his body. Power was never the limiting factor here. Instead, it was his body a prison for his mind. His consciousness could affect and direct everything within himself, but he could not access the outside world. Only by using puppets and forcing his chi through their spiritual roots could he influence the outside world. So what was the solution? How could he fix this? The obvious answer was to become fully tree. However, there was a chance that his reincarnated soul, which was once human, was simply incompatible with a tree, and only through the system was he able to puppet the tree's body as if it were his own in the first place. So was the system his only savior? Was there a skill he was lacking? Or did he need to ascend to a higher realm for the system to reward him? Ashlock didn't like his odds. The last thing he wanted to do was fully rely on the unpredictable system. He wanted to carve out a solution by himself in the likely scenario that the system never helped him. So other than throwing away his humanity somehow and fully embracing the tree life to morph his consciousness into one that fit a tree, was there another way? Ashlock let his mind wander for a while. He looked at his pulsing star core surrounded by the hazy blue cloud representing his consciousness. He could feel a piece of himself still missing, like a thought at the back of his mind that was impossible to remember. He hated it. Why had his star core formed outside of the safety of his body out in the open like that? What if more people had turned up and siphoned half his soul? Would he even still be sane? He would definitely set up a barrier or something for next time. Scrutinizing his star core, Ashlock confirmed he didn't have a slice missing, like a partly eaten tangerine it was still spheroidal, just missing a piece. Could he fill that gap with something? The obvious answer would be with a piece of soul, but even after devouring the evergreen cultivator, he hadn't gained the fragment of his soul back. Why though? 
Had the man star core gobbled it up and turned it into nothing but soul energy? What even made up his soul? Ashlock felt like he had a headache. Souls confused him. He thought back to his idea of plugging up the hole. Was his star core the tree part of him and his consciousness human? Or was it his star core that was disconnected from his tree body? What if he plugged the hole in his star core with his consciousness? Or somehow linked his mind with his soul? A great trail of thought, but how does one even do that? There were no guidebooks or maybe there were. What if this problem had been encountered before, and there was a technique manual about this very issue? Ashlock tried to mentally shove his consciousness toward the star core, but sure enough, it didn't move. All he got was a worse headache. His star core kept pumping out chi, which naturally flowed throughout his body and followed his cultivation technique that now ran permanently without much active thought after practicing it for so long, almost like breathing. Although the chi moved naturally throughout his body without much input, he could still consciously manipulate it with his mind within the confines of his body. Ashlock took a deep breath. It felt good to identify the issue. His body, mind, and soul were simply out of sync. Three independent entities that affected each other but weren't operating in harmony causing him to be unable to affect the outside world. All he needed was to discover a link. Something to tie him all together. Opening his system, Ashlock looked for a potential solution. Demonic Spirit Tree, H, 9. Star Core, First Stage. Soul Type, Amethyst, Spatial. Mutation. Demonic IB. Summons. Ashen Prince, Larry B. Skills. Eye of the Tree God A. Deep Roots A. Magic Mushroom Production A. Lightning Chi Barrier A. Chi Fruit Production A. Language of the World B. Root Puppet B. Fire Chi Protection B. Transpiration of Heaven and Earth C. Devour C. Hibernate C. Basic Poison Resistance F. None of his skills exactly jumped out to him as a solution other than his chi fruit production which now allowed him to perform alchemy. Unfortunately, his knowledge of pills in this world was even lower than Stella's, and he didn't even have the intuition from his life on earth to use here as he hadn't been a pharmacist. Of course, he had read some cultivation novels and knew of some common pill types, but there were no guarantees they worked in this world. So far, he had seen healing pills and lightning chi filled pills. So not much evidence of soul fusing pills. What about mind-altering drugs or people that cultivated the Deo of Souls? Ashlock hadn't seen evidence of either, but his magic mushroom production might have a similar effect. Looking through the pop-up menu, Ashlock could see the timer ticking down on the truffle he had started growing long ago. But why does it say the estimated time till completion is only two weeks now? Ashlock couldn't remember what it had said before as he knew it would take a year or so to grow, but he was certain there weren't supposed to be only two weeks left. Oh. My chi output increased drastically. That makes sense. Another new benefit of his star core had been found. He could now produce more magic mushrooms and grow them faster. If people uncover this ability of mine, I am going to become some supreme being's drug producer, aren't I? Ashlock could only sigh and scroll through the options. Since he could make more now, he would make one for Diana and see if he could find an option for himself. For Diana he decided to make a second spirit root upgrading truffle as she also had inferior spirit roots like Stella. He would make more, but he wanted the maximum chi available for the upcoming fight. The completion time appeared, and it claimed it would only take a month to grow, which was 12 times faster than it had been in the soul fire realm. Perfect. But there doesn't seem to be anything that useful for me here. Ashlock did decide to grow another truffle that induced a hallucination about the Deo but its chance of working was slim. Also it seemed to only affect whatever Deo the person was already aligned with, so for him, it would be some enlightenment regarding spatial. Not what I'm looking for, but still useful. Ashlock browsed his abilities one last time and was ready to give up when a sudden idea popped into his mind. What about my inventory? It wasn't a place he often checked as the system had focused on providing him skills and summons over items, but something was still floating there. Seniors Lee's Gift when he concentrated on that obsidian thing that looked like a tooth or possibly a claw, the system notified him of its name again. Divine Fragment SSS. Something in its name caught his eye. Fragment. He had lost a fragment of his soul and searched for something to plug that hole. Wouldn't an SSS grade fragment be the perfect fit? This has to be a terrible idea, right? Ashlock wondered as he mulled over the fragment's origins, when Senior Lee gave me that fragment, 
I saw visions of a lot of angry immortal looking people and things hunting down the owner of this divine fragment. That had to mean merging with it was a terrible idea. The fragment was from an unknown entity that was clearly hunted by the gods. To merge with a piece from such a being might lead to disaster. Or was this an opportunity for another massive power-up? Just accepting the gift and storing it away had vastly increased his cultivation. For all he knew, this was a fragment of a god, hence the divine part of the name. Would merging his soul with a fragment of a god make him a demigod? Ashlock took a deep non-existent breath and stopped looking within himself. He needed to clear his mind. The courtyard was peaceful for the most part if one overlooked the blood-covered broken walls or the fallen branches surrounded by smashed poisonous fruits. But for how long would it remain peaceful like this? He had already attracted the attention of the entire valley by ascending to the Star Core realm, and then Senior Lee had come and checked him out because he evolved and gained a demonic eye. He couldn't keep a low profile anymore. Ashlock activated his eye of the tree god and realized he could now see the entire valley, including Dark Light City. Is that an airship? He saw a red balloon sailing across the sky and over the valley. Does that mean there are other cities nearby? Ashlock couldn't believe it. Dark Light City was already the size of a metropolis. It practically filled the entire valley. The Ravenborn Grand Elder's explosion had looked devastating with his limited view, but the destroyed portion was minuscule in the grand scheme of things. Ashlock could see cultivators suddenly shroud themselves in green and white flames throughout the city and begin heading his way. Did their family send out a signal or something? Things were looking grim, as Diana had pointed out previously. The girls were both mid-stage Soul Fire Realm cultivators and had only gotten the upper hand over the previous group of cultivators because they had let their guard down while being distracted by the items thrown on the ground. It also helped that the cultivators refused to work with one another and were also blinded by the forming Star Core. But now Diana and Stella were depleted of chi. And Larry lay half dead, slowly covering himself in silk and trying to evolve. Ashlock realized it was time for him to step up as the patriarch of his sect. He couldn't hide behind his allies forever, and since he was now the highest realm individual in the sect, except maybe Mabel, he was now expected to pull his weight. Cultivators swarmed around the base of the mountain. Ashlock could see, hundreds. There were too many to count. There was a genuine chance that this could be the last night Ashlock knew peace. It didn't take a seasoned general to see the chance of them all surviving even until the morning was impossible. Ashlock needed something to turn the tides. If he was about to lose everything anyway, why not take the risk and merge with the fragment of a slain divine being? Opening his inventory, Ashlock looked at the obsidian tooth that was the size of a person. It gleamed with a mysterious power as if calling him. He reached out, touching it with his mind. Merge with? Divine fragment. A system prompt appeared in front of it. Asking him a question that might change the fate of his life here in this world. He hesitated for a brief second, but he couldn't see another way. Mentally he replied yes to the system. The obsidian tooth vanished from his inventory, and he felt a sudden pain, but it wasn't a physical pain, but rather a phantom one that pierced his soul. Looking back within his trunk, the obsidian tooth's flat end was lodged into the wall of his trunk while the point was piercing his star core. Merge complete. Race evolved demonic spirit tree demonic demi divine tree. As a step below godhood, you are now more resistant to heaven's wrath and are no longer limited by the lower realm's suppression. Your cultivation potential below the heavens is now limitless. Information about his new abilities and potential flooded his mind, but Ashlock cared for none of that right now. All that mattered was whether he could use his chi outside his body. Limitless potential mattered little if he might not even survive till sunrise. His star core was no longer freely suspended in the middle of his trunk but was now anchored to the wall by the divine fragment. It felt more, connected. Sure enough, as he commanded his spatial chi, it channeled through the fragment and into his body. But the fragment did something else it seemed to link him to heaven's will. The world now understood his intentions. He was no longer cut off from the outside world. His spatial chi rushed through his branches covering them with lilac flames, and with just a simple thought, the space between them shuddered before being torn apart. He had created a portal. Stella and Diana shot up from their meditation and glanced toward the opening rift between Ashlock's branches. What in the Nine Realms? Stella shouted and dashed toward him, Tree can use techniques now. Chapter 63, He Who Punches the Void With the turbulent storm gone, the gathered cultivators at the mountain's base watched the sun dip below the valley's mountain range and plunge them into darkness. Only the subtle moonlight shed a hint of light upon the dirt road that led to Dark Light City and the new evergreen mountain. 
Eleanor Evergreen frowned for the umpteenth time at the empty road and tapped her foot impatiently. It had been hours since she arrived here with the others, but the Grand Elders were yet to show up and direct them. One of her followers noticed her annoyed gaze and approached her with cautious steps. Eleanor, I am afraid there is still no news from the Grand Elders. Eleanor stayed silent for a moment, rolling her tongue between her teeth. She wanted to say many things, but they were improper to come from such a dignified lady like herself. But she could only tolerate the cowardice of those old foggies for so long. They had feared approaching the forming star core due to the chance of it going supernova, but that hadn't happened. So now Stella Crestfallen, the girl Eleanor had sent that love-struck Mike to kidnap months ago, was a realm above her. And that was a big problem. Eleanor was still stuck at the ninth stage of the Soul Fire realm. She had once been heralded as a genius throughout the sect for reaching the stage ten years ago. However, she was now in her late twenties and still showed no sign of being able to form a star core. Eleanor looked down at the man that had given her the bad news. Devon, the risk of the star core going supernova has passed. So why are the Grand Elders not here yet? It has been hours. Devon's expression darkened. There are rumors that Tristan Evergreen your star core realm cousin, participated in the first wave. So. Eleanor snapped back. She hated whenever that bastard was mentioned. He had taken the family by storm when he emerged from their formation room as a new star core cultivator. His presence had utterly disrupted the already tipping balance between the two families as the Evergreens became the clear dominator in the partnership. Well, he has yet to return alongside the twelve other cultivators that went along with him to the peak. Devon said carefully, we believe he might have perished at the hand of Stella. Eleanor's annoyed tapping ceased, and she stared wide-eyed at Devon. Perished. There was a brief moment of ecstasy at the thought of Tristan's corpse, but her calculative mind soon returned. She shook her head and chuckled, how could Stella Crest fall and fight off twelve cultivators and kill my cousin all by herself while freshly ascending to the star core realm and not well practiced with her new level of power? Devon frowned and rubbed his chin momentarily while gazing up the steep mountain to the pavilion at the top shrouded in the moonlight. Eleanor Evergreen couldn't help but sneer. It simply doesn't make sense. Your logic is flawed. No. Devon turned back and appraised her sternly, who said Stella was alone. Eleanor remained silent. She knew from her scouting for a potential soul furnace to conduct a pill to help her break through to the next realm that the Red Vine Peak had been long abandoned, and only Stella Crestfallen had lived here for the last decade. Of course, there was a slight possibility someone else had taken up residence in the decrepit and abandoned peak, but she doubted it. Who would be desperate enough to reside here? Devon remained watching her facial expression but her gaze remained emotionless. Nobody in her family knew of her plans, and she wished to keep it that way. You are right, Devon. I have no way to confirm if Stella Crestfallen is alone up there. So what do you believe happened? Well, it's all speculation, but if you look at the facts, the Crestfallen family used the spatial element, and Stella is rumored to be very talented. So the person ascending to the star core was likely her. Devon paused to collect his thoughts, so... If she was busy ascending when Tristan and the others attacked, someone else had to protect her, and this elusive second person has to be at least in the first stage of the Star Core realm. Eleanor hadn't expected a good answer from Devon, but what he said made some sense. Had an ancestor of the Crestfallen family survived and kept a low profile? Raising the girl from the shadows and conserving their strength? A rumor did come to mind. Stella Crestfallen had been nicknamed Demonis because of an artifact or technique she had gotten from somewhere. Had this elder given her that power to protect herself while they were in seclusion? There were too many questions and not enough answers. Do we have to wait for the Grand Elders? Can't we just storm up there ourselves and take a look? Eleanor said while grumbling. Devon laughed, if you want to die so soon, be my guest. I have no idea what is keeping the Grand Elders from arriving, but if there are two Star Core cultivators up there, we will need all of us and the Grand Elders to stand a chance. Eleanor contemplated Devon's words as her sights returned to the moonlit mountain peak, but something suddenly appeared before her blocking her view. She couldn't help but blink in confusion. A rift in space had opened between them and the mountain. It was a slice through reality, slowly opening like a maw to the void beyond. The chi of the rift was chaotic, and it was barely stable. It looked like the work of an amateur, but the sheer volume of chi rushing to tear the space apart was mind-blowing. Star Core Realm Eleanor muttered as she took a hesitant step back and willed her green flames to life. Stella must be attacking Eleanor froze in fear as she saw something within the void. 
It was distorted, so she couldn't get a clear view, but if she looked closely, she could see an eye glaring at her. It was like being eyed by a top-ranked monster an indescribable feeling of inferiority washed over her and made her shudder. No. This wasn't the gaze of a top-ranked monster it was the eye of a godlike being. Before Eleanor could even turn to run, she saw black tentacles covered in spikes wriggle through the rift and latch onto Devon. Before the man could react, he was dragged, kicking, and screaming, toward the rift. Eleanor didn't even have time to react, it happened so fast, and she felt rooted with fear from the eye's intense gaze as if amused by her puny attempts to defy it. Devon was dragged headfirst through the rift, screaming. But before his body was completely pulled into the void, Devon managed to surround his fist with flames and punch at the rift. A terrible idea. Eleanor was thrown backward and smashed into a tree as a wave of spatial chi accompanied the rift, suddenly collapsing. Her arms which she had brought up at the last second, were burned, and if not for her chi protecting her, she might have died. That bitch! Eleanor spat blood to the side and heaved herself from the wrecked tree. To sneak attack like that she is even more of a coward than I thought. Eleanor coughed blood and stumbled as she tried to gain her bearings. Cultivators from the two families rushed toward her, shouting her name, but her ears were ringing and her sight blurry. Then, a moment later, she recovered as her body flooded with chi. She looked past the group of concerned cultivators and saw the upper half of Devon's torso lying on the ground. Eleanor Evergreen. A man with snow white hair and a robe barked from the side, ignoring her condition, what in the nine realms was that? An attack, obviously. Eleanor rolled her eyes as she summoned a healing pill and ate it, a poorly made portal, but with a tremendous amount of chi behind it. I suspect it was constructed by Stella Crestfallen. What about those vines? The man replied, ignoring her rude tone. Vines. Eleanor questioned. Had there been vines? Yes, vines. The man crossed his arms, there is residual spatial and a hint of nature deo intent in the air. I believe those black tentacles were vines or roots of some kind. What the winter wrath man said made sense. Eleanor shook her head and re-evaluated the situation. Was Stella Crest fallen opening the rift and the other star core realm sending the vines through? Of course, only a nature-aligned star core could control the vines like this. Then a terrible idea occurred to Eleanor. What if Tristan Evergreen had never left the mountain and decided to team up with Stella to betray the family? With two star core realms, they could contend with the other families, especially if they worked together like this. It was a plausible conclusion and one that terrified Eleanor to her core. But what was that I? A mental attack? She had heard of Stella Crestfallen being called a demoness due to her artifact, but she had never personally experienced its effects. Had it gotten stronger after she reached Star Core? Eleanor felt like all the puzzle pieces were slowly coming together since when had Tristan Evergreen and Stella Crestfallen planned this? How had they maintained contact in secret? In fact, the family still didn't know exactly how Tristan had reached the Star Core realm so quickly. She was broken from her thoughts when another rift suddenly opened. This time she was ready and immediately closed her eyes, focusing solely on spiritual sight. Unfortunately, the Winter Wrath man seemed less prepared and, just like Devon, found himself entirely immobilized by the vines as they wrapped around his limbs. He fell to the ground frylied around kicked at the soil in a vain attempt to try and break free, but nothing worked. The vines slowly dragged him toward the barely open rift. His soul fire roared around him illuminating his terrified face in a white glow, but the vines became coated in a sheen of lilac chi, just like the forming star core from earlier, meaning he was still unable to break free. Eleanor blinked. Was Stella a dual affinity? How could the vines from Tristan be coated in Stella's spatial chi? These were questions for another time. Eleanor didn't particularly care for the man, but she still felt some obligation to at least try and save him. A sword appeared in her hand, and she closed her eyes trying to ignore the ominous gaze of the eye that she could still feel, and swung her sword at the vines. Her sword connected, and she felt the vines she hit give way, but there were still many coiling around the man. So she blindly raised her sword and, using her spiritual sense, struck at the vines between him and the rift, but then she felt her sword being held by something. Opening her eyes, she came face to face with the distorted godlike creature's eye that looked at her with a wrathful fury that made her want to run away but she couldn't vines now coiled around her sword. Frozen in fear. Eleanor's hands felt limp, and with another tug, her sword flew from her hand and went through the rift. Ah! <laughs> the Winter Wrath Man flew past her into the rift alongside a few other cultivators who failed to fight the vines. 
Eleanor stumbled backward and then managed to break into a sprint. The situation had changed. She needed to contact the Grand Elders immediately. Tristan had switched sides, and Stella Crestfallen was far stronger than anyone anticipated. A new powerhouse had taken root in the Blood Lotus sect. Chapter 64, Black-Blooded Ashlock had always been an observer, which felt normal as a tree, so he hadn't questioned it much throughout the years. Nevertheless, he was a mind trapped within a body of wood, unable to speak or interact with the people or the world that passed him by except with the assistance of system-granted skills. However, at the back of his mind, he knew something was missing. He had seen faint whispers of chi through his spirit sight he could watch the ebb and flow of the mystical force constantly flowing around him, just out of his reach. His trunk acted as an impassable wall between him and the ability to command the chi and shout at it to do his bidding. His demonic eye had given the world color. He could see the chi was not just an untamable force like an ocean but rather a collection of gentle streams that could be nudged and altered by the beings, such as the cultivators, living in this vibrant world except him. He was an observer. A bystander. Untamed chi could enter his body through the tips of his roots and the pores of his leaves. The chi could traverse through his thousand meters of roots, swirl within his trunk, become morphed to his spatial affinity, and then be directed to wherever he needed it to be. But the second that chi was dismissed through his leaves or roots, it was gone out of his reach and control. But that had all changed by merging with the divine fragment and becoming one with heaven's will. As a demi-divine being, he was no longer an observer but now a participant. When he had meditated with his cultivation technique in the past, all that occurred was the feeling of chi going through his body and nourishing his soul. But now that he was linked with heaven's will through the divine fragment, his cultivation technique felt like making a connection with the world. Just like before, how he could control the chi that was within him, he could now do the same to the chi he breathed out. He was breathing in heaven's intent and breathing out his morphed will. To put it more simply the trunk he found his mind and soul contained within had acted like a prison, and the divine fragment had carved a hole through the prison cell allowing him to communicate with the outside world and the heavens. Because without this vital connection between soul and heaven, the possibility of bending the heavens will to his ideals was impossible. He had been able to vaguely force this connection through root puppets by abusing the corpse's lingering attachment to heaven. But once the latent chi within their bodies was exhausted, the connection was cut, and the corpses would explode from his chi as it had nowhere else to go. Transpiration of heaven and earth his system-granted cultivation technique brought chi in through his roots, funneled it through his star core where he gave the chi spatial affinity, and then his mind gave the turbulent spatial chi intent. When the chi was expelled through his leaves via transpiration, it instantly got to work carrying out his intent. Finally, Ashlock no longer lost connection with the chi once it had left his body. He maintained control and could manipulate it beyond his body. As the spatial chi floated there between two of his branches, he willed it to become a portal. He gave the chi his intent and knowledge, and the heavens received his vague goal and endeavored to realize it. A rift formed. It was clearly unstable and tiny, but the heavens had listened to him for the very first time. Not his puppets, but him. He had done this with his own body and mind. What in the Nine Realms? Stella shouted and dashed toward him, Tree can use techniques now. The rift he had created between his branches unsurprisingly collapsed, rustling his leaves and startling Diana who had been cultivating. Weirdly, she gave him a side glance but quickly sat back down and returned to cultivating with a troubled expression. Ashlock paid her no heed and focused on the girl excitedly hopping up and down below his trunk, tree. Tree. Do it again. Her excitement was warranted but was affecting his concentration. Can you stop jumping around and shouting, please? He spoke aloud, but as expected, Stella still couldn't hear him, even with his new realm. This is a big moment for me, and I need to concentrate. Tree. Stella shouted again as if he couldn't hear her the first time. Try to pour some more chi into it. You were so close. Ashlock followed her vague instructions, but pouring more chi into the rift made it bigger and even more unstable. It opened and collapsed within the blink of an eye sending a shockwave that made his branches groan and shake. Clearly, her advice sucked. What he needed was to concentrate and convey his intent to heaven in a way it understood. Who? Tree, try again. Stella clapped from the side with sparkles in her eyes. Her cheerleading was slowing down his progress, and she really should be focusing on her own cultivation it could be any moment now that the cultivators rushed up the mountain. Tree, have you tried? Stop. Ashlock shouted in his mind. His star core flared to life, and Stella stumbled as a pressure descended upon her. 
Ashlock instantly calmed down, seeing Stella struggling and reigned in his Star Core's gravity. Whoops, I forgot Star Core Realm cultivators had their own gravitational field. This should work really well with my other skills. Stella hung her head low, and her blonde hair obscured her face. But with his spirit sight, Ashlock could naturally see she was holding back tears. He was baffled for a moment. What had led to such a reaction? Had his star core's gravity really been so strong that it hurt her? Sorry. Stella sniffled and stepped back, I got overly excited. I... I was just trying to help but no you don't need it. Well, now he just felt bad. Stella had been annoying him, and her attitude didn't match the grave situation, but maybe pressuring her with his realm gave off the wrong impression. Stella walked back to where Diana was cultivating, plopped onto the cold stone like a rejected teenager, and closed her eyes. He could tell by the flow of the ambient chi that she wasn't cultivating, and her breathing was too sporadic for a cultivation technique that relied heavily on controlled breathing. The central courtyard returned to an eerie silence. Only the sound of Larry slowly wrapping himself in silk and Stella's erratic breathing could be heard. Even the usual chirp of birds was absent, likely due to the prior storm scaring them all off. Ashlock's mood had soured, but now wasn't a good time. War didn't care for emotions, and he needed to grasp his new connection with the heavens before they attacked, otherwise, Stella won't even be alive by sunrise for him to apologize. It took a while to clear his chaotic mind and dull his emotions. But eventually, his mind was clear, and he could focus on cultivation. Which had a whole new feel now that he could communicate with the heavens. He could sense heaven's curiosity and somewhat converse with it. It was a supernatural force, an entity with a sort of mind and will of its own. Only through a mutual understanding with this supernatural entity could Ashlock hope to manipulate Chi. And this relationship needed to be fostered. Hours of practice passed by. Ashlock suspected this is what the cultivators meant when they spoke of enlightenment. The first step was to meditate and converse with the heavens. Then through repetition and practice, Ashlock could correct heaven with each iteration, so it could better understand his intent. Kinda like working with an artist and trying to convey the idea you have in your head, and it's only through the artist showing various sketches made from interpreting your words you can guide them on what to change to meet your idea. That enlightenment moment was when a cultivator's intent perfectly aligned with heaven's understanding. When that perfect unison is achieved, the cultivator feels enlightened as heaven and themselves understand each other on a deeper level. The next time they use that technique will be a breeze, and so will future techniques as they can build upon each other's understanding. This was the realization Ashlock came to over the past few hours as he rigorously practiced the portal technique. As it turned out, his scientific way of thinking was fine. It was getting heaven to comprehend his line of thinking that took time. It wasn't stupid. But it was as if he was shouting orders at it in French, and it only understood Spanish, so much of the nuance was lost in translation. Repetition is the mother of learning. With each rift he created, his control got a little better, and by sundown, he believed he had cracked it. Finally, he could conjure up a portal between two branches, leading to another one opened between two other branches on the opposite side of his body. And considering how massive he had become, it wasn't an insignificant distance. The portals weren't stable, and he wouldn't trust sending either of the girls through one. But from prior experience, he knew a collapsing portal was just as deadly as an open one. Now he just had to figure out how to attack the people loitering around at the mountain's base. He had regularly checked on them, but they still hadn't moved. Some seemed more agitated than others, but the group of cultivators was only growing, and more pooled in from the city. It was a staggering amount. Two entire families had gathered with the intent to storm the Red Vine Peak, and that was the last thing he wanted. Throughout the evening, he abused his new star core to expand his roots in every direction and made some of them into tunnels that Stella and Diana could use to escape if needed. With his new realm and star core, his growth rate had increased tenfold, and although still a tree and slow at everything, he could grow his roots at a walking pace now. The cultivators were mostly oblivious, but he was tunneling beneath them. He was just a few meters below those resting on a hill at the base of the mountain in front of the forest surrounding a dirt path. It was within that forest that some of his children had grown, and he intensely disliked the idea of the cultivators being so close to them. If I could scare them away somehow. Ashlock had only tried to use techniques around his own body so far. However, he knew he could forcefully push and control Chi through his roots. It's how he had killed the rats in the mineshaft, and now that he could control Chi that left his body, why couldn't he use techniques wherever his roots are? His devour technique utilized vines that grew out of his trunk, 
so he couldn't use that to kill these cultivators so far away. What if I open a portal and drag them through it? It opened him up to a counter-attack as a portal was a two-way street. He could attack them, but they could strike back. I need to stun them somehow. Naturally, his demonic eye came to mind, allowing him to hypnotize and overcome that evergreen star core cultivator. Ashlock used his eye of the tree god to find the person closest to the mountain that was emitting the most chi. If he was going to expose one of his attacks, he wanted to grab one of their strongest first with the element of surprise. From his search, he identified a green-haired woman and a man. Both were clearly from the Evergreen family. The lady was at the peak of the Soul Fire realm as her chi was dense, but she lacked that gravity a star core had as the grass near her shoe wasn't bowing to her presence. The man seemed a bit weaker but still in the upper end of the Soul Fire realm. These two were also semi-isolated, so targeting them seemed perfect. Making his root poke out of the ground, he used that as the anchor point for the portal and then pushed as much chi as the root could handle into the portal's creation. Sure enough, much of the chi was lost to the mountain rock and soil due to the long distance, but luckily, his star core was overpowered enough to forcefully push chi over thousands of meters. Then for the final touch, he opened his demomic eye and created the portal's other end right in front of his trunk. The sudden appearance of the eye naturally drew Stella's attention, but again weirdly, Diana didn't react. He looked a little closer at Diana and noticed in the darkness of the late evening that Diana's veins had turned pitch black as if her blood had become liquid tar. What the hell? Ashlock wondered, but he had to focus back on his newly created portal so it wouldn't collapse. Space tore apart, and through his demonic eye, it looked like he had made a distorted tunnel from the top of the mountain to the base, but it instantly covered the distance. Deciding to grab as many people as possible while he had the element of surprise, Ashlock cast Devour and black vines shot out from his body and went through the tear in space. Weirdly the only thing he noticed was that the air surrounding the vines at the top of the mountain was much colder than the air at the mountain's base, thousands of meters below. The view through the portal was distorted, so it was hard to target the correct person, but he managed to grab the man as the lady had stepped backward in time. Stella stood beside his eye with her back turned to it. She had her purple flames ready to block an attack and protect him. It was a nice gesture and convinced him she had forgiven him for the earlier incident. As Ashlock pulled the man through the portal, the idiot seemed to decide it was an excellent idea to attack the rift while he was halfway through. That's like setting an elevator on fire while still inside, Ashlock grumbled, losing control over the rift as the man's nature chi, disrupted the spatial chi intent operating the portal. An explosion filled the courtyard, and the man, still covered in green flames, went flying and stopped after smacking into Ashlock's trunk. Stella looked down at the torso of the man severed in half just below the lungs and shook her head. He always was half a man. Did Stella just tell a joke? She seemed to think it was rather funny as she turned to Diana while chuckling and pointing to the man. But Diana was too busy spewing black blood from her mouth to see what Stella was laughing at. Diana. Stella called and rushed over, Hey. Are you alright? Diana never replied. She quivered before collapsing onto her back with her eyes wide open looking at the night sky. Chapter 65, Rift Assassin The cool mountain breeze did little to calm Stella's racing heart as she rushed to Diana's side. The darkness of dusk had masked Diana's condition, but now that Stella kneeled by her side, with her purple flames illuminating Diana's face she could see black lines like a spider web under her pale skin crawling up her neck. Diana's eyes were wide open, and her breathing was erratic, as if she was being strangled and gasping for air. Diana? Hey. Stella gently shook Diana and waved a hand over her eyes, but Diana's pupils didn't follow the movement they just stared straight ahead. So Stella examined closer and saw the black lines creeping across Diana's eyes as well. What is happening? Is she poisoned? Stella wondered as she carefully touched Diana's neck to check her pulse. It was weak, and Diana's skin was stone cold. Stella tried to run through what could be wrong. Diana had been relatively quiet ever since a few hours ago. The chance she had been poisoned from the fight earlier was unlikely. She would have spoken up sooner. So what could it be? Hey, Diana. Can you hear me? Stella shook her a little harder, but she had that same emotionless and dead gaze that looked past her at the night sky. Then Diana suddenly began screaming and trashing around. Stella almost jolted from surprise and tried to hold her down. Stop squirming around so much. Tell me what's wrong. Diana ignored her and kept gnashing her teeth and trying to claw at her face. By now, her eyes had turned black, like one big, soulless pupil, and she was snarling like a dog. 
Stella then found herself being overpowered and pushed off. Run! Diana managed to hiss through clenched teeth as she summoned a sword from her spatial ring, run far away. She then slashed at her own legs and fell on her face with a groan. Her sword clattered and slid from her grip along the stone. Her eyes dulled before closing, and she muttered before passing out, Beast cores. Suddenly everything made sense. Diana had pushed herself till key exhaustion during the fight earlier and had succumbed to her heart demons. Stella's heart thumped in her chest, and her hands felt clammy as she looked down at Diana lying on the ground. Was she about to lose another person in her life? Panic set in. Her eyes darted around the central courtyard while trying to derive a way to save Diana. An obvious solution was to feed her a beast core. Stella brought her golden spatial ring up to her mouth and whispered, Please, please, can there be one stashed away in here? It flashed with power, and she mentally scanned the mountain of junk stowed inside, but there were no beast cores or even pills. Just a lot of clothes, bird meat, fruit from ash, and monster parts. Leaving the pocket space, Stella looked back at Diana. The golden ring around Diana's finger glinted in the light of her soul fire. Stella reached forward but paused. Diana was in a similar realm, so it would take too long to break the seal on her ring. But something inside her whispered that it was possible. That the normal rules no longer applied. Ever since taking that pill from Senior Lee, she had felt different superior. She had punched the heavens lightning without breaking a sweat. So what could a spatial ring seal mean to her? Scrambling forward and ignoring the cold stone on her shins, Stella pulled the golden ring free from Diana's limp finger and began to work on breaking the seal done. Hey! Stella stood for a moment in disbelief, blinking at the unsealed ring. Without a moment to waste, her mind entered the space. There was a lot more to sort through. Piles of clothes they had bought from Slimer. Cultivation pills and ingredients and other personal items like swords. But no beast cores. Stella looked at the ingredients and thought about the weird new thing Ashlock had grown that could apparently help with alchemy, but she knew nothing about alchemy. Something to learn in the future for sure, Stella muttered under her breath as she put the ring back on Diana's finger. Now what? Stella looked around the desolate courtyard. She ran between the bloodied shreds of cloth that hadn't been devoured but couldn't locate any spatial rings. She returned to Diana, excuse me for this. Stella said as she searched her pockets. Sure enough, she soon found all of the spatial rings from the cultivators and even one with a star core realm lock. Stella found it odd that Diana had pocketed so many spatial rings and not said anything, but for now, she just focused on breaking their seals and searching through them. Ha! Huh. Stella shouted, finding a single beast core in the third one she searched. Diana had told her that beast cores were expensive and usually bought and consumed on the spot, so there was little reason to carry them around, so she hadn't been optimistic about finding any. Stella placed the beast core in front of Diana's nose. The girl's eyes snapped open, and like a feral dog, she lunged forward and devoured the core. The darkness in her eyes receded slightly, showing the white around her pupil. More. Diana croaked like a person starved of water. Hold on a second. Stella broke seal and seal but couldn't find a single beast core in any of the rings. Twelve rings clattered to the ground, and only the one with the star core seal was left in her hand. But no matter how hard she tried, the seal wouldn't budge. Even with Senior Lee's God-given gift, I can't overcome the difference of realms? Maybe Ash can break it now that he's in the star core realm. Stella dashed over to Ash and looked up at the majestic tree. Her heart tightened slightly. She had clearly annoyed him earlier, as she had never felt his wrath like that before. Bending down, Stella placed the golden ring on the top of an exposed root breaking through the purple grass that encircled the tree. Tree could you unlock this and save Diana? Lilac flames representing Chi far purer than hers flared to life on the root, and Stella watched in wonder as the ring began to float with spatial Chi enveloping it. Minutes passed. Stella could see some progress on breaking the ring seal, but there was no guarantee a beast core would even be inside. Her foot began to tap anxiously, and she felt ill with worry. Her eyes kept darting to Diana, who was looking paler by the second and trying to claw her way around the courtyard dragging her bleeding legs behind her. Her personality was unrecognizable to Stella. She was like some deranged creature rather than a human. How had she been suppressing such violent heart demons all this time? Diana coughed up more blood, and it was black as night. Now even her arms were infected with the spreading darkness. Stella clenched her fist and decided on something that was potentially very stupid. She walked past Diana and across the central courtyard. 
Every step she took strengthened her resolve. Passing through the doorway of the pavilion, she could see the steep path that led to the mountain's base. Freezing nightly wind whipped her hair about as she faltered at the top. Looking down, she could see a sea of green and white. Hundreds of cultivators awaited between the surrounding forest and the mountain. She could even make out the various factions and groups from up here and felt everyone's gaze within seconds. Thousands of meters may separate them, but a soul fire cultivator's sight could travel many miles on this cloudless night. Stella took a step and then another. She slowly descended one step at a time to face the sea of people. Her plan was simple. Chop off a few arms, steal their rings, and head back. Within a step, she could see the cultivators below charging up techniques. You can do this. Stella muttered under her breath as her soul core hummed to life and lightning arced along her legs, you are speed. She dashed forward the world blurred, and the wind roared past her ears. Hundreds of meters were crossed in a second the rocky path exploded behind her as techniques from the cultivators below arrived a second too late. But it didn't take long for them to readjust their aim. Stella looked down and saw a spike of ice heading straight for her. She summoned her blade and went to chop it, but then the space in front of her warped and shattered like glass, stopping the ice in its tracks. Stella traced the source of the chi and saw a black root poking out of the mountain. Is that ash? She wondered as she saw hundreds of roots emerging down the path and at the mountain's base. Between two roots a few hundred meters down the path, Stella saw a portal begin to form, and through the distorted rift, she could see trees with red leaves. I see it's you and me, Ash. Let's do this. A wild grin formed on her face as she cycled her chi and charged right at the portal without worry. It felt like hitting a wall of hot air, making her ears pop as she flew through the portal. Where did she go? A man with white hair asked, his hands engulfed in white flames, as he stood before Stella. His gaze was fixed on a distant mountain path. Was that a portal? Behind you. Stella laughed, her sword crackling with lightning as it sliced through the air with unnatural speed. In one swift motion, she decapitated the man, and his lifeless body toppled to the side. A portal opened beneath him, swallowing the corpse. A portal? How convenient, Stella mused surveying the forest around her. She's over there. Someone shouted, but Stella didn't care. She was running out of time and intended to capture a few people before returning. Dashing through the forest, Stella encountered a young man in the first stage of the Soul Fire Realm who had shouted. Ah! The man yelped, fumbling to raise his sword in defense clearly unprepared for Stella to close the distance in less than a second. Stella found him rather endearing, which made the act of decapitating him a regretful one. The poor lad hadn't even had a chance to use a technique to defend himself, for Stella had activated her earrings, rendering him frozen with fear. You would have made a cute servant boy, she chuckled, pushing the body through a portal that materialized to her left. Hearing more than a dozen voices echoing through the eerie forest, Stella knew it was time to move on. As arrogant as she was, she recognized that facing more than two cultivators alone would be suicidal. She raised her sword and pointed ahead. Ash. Transportation, please. A moment passed, but nothing happened. Tree? Hello? Portal, please. Stella's eyes darted between the thicket of the forest. She could see the pale and sickly light from the cultivator's soul fire in all directions, and she quickly discovered she was encircled. Stella's eyes darted between the thickets of the forest. She could see the pale and sickly light from the cultivator's soul fire in all directions, and she quickly realized she was surrounded. Found her. A feminine voice shouted. Her head snapped in the direction of the voice, and she spotted a woman emerging from behind a tree, displaying her peak soul fire realm cultivation. Stella crestfallen. The woman summoned an exquisite sword that gleamed in the moonlight that snuck through the thick canopy, what are you doing down here all alone? Stella's eyes flickered to a black root that had emerged near the woman's foot, and she couldn't contain her smile. Alone. Stella raised her sword and charged at the woman. The woman was naturally confused and tilted her head while easily meeting Stella's sword with her own. Stella's eyes became swirling abysses as her earrings activated, and she relished in how the woman's calm demeanor cracked. A swirling portal of spatial chi materialized behind the woman, and with a brutal knee to the stomach, Stella shoved the woman through. Who said I was alone? Stella giggled and hurled herself through the portal before it collapsed. She felt the familiar pressure in her ears as she rapidly changed locations and reappeared in the courtyard. There was just one problem the woman had Diana in a headlock and held a dagger to her throat. Miss, I wouldn't do that. 
Stella warned, but it was too late. Diana, in her frenzied state, had already snatched the dagger from the woman's grip and started clawing at her eyes. Chapter 66, Mycelium Network As Ashlock watched Diana rip apart a cultivator a few stages higher than her, he understood why the demonic cultivators were treated as dangerous savages. Just hours ago, Diana had been her usual self a bit cold and serious but still a rational thinking individual. But now, as she tore out the women's thorax and began to eat it, he struggled to see her as the same person. Stella stood off to the side of the fight, trying to find a safe way to step in without getting her own arm torn off. It was clear to anyone watching that Diana's strength was far from ordinary. Is she consuming her life force for a temporary power-up? The signs pointed to no. But how else could this sudden increase in power be explained? After a while, Diana lay on top of the woman's breathless corpse and seemed to have passed out again Stella used this opportunity to acquire the spatial rings from the bodies that had been pushed through the portals. As Stella got to work breaking the seals on the rings to search them for beast cores, black vines snuck through the cracks in the stone courtyard and devoured the unattended corpses. While waiting for them to be devoured, Ashlock focused on the star core sealed ring. Unlike Stella, who had spent only moments breaking each ring seal, he had been at his for a while now he could tell he was close. A barrier seemed to surround the ring, and as he poured more spatial chi into the barrier, it began to crack. Then it shattered, and he found himself inside the ring. Inside were a few beast cores, evergreen family robes, some chi-infused chains, and various other items. Unfortunately, none of the things seemed very useful to a tree, so he let the ring clatter to the ground, drawing Stella's attention. Stella rushed over, Ash, you broke the seal. She picked the ring up, and her eyes went wide, thank you. Without another word, she ran back to Diana while clearly searching through the ring for useful things. Minutes went by, and notifications began to flood Ashlock's tired mind. Plus 21 SC. Plus 53 SC. Plus 47 SC. Such low points. Ashlock muttered within his mind, I need to start hunting higher realm cultivators and beasts if I want to continue this growth rate. Ashlock watched Stella drag the unconscious and barely alive Diana off to the side and tie up her limbs with the chain letting off a hint of chi. She then began to feed her some beast cores she found and other pills. He paid them no mind. Rather his attention was focused on the ravaged corpse of the peak stage soul fire cultivator. It was an objectively gruesome sight, but Ashlock felt nothing except a cold lack of empathy. Have I become a psychopath? What's wrong with me? Ashlock looked the body up and down but still felt nothing except maybe a little hungry. The human part of his mind was revolted, disgusted, and at a loss for words. He had seen many deaths in this world, but this one felt different. Was it the fact that just a single stage separated them, and she had died such gruesome death right before him? She died because she was weak and inferior, Ashlock said without thought but paused. What the hell? When had this change in mindset come about? Had he always completely disregarded all human life except those close to him? He hadn't thought about it much, just went with the flow. Killed those that were a threat and devoured those killed by others. Now that I think about it, I have been turning a blind eye to the fact Larry has been bringing me fresh corpses. Ashlock looked down at the half-dead spider. The poor guy seemed to have calmed down from his earlier berserk state and had nearly finished cocooning himself. Rest well, buddy. You earned it. Looking back at the corpse lying on the stone, Ashlock couldn't hold back his hunger and felt no reason to, so he cast Devour. A while later, the vines retreated into the ground, and he had absorbed the cultivation accumulated by the person over their life. Ashlock didn't know the woman's name, nor did he care. To him, all these humans were just food except for those few he cared about. Plus 101 SC. Tisk, you spent your whole life cultivating only to be eaten by a tree and provide a measly hundred points. He was angry. What if this person had been Stella? Or even Diana? Would the person who slaughtered them, ripped out their throat, and tore off their limbs even give their cold corpse a second thought? It was sad, really. It wasn't just him that put such little importance on the life of others. Everyone else in this crazy dark world saw each other as an obstacle in their path to immortality. Ashlock wondered what it would be like back on Earth if people could spend money for immortality. Would this same cutthroat culture be born where people would rather fight and kill for the most minor grievances just for a few extra bucks so they could extend their life? They say the one thing you can never buy is time, but that is the reality here not only do they need to cultivate to extend their lifespan, 
but they also cultivate to stop their life being abruptly ended through their own strength. Ashlock looked at the cold stone where the corpse had been. Only some tattered blood-stained cloth remained to remind him of his meal. She might have had connections, allies, and a powerful family and even terrorized and exploited the mortals for her ascension. But none of that mattered when she faced a foe only a little stronger. Her life was extinguished in the most brutal way possible within minutes. An important lesson. Ashlock had felt for a brief moment what losing Stella was like. The pain, sorrow, and rage. He needed to devise a way to protect, shelter, and nurture her, so nothing could kill her. Not even the heavens. To hell with his chi reserves. After using his eye of the tree god skill to confirm the cultivators were still not attacking even after his guerrilla warfare with portals, Ashlock opened his mushroom production menu and got to work. He selected not only a few more truffles with various effects such as Deo comprehension through hallucinations, one that helped consume heart demons, and another that, improved skin quality. I bet that one will be popular. Ashlock chuckled as he switched off the truffles. They took the longest to grow and had the most impactful effects, but he could grow faster, smaller, and still interesting ones, such as the glowing mushrooms he had decorated the central courtyard with. Time to actually use some of this space. Ashlock's spiritual sight now covered the entire pavilion as his canopy shrouded the mountain peak. Training courtyard is fine how it is, although that wall really needs to be fixed. The fish pond is, well, they are dead. It was unsurprising but still sad. Either the fish had starved to death, or a bird had eaten them while he had been asleep. Overall that courtyard would have a better use later, so he had the garden or the runic formation left to use. The garden was an absolute mess. With the reduction of sunlight due to his canopy and the absence of gardeners for years, it had overgrown into a nightmare of weeds straight out of an apocalypse movie. Unfortunately, few precious spiritual herbs had survived the years of neglect. The soil seems perfect, and the environment was already organized and set up to house plants. Ashlock thought of asking Stella, as this was technically her home, but she seemed busy for now, and he was the patriarch of the sect. Ashlock chuckled, I think it's safe to say I own this mountain and pavilion now and maybe even this entire area once I spread out my roots some more. Creating a load of random mushrooms that granted random small boosts to cultivation and selecting the garden as the location to grow them, Ashlock felt his star core happily provide the required chi. In real time, he watched the courtyard of weeds evolve into a mushroom paradise. Now, to check on my disciples. Ashlock switched his view to the central courtyard. Diana looked better. Which wasn't saying much considering the state she was in before. Her skin was still covered in black veins, and her eyes were dyed black, but she seemed saner and wasn't trying to bite Stella's face off. However, even Ashlock, with his limited knowledge of this world, could tell feeding her beast cores was a temporary solution to a bigger problem. Diana had gone cold turkey and managed for a while, but after being pushed too far in the recent battle, it seems she succumbed to her heart demons, which seemed like a fancy way of saying she relapsed as a drug addict. Maybe the truffles he was growing could help but they still needed a week to grow, so for now, Diana would need to either recover on her own or remain chained up until the truffles were fully matured. A while passed, and Diana seemed to have passed out again Stella was keeping tabs on her, so Ashlock felt now was a good time for an experiment he had been waiting for. When he upgraded his chi fruit production to B grade a while ago for 900 credits, the only significant change had been the ability to put a demonic tree seed in his fruit. Why had it cost so much for such a seemingly minor feature? That question had plagued his mind ever since. So he spread his seeds far and wide, using birds in hopes of discovering the answer. But his babies had been so far out of reach, growing up in the forest surrounding the mountain. So he had no opportunity to meet them and see if they had any particular connection. But that had changed. Using Eye of the Tree God, Ashlock soared past the groups of restless cultivators from the Winter Wrath and Evergreen families that were busy shouting at each other and focused on the nearest baby demonic tree. Although calling it a baby was hard, considering it towered at over 20 meters. It had been one of the first he had planted and had already grown so strong. His root slowly approached underground, not out of choice since the root was so far from his star core, the growth began to slow down. That's something Ashlock had also taken note of. His power was concentrated around and within his trunk rather than throughout his entire body, such as his roots and branches, which functioned more as an extension of himself. After what felt like ages, his root broke through the last bit of rock and hit the soil for the first time. It felt warm and damp, like a nice blanket, rather than cold and coarse like the mountain's stone. 
Why had he awoken thousands of meters in the sky on a mountain peak? Why couldn't he have been born among his fellow trees in this lovely, warm soil? The more he relished in the warmth of the soil, the more slothful he felt. No wonder trees sleep a lot. I would have never bothered to wake up to even sign in if I had been born here. Maybe being born on a desolate mountain peak was a blessing in disguise then. Warning, Mycelium Network Invasion. Mycelium Network? Like fungus. Ashlock switched his view from his god eye and looked through the root burrowing through the soil. Of course, shifting perspective like this would make any normal human immediately vomit on the spot, but as a magical tree, swapping his point of view from being high in the sky to below the earth instantly wasn't an issue. As the system message had suggested, mycelium was wrapping around his root and trying to penetrate his root cell wall, but to little effect. Naturally, his root that could penetrate mountain rock wouldn't lose to some fungi. However, Ashlock decided to allow the invasion, as he knew trees weren't as solitary as everyone believed. They actually communicated and shared resources, not through their roots, but via mycelium. The system deemed it an invasion, but Ashlock saw it as an integration into the forest network. A way to connect with his fellow trees and maybe even his children. Lowering his defenses and deliberately opening his roots up like one would open their pores, he allowed the mycelium in. A wave of fear assaulted him. Although not in the emotional sense, he was still rational. But his entire body seized up as if he were about to die. The equivalent of tree adrenaline flooded his system, and he suddenly felt fully awake, as if it was midday rather than midnight. It was time to fight. His body had gone into a weird state as if there was an impending doom which there kind of was with the cultivators still at the mountain's base. The forest was terrified, which in turn, made him too. Without thinking, he took control of the situation and flooded the mycelium network with his overwhelming presence. The fear subsided, and his body managed to calm down. His root continued delving deeper into the forest, under the clueless noses of the cultivators loitering about overhead. As more mycelium was welcomed into his roots, Ashlock noticed something. The more chi he injected into the network to calm the poor trees, the more sugars, proteins, and water he received. He had been using chi to replace these necessary things a tree needed to grow throughout his life, as there was none in the mountain rock. With this abundance of new resources, his root began to speed up its growth rate as these useful substances were injected. For some reason, I feel like a real tree now. Ashlock laughed as he tunneled further. He passed the roots of some normal green-leaved trees. He didn't feel anything special from them or much chi. A few seemed in the low stages of the chi realm and clearly hadn't developed a conscious. So what was flooding the mycelium network with fear? Was it these trees doing it naturally, or was it something else? And then Ashlock's root passed the roots of his child, the very first demonic tree he had planted relief mixed with a hint of curiosity washed through the mycelium and into his root. Ashlock could tell instantly that the baby demonic tree had cultivated far enough to have developed consciousness, and it seemed to recognize him as its father. Chapter 67, Tree Warfare Ashlock felt a sense of kinship with the young tree a sort of connection that was unmistakable. Through the mycelium network, he could perceive the tree's emotions. It radiated a sense of happiness not the exuberant joy of a puppy greeting its owner after a long day but rather the contentment that comes from relief, akin to being rescued after drifting in the ocean or finally receiving that coveted promotion at work. The young tree felt happy and relieved. It knew all would be well, and it was safe. Ashlock was no mind reader, these emotions were from the tree through the mycelium network. They weren't coherent words, but Ashlock could understand his child just fine. The young tree found the cultivators terrifying and had made the soil around it as acidic as possible to scare them off. It had even gone so far as to increase the production of its poisonous berries to show off its might. Ashlock had never been more grateful for his sign-in system than now. If all he could do to combat threats were make the soil around him a bit more damp and unpleasant to smell, he would have gone insane. Hey, kiddo. Ashlock spoke out in the hope it could understand. With their roots interlinked via mycelium, he had a longing that his shouting into the void of his trunk would result in something. A wave of excitement came from the tree. So you can understand me. Ashlock was over the moon. It might not be intelligent and able to form cohesive words, but it could hear and react to him. Do these cultivators frighten you? Excitement pulsed again was the tree simply thrilled because he was speaking to it. Kiddo. Ashlock didn't know what gender his child was. Did trees even have genders? He was distinctly male, but back on Earth, numerous trees were hermaphroditic, possessing both male and female reproductive organs. However, 
in this magical world where trees could develop souls, the rules might be different. Putting gender aside, Ashlock needed to pose a simple yes or no question to determine whether the tree could grasp the meaning behind his words. Feel fear if you understand the intent of my words. Yet the tree remained excited and happy, displaying no trace of apprehension. So you can't actually understand my words. Darn. I hoped my language skill would be enough. Ashlock felt sour about it, but there was still hope for him to converse with his offspring eventually. He had dealt with enough communication challenges so far. What were a few more? He could already devise a few solutions. Rolling the system for an upgrade in his language skill seemed the easiest, but also the option he had the least control over. He could also wait for the tree to develop a super high cultivation realm in a nascent soul. Senior Lee claimed he had never met a talking tree before, but that didn't mean it was impossible. A more grounded and possible solution was learning to speak like a tree. How did that differ from what he was doing right now? Hey, kiddo. Can you teach me to speak like you? More emotions. It wasn't speaking at all. Instead, it was like conversing with facial expressions. Ashlock thought back to how he felt when he was overwhelmed with fear. His body had been flushed with adrenaline. Could he replicate that and pass it on to his offspring? Wait. In a way, he had already talked to his kid. When he flooded the mycelium network with his presence, it responded with happiness without him even talking. Other than overwhelming the network with his presence, Ashlock tried to feel an emotion like joy and send it through forcefully, but his dulled emotions were getting in the way. Is this my fate? Do I have to wait for it to develop its soul enough? Ashlock tried to send more chi over the network, but the mycelium was fickle at best and became damaged if he tried to shove too much through. Ashlock knew he absorbed chi through his roots and leaves, so he sent his root to coil around the young tree's roots. It only got happier the more he interacted, and it got excited when he flooded its roots with chi. It doesn't seem to be getting hurt by my chi, even though it doesn't have a spatial affinity soul core yet. Is this because we are related? Ashlock had noticed that the families that inhabited this sect all seemed to have the same affinities. For example, House Winterrath all used ice chi. Were affinities passed down from parent to child? Whatever the reason, Ashlock finished coiling around his kid's roots and then proceeded to have his root break out of the soil and curl around his kid's trunk like a snake. He wanted to cover as much surface area as possible to transfer more chi. A part of Ashlock had wondered if he could take over or mind control his offspring as if they were a mere extension of himself. But within just a few minutes of interaction, he had confirmed without a doubt that these trees, although related to him, were independent entities. They had their own emotions and life. But it wasn't all for naught. Ashlock could exchange excess chi with his kid and, in exchange, receive an early warning system. For example, if he linked up with all of his offspring for thousands of miles, he would be alerted by their fear that a threat was coming. Also, if he raised an entire forest of demonic trees, all with some level of cultivation, he would have more allies to depend on during the upcoming beast tide. He could also use them as relays for his root growth into the big wide world. Suddenly, Ashlock felt the tree flood him with fear again, and he could immediately tell the cause. A cultivator from the Winter Wrath family had decided to lean against the young tree's trunk. He was a short man with slick white hair tied back into a bun. A sword hung loosely at his waist, tied by a rope. What a disaster! The man sighed as he leaned back on the trunk and closed his eyes. Ashlock wasn't sure how to handle this, but he felt angry. To his surprise, it seemed his kid also felt his anger as the young tree's fear lessened and was replaced with smugness as if it expected Ashlock to protect it. He could create a portal via his roots and try to kill the man with devour, but he might also damage or destroy his offspring when the portal collapses. The same result would occur if he tried to use the explosion from the collapsing portal to kill the man. His control over his spatial chi was amateur at best, especially at such a far range. It worked fine when he didn't care about collateral damage, but he needed to be careful in this case. Wait, why am I instantly thinking of murder? The man wasn't exactly doing anything particularly threatening, just resting against a seemingly random tree in a forest. Was that an insult worthy of execution? But he is here with the rest of his family to take over Red Vine Peak. And I doubt he would be as magnanimous if he found Stella or Diana half dead somewhere. Ashlock thought as he glanced around and saw other people resting near random trees and meditating. This was war. Ever since the Evergreen family sent a Star Core cultivator to siphon a part of his soul and nearly kill Larry, all chances of peaceful negotiations with these two families were off. Not to mention, 
the man's presence was scaring the shit out of his offspring, and what kind of father would he be to let his kid shake in fear and not do anything? Sending another root to tunnel through the earth and poke out of the ground a few trees away, he opened a portal in the central courtyard back on Red Vine Peak under the sword that had belonged to the female cultivator that Diana had mauled to death. The sword fell through the portal, and Ashlock chose its anchor point to be above the root in the tree's canopy a few feet away from the man. His eyes snapped open as a sword fell to the ground from seemingly thin air. Hey? A sword. The man pushed himself off the tree and walked a few steps forward. He then bent down to pick it up the blade a rift opened behind him, and Ashlock cast Devour. Within a second, the portal popping closed was masked by a short scream, and the forest returned to its eerie silence other than the shouting in the distance. Plus 22 SC. The man had been relatively weak. Ashlock's chi-enhanced vines had been enough to impale the poor man, and within a minute, the vines had retreated into the stone below another corpse, another murder. He felt it was time to get serious. Larry was half dead and surrounded by silk. Maple was missing, and Stella was busy keeping tabs on Diana. The war had already begun, and Ashlock now had the power to be a prominent force. Taking to the skies with his eye of the tree god, he peered through the darkness of the night without issue. The calm night wind and lack of sunlight made him feel somewhat sluggish, but the situation's seriousness kept him in check. He could feel his roots below the cultivator's feet from high above, like toes in the sand. Everyone gathered here should be below my realm, with most in the lower stages of the soul fire realm. My empowered roots are enough to impale and kill them like the man from earlier, but that comes with the added risk that they might attack through the open portal. Ashlock also knew his portals were unstable when attacked. Having his vines cut wasn't an issue, but the chi wasted on the portal's creation was. His star core had an advantage over his old soul core, it could produce chi without needing meditation, but he could still drain it dry if he overused it. I want to cause the most havoc possible while still keeping enough chi in reserve to fight one of the Grand Elders if they show up. So far, Ashlock had targeted people that were alone, and through his efforts, he had assisted in killing around 20 cultivators so far. But there were hundreds still loitering around at the base of the mountain. Portals are great and all, but they are more suited for transportation than killing. How could I kill as many cultivators as possible with spatial chi? Ashlock didn't care about their corpses. He could fetch them later or let them rot. Honestly, for how little sacrificial credits those in the Soul Fire Realm provided, it felt almost a waste of chi to gather and consume the corpses. Ashlock identified a group of cultivators that were a mix of evergreen and winter wrath off to the side of the main groups. They had an arrogant air about them, and their cultivation realms were on the upper end of the soul fire realm. These must be the arrogant young masters, a perfect test group, Ashlock concluded they would be less likely to back down and run due to their overinflated pride, making them great target dummies. The tips of a few roots poked through the ground like surfacing earthworms drawing the cultivator's attention. Stella Crestfallen is attacking again. An evergreen man calmly stated as his eyes darted between them. Green flames instantly sprung to life, and a great sword bigger than him materialized in his hand. Ashlock still found it rather funny that they thought this was all Stella's handiwork, but he wouldn't complain. As expected. Another cultivator sneered, that Brad can only run and hide like a green-furred fox. If only they knew they were being bested by a magical tree that couldn't even move. Also, what the hell was a green-furred fox? With a chuckle, Ashlock checked on his chi reserves. By his estimates, they had depleted around 30% so far from his 20 kills, which would take about half a day to recuperate. His foes were on edge. He could see people rushing toward the isolated group and would arrive soon. I should test if exploding a portal right next to them would do anything first. Even if it was inefficient, as portals required a lot of chi to make an anchor and connection between the two openings, he already knew how to make them, so it wouldn't be too hard to conjure them up within seconds. And he did precisely that. A portal materialized right next to the one with the great sword, but before Ashlock could even collapse it, the man swung his great sword shrouded in green flames with impressive speed and cut it in two. There was no explosion, and the spatial chi dissipated harmlessly into the wind. Ashlock tried again, this time making the portal a little further away. The man couldn't cut it in time, and it exploded as planned. But even with the absurd amount of chi he shoved into creating it, the explosion was too far from them to do anything other than rustle their hair and wipe out the soul fire coating their skin briefly. Then something happened that Ashlock hadn't expected but he really should have seen coming. Land of Eternal Ice. The same technique Mike had used when he fought Diana a while back. It flash froze the ground, 
and even with his first stage star core chi coating his root, it could not protect it from the chill. So frost is indeed a natural counter to me then, Ashlock grumbled the feeling of having his roots frozen stung. Surging some chi into the roots broke them free from the ice, but it was too late. The great sword wielding cultivator had decapitated his poor roots before he could pull them back. So long range assault just by myself is going to take more work than I thought. Ashlock didn't want to admit it, but his allies had done most of the work in the previous fights, with him offering support and corpse disposal. His slothful mind tried to devise a spatial attack that could kill these fools. Was there one in that technique manual that Stella had been showing him? Telekinesis? Was there something he could do with that? Ashen Prince Larry has begun to evolve. Please select Larry Evolution Path. A sudden string of notifications interrupted Ashlock's trail of thought. It was about Larry's evolution to an A-grade summon. Something that could prove desperately helpful in the coming days. Hey! Ashlock read the notification but was confused. There's only one option this time. Ashen King. His Eminence, Prince Larry, has been deemed worthy by the Nine Realms of Ascension to a Calamity-class monster and will be granted the power to rule over all Ashen Spiders across the realms. Henceforth, his ancient bloodline will awaken, and he will be known as the Ashen King. Well, that sounds rather ominous. Ashlock chuckled, but he was looking forward to seeing Larry's evolution as there would be a lot of snacks awaiting his hungry pet at the mountain's base. Chapter 68, Rebirth of the Ashen King Eleanor Evergreen felt her peak stage soul core hum in her chest as she raced up the side of the mountain. The sea of twinkling stars gave a magnificent backdrop to the white palace constructed in place of the old Ravenborn pavilion on this pleasant cloudless night. A cool breeze blew by but did little to calm the girl. Instead, thoughts raced through her mind about what she had witnessed at the base of Red Vine Peak. This was a genuine disaster. She should have accelerated her plans and come to visit by herself as Stella Crestfallen one of the few cultivators of noble birth that were also free to be used as a pill furnace, was now a realm higher than her. An untouchable existence, except to the Grand Elders. Eleanor clenched her fist as green flames roared around her and helped empower her speed. Unfortunately, evergreen cultivators weren't known for their movement techniques, so she could only empower her legs with chi and press on. The palace seemed so far had the mountain always been this tall? She had spent the last half an hour rampaging up the mountain but still had a ways to go. Her head tilted to the right, and she looked at Red Vine Peak in the distance. Only now as she squinted and empowered her eyes with chi did she notice the massive tree lording over the pavilion. It looked like a red roof from afar, but it was undoubtedly a tree upon closer scrutiny. Since when did trees even grow that big around here? Eleanor wondered. She had left the sect several times on various missions out into the wilderness on behalf of her family and she had never seen such an impressively massive tree. That has to be a spirit tree of some kind. Eleanor muttered aloud as the wind roared past her ears, but why? Was it a guardian spirit left behind by the crestfallen family? The more Eleanor investigated and discovered about Red Vine Peak today, the more her head hurt. Nothing made sense. How many more secrets and allies can you hide? Eleanor sneered and continued up the peak. She still had no idea why those lazy elders hadn't made a move yet as their juniors died from Tristan and Stella's joint efforts, but she would change that. I bet they went into secluded cultivation, and nobody dared to wake them. Eleanor stopped muttering to herself as her long journey up the mountain path finally drew to a close. The White Palace, built to house the relocated Evergreen and Winterrath families bound together by marriage between the two heirs, dominated the skyline. It was magnificent and a testament to the family's combined majesty. So what if the beast tide was coming? and this would all be abandoned and destroyed in due time. Were they supposed to live in wooden huts like peasant mortals? Would any other noble families of the Blood Lotus sect or Dark Light City take them seriously if they didn't flaunt their wealth? Eleanor shook her head as she passed through the open gateway and into the courtyard, surrounded by smooth white walls and windows. She knew it was all a facade a way to trick the blind into believing in the prosperity of their family. The dark truth was even with their combined strength, their victory over the Ravenborn family hadn't come without a high cost. Thousands of cultivators from both families had perished in the war, and many more died when their old locations were raided faster than expected. As they were now, the family's combined strength hardly matched that of a lower-tier family. It was why all the cultivators surrounding Red Vine Peak were so weak the strong had already perished in the war, and it was taking too long to raise new talent. Eleanor knew things were looking grim. With the beast tide on the way and the great move on the horizon, how would the Evergreen family compete with the other families for land at the new sect location? 
she refused to be a part of a lower tier family for another cycle. It was too embarrassing, humiliating even. The way the other families sneered at them in tournaments and bickered and laughed behind folding fans. Before Eleanor even realized it, she was stomping through the silent hallways of the stone palace. Her walking slowed as she looked around. There was no one. Not a soul in these expansive halls. Where did everyone go? Eleanor cursed while looking left and right as she passed empty dark rooms. It was like the place had been abandoned, but she had been here only hours ago, and it had been bustling with activity. A sudden scream made Eleanor jolt. It echoed down the hallway and was accompanied by heavy footsteps. She dipped into a nearby empty room and felt something sticky on her shoe. Despite the screams, she looked down and saw a puddle of blood and the tip of a finger in the dim moonlight sneaking through the window. Her heart tightened in her chest, and she struggled to control her breathing to stay hidden. It was hard to focus on the bloody finger when the screaming and footsteps quickly approached where she was hiding. M. Monster. A man likely the one running shouted, and Eleanor felt the whole palace shake and saw ripples on the puddle of blood she was inspecting. Eleanor got closer, allowing her sickly green flame to illuminate the scene. She almost jumped back like a terrified cat at the sight of a woman with empty eye sockets, dried blood cascading down her cheeks, and drenching messy black hair. Maria. Eleanor stammered as she reached out a hand and felt the corpse's cold cheek. W what happened to you? Who did this, what? It was one of Eleanor's sisters one of the few she loved and respected in this accursed family. The palace shook again, and Eleanor had to rip her eyes away from her sister and look over her shoulder as a screaming man ran past. Grand Elder Winter Wrath Eleanor blinked in confusion. The man running for his life was the star core Grand Elder everyone had been waiting for. Was he fighting the person responsible for the death of her sister? The man didn't even acknowledge her presence. Instead, he paused outside her doorway and focused on something down the corridor. Eleanor noticed his eyes were scarily wide open, blood brimming at the sides. He raised his hands with white flames roaring to life at his fingertips, bastion of the last winter. He cried, and a wall of mystical ice manifested before him. Like the evergreen family the Winter Wraths excelled in point defense and standing their ground against a foe rather than movement techniques like the Crest Fallence or raw damage output like the Red Claws. So both the Grand Elder and Eleanor were shocked to their core as a four-fingered paw, the height of the hallway ending in claws of pure darkness, barreled through the ice wall like it was glass and grasped the Grand Elder like an ant. Eleanor stumbled back, ignoring the blood of her dead sister that sullied her shoes. The scene was too mind-warping. She didn't even want to know what kind of creature was residing within these walls with her that could possess such a paw. You devilish creature. Spawn of the lower realm. The Grand Elder hollered as the hand encircled him. Take this, you vile blood spewed from the white-haired old man's mouth like a fountain, and his head rolled to the side. Dead. His white flames died down, but Eleanor could feel the beginnings of a supernova. Once started, it was a process that was hard to stop. Chi, from the surroundings poured toward the elderly corpse without restriction, and Eleanor could see his skin begin to melt. She looked around the dark room now that she breathed in the air, the scent of death was unmistakable. In the darkness, there were likely many other corpses in here. Why and how? Did that creature do all this? The paw of pure shadows released the melting man letting the sack of molten skin flop to the stone and begin to melt the tiles. Then there was a crackle of ancient power, one Eleanor couldn't even begin to fathom, and the burning white corpse was gone. Just a molten hole in the stone remained. Eleanor held her breath, her flames extinguished, and sat in the cold, dark room. The scent of death and blood tickled her nose, but she didn't dare breathe in fear of that monster finding her whatever it was, she had no chance of defeating something that could kill a star core grand elder in such a way. A while passed, and she spluttered for breath. Her lungs burned, and her eyes watered as she breathed in deeply. There hadn't been a movement or any sign of the monster. Had it left? Surely not. Eleanor found it hard to believe a powerful creature wouldn't have the sensory capabilities to match, considering that nobody remained alive in this stone prison. Had it just, let her live? Why? She stood up, brushed herself off, and tried to not even give a glance at her sister's corpse on the way out. Her curiosity may be the death of her, but she needed to know to see what had transpired here. With cautious steps, she approached the doorframe and peeked around. Nothing. Just an empty hallway with an icy chill a likely left over from the Grand Elder's failed defensive spell. She wanted to run escape from here and never look back. But she knew that cowardice would make convincing the Patriarch for help a tall order. 
her head raced with solutions to her predicament. Her family had already been on the back foot, and now it was wiped out. The Winter Wrath Grand Elder half of the family's star core fighting power is gone. She had to confirm one thing. Was the Evergreen Grand Elder dead as well? If so, it was all over. The family had no chance to recover, with Tristan switching sides and both Grand Elders dead. Hardening her resolve, she ventured down the hallway, searching for the Evergreen Grand Elder's body. If the man had perished, her life was over anyway. The Blood Lotus sect didn't need a noble family outcast in the new land. She would become a pill furnace for the Patriarch the same fate she had decided for Stella Crest fallen only months ago. It made her feel sick to her stomach and made her legs shake. Did the world hate her? Why was it so cruel? Her steps felt heavy as she walked the length of the cold corridor and turned right into the main hall. There as she had expected, in the pit of her stomach was the evergreen Grand Elder. His head was torn from his broad shoulders, and his muscular arms were twisted and broken as if they had been made from twigs. He was dead. Eleanor followed the trail of blood and looked up from the corpse to a balcony at the far end of the hall. To her surprise, she saw a fluffy white squirrel perched on the banister. With nothing but despair gnawing at her mind and the harrowing sight of those she had loved and depended on now cold corpses at her feet. Yet, the appearance of such an adorable squirrel was so intriguing and soul-warming. She walked forward, enthralled by its golden eyes that seemed to wink at her. As she pushed open the doors made from crystal-clear ice, she looked away momentarily, and the squirrel was gone. As if it had been a figment of her imagination all along. What a weird but cute-looking squirrel. Eleanor leaned on the banister with a sour heart and looked out into the distance at Red Vine Peak, surrounded by twinkling stars and bathed in moonlight. It looks so beautiful and peaceful with its scarlet-leaved tree lording over the white-walled pavilion overrun with red vines. She wanted to scream as her hands tightened around the banister. If only she had moved faster with her plans. She could be on that mountain peak right now, under the shade of that magnificent tree, and working with Tristan Evergreen. She should be the one embraced by the power of the Star Core Realm. Not Stella. Why did that bitch seem to receive all the blessings under the Nine Realms? But then her heart seemingly froze in her chest as tremendous pressure overcame her, as if something was coming. Was that devilish creature back? A cold sweat and a shiver ran down her spine. Was it finally time for her to die? Then the heavens opened above Red Vine Peak a crack so vast as if a god was pulling the sky apart to gaze upon its subjects formed. Then through the gap, a dense cloud of grey poured down like sand. Or at least it acted like sand, but as Eleanor empowered her eyes, she confirmed it was ash. It descended and enveloped the entire Red Vine Peak like a floating blanket. Golden lightning flashed throughout the ash cloud. Focused around the epicenter the mountain's peak. The weirdest part of it all was how the scarlet leaf tree peeked through the ash cloud without a problem, and Eleanor could see two dots that were likely people standing on its branches, looking down at the swarming ash below. A while passed, and Eleanor was enchanted by the once-in-a-lifetime event displaying heaven's power. However, she had to wonder what cataclysmic event could have triggered it. But her stupor was vanquished by an earth-shattering roar from an awakened beast. One reborn from the ashes, and even from so far away, Eleanor could tell it may be on par with the patriarch from its sheer presence. She turned on her heel and ran through the hallway without hesitation. If she could be the first to inform the patriarch to run for the hills, her fate as a pill furnace may not be sealed. The Blood Lotus sect was doomed in her eyes, and it was time to leave. Chapter 69, Spokesperson Larry With a bestial roar that made Ashlock's star core quiver the great storm of ash ceased, and Ashlock opened his demonic eye to gaze upon his pet curiously. What had become of his beloved spider? His Highness of the Nine Realms, Ashen King Larry, has completed his ascension. Evolution of Larry complete. The crack in the realm overhead closed, and calm returned. With the ash storm gone, Ashlock could gaze upon Larry without obstruction. The spider had decreased in size by about a third, but he now had a crown of black horns on his head with a permanent halo of ash swirling around their points. His fur had transformed into strands of ash that shimmered in the moonlight. Meanwhile, his scarlet eyes held a new depth of intelligence, and his ivory fangs looked sharp enough to pierce a god. He looked like a creature from some legend or myth that defied the laws of what seemed possible. The way his fur of ash shifted around as if it were alive was fascinating to watch, especially in his demonic eyesight. Unfortunately, the ash acted as an impenetrable veil, blocking Ashlock's demonic eye from looking at Larry's soul core. Making it impossible for him to know Larry's true realm of power, but if he had to guess, Larry was stronger than him. 
the spider slowly approached Ashlock with measured and careful steps. Still, as silent as ever. Ashlock felt Stella hiding on his branch shrink back as the spider approached. Which also made him nervous. The tether of black chi that linked him to Larry was still there, and the system hadn't notified him that he had lost control over Larry. So it should be fine, right? Larry paused close to his trunk and then dipped his head, the Ashen King pledges his loyalty to the Great Spirit Tree. The words were gruff, and even Ashlock found them hard to decipher, like a potent accent despite his perfect hearing and language of the world skill. Everything seemed to pause for Ashlock as he tried to process what had happened. Did Larry just, speak? Real words? Stella also seemed stunned as she looked at Diana, who was chained to his trunk, and then back at the spider. Diana had regained some of her rational back, but she was still resisting the chains like a crazy person and thrashing around. Did you understand what it said? Diana hissed through clenched teeth, that demon can speak. Barely. Stella said without looking back at the crazy girl, I believe that was the ancient language I learned recently, but its pronunciation was way off. Larry glanced up at them and flared his eyes, making them both shriek and almost fall out of the tree. You may be the mistresses of the great tree, but insulting my speech is rather uncouth of you ladies. Okay, what the fuck is happening? Ashlock awakened from his stupor, and his demonic eye that didn't seem to phase Larry looked directly at him. It felt weird, but it was clear that the spider was expecting a response. Ashlock directed his attention to the linking black tether. What should he say? Was there a proper way to go about accepting a summon's allegiance? Ashlock mulled over the issue momentarily before deciding to say something overly pompous to sound dignified. The Great Spirit Tree accepts your allegiance and loyalty, Ashen King of the Nine Realms. Thank you, my lord. Larry bowed again, or at least as best a spider could with its oddly shaped body. What are my lord's orders for this humble servant? Larry's vocal cords clearly didn't match the speech he was using. Had the spider inherited his language as part of the summoning skill? Ashlock naturally wanted his pet to deal with the cultivators as soon as possible, but the fact that Larry could speak was a more pressing matter. Larry there is no need to refer to me as such. Calling me lord all the time will become tiresome. As you wish, master. Ashlock felt a headache coming. Why was the spider so uptight? He was clearly stronger than him, was the summoning contract that powerful that it instilled a forced sense of loyalty? Whatever. Tell me, Larry. Why do you speak in the ancient tongue? The spider paused momentarily before answering, it came with the divine knowledge bestowed upon me during the ascension. Ashen spiders have no spoken language, so I was granted knowledge of the ancient tongue. Does my improper speech displease master like the mistresses? I can atone for my sins by tearing off my limbs one by one until master is satisfied. Stop! Ashlock shouted, and Larry clamped his mouth shut. Hearing the spider talk like a distinguished gentleman with such a strong, almost thick Scottish accent was disorienting. Larry, you are a valued ally of mine. I was simply curious as to the origins of your speech. It's not your fault that a spider's vocal cords aren't designed for such complex words. Larry looked down at the floor, and Ashlock had never seen a sad-looking spider before, but he could tell the big guy was upset. Ashlock sighed before asking another thing that had been bugging him. Why do you say the girls are my mistresses? I can feel that Master cares deeply about these mortals, so they are women in a position of power relating to the Great Spirit Tree and, in turn, are above me as Master does not care for me as deeply. The spider straightened his long legs, looked up at Stella, and then at the chained Diana, also, I can smell a hint of something ancient about them. Ashlock ignored the statement about him not valuing the spider as that sounded like an emotional bombshell and asked, Ancient? He could understand Stella after she had taken that pill from Senior Lee as it might have changed her in such a way that she could punch lightning, but Diana too? What's ancient about them? Master, this servant must disappoint, but my realm is not yet high enough to discern such a thing. Stella peered through the scarlet canopy and asked, Hey, Spider are you talking to Tree? Mistress Stella, I am indeed conversing with Master Tree. Stella dropped down and stood at a tentative distance from Larry. She summoned a bundle of papers with the runic language scribbled on them and frowned as she feverously rummaged through them. Bloody annoying accent and dead ancient language. She then seemed to have a great idea, Hey, Spider, can you write? Larry looked at his two forelimbs and then back at Stella, What is writing? Stella blinked with confusion for a second before a sigh escaped her mouth, and her shoulders sagged. Then, in a last-ditch effort, 
she held up one of the papers covered in scribbles, Spider, can you read this? She pointed at it as if it were an eyesight test. My name is not Spider. I am the Ashen King of the Nine Realms. His Highness Larry. The spider straightened his back and seemed smug. He then glared at Stella, and she shrank back under his powerful gaze. Sure. Highness Larry, can you read this or not? Larry crawled a little closer, and his many red eyes looked the paper up and down, and a low hum resounded from his maw as if he was deeply contemplating the text. Well, can you? Stella pressured the spider after a while had passed, and Larry's many eyes left the paper and glared at her. Mistress, your ability to draw is simply horrendous. I cannot discern the nature of this art piece. Is it supposed to depict a great war between the cultivators and the gods? It took a while for Stella to mentally process and translate what Larry said, but once she did, she looked the paper up and down and then looked between it and Larry a few times in disbelief. What part of this looks like a drawing? Larry nodded, exactly. It's a terrible drawing. That's because. Stella gripped the bridge of her nose, it's not a drawing. It's writing. They are different. Looks the same to me. Have you ever even seen a drawing? The spider tilted its head, no. Stella deposited the papers back into her ring and threw her hands up, I give up. Can you ask Ash what he wants me to do with Diana, at least? Ash Locke hadn't wanted to confuse the spider, so he had remained quiet, and the fact there was something ancient about Diana and Stella was bugging him. However, something fantastic came out of all of this. He now had a dedicated spokesperson. Unfortunately, it was also a shed-sized spider with an ominous-looking crown of ash and the power to topple this entire sect. But beggars can't be choosers. Larry. Tell Stella to keep Diana chained and under control for now. I am growing some mushrooms that may help alleviate her symptoms. Larry repeated his words in his gruff accent in a language that Stella was barely proficient in. If Ashlock had to guess, Stella had been guessing based on context clues what Larry was saying and piecing it together from the few words she recognized. But now that she had asked him for direct instructions, she wanted to understand every word. After a while and a lot of note-checking alongside Larry having to repeat his words until the spider was clearly annoyed, Stella finally translated the words correctly. Mushrooms? Are they really so miraculous to cure Diana of such madness? Stella said to Larry and then looked up through the canopy at Diana, who was still thrashing against her chains and shouting random nonsense mixed with coherent sentences. Why are you asking me? Larry grumbled, looking at the floor, I know nothing about mushrooms. Fair point. Stella said back and looked toward the tree trunk, Ash? Are these mushrooms really so powerful? We could make a lot of money from them if so. Ashlock didn't even need to bother with Larry on this occasion and just flashed his leaf with lilac chi to signify yes. He was already planning on selling his mushrooms, fruit, and later alchemy products once someone under his sect learned alchemy. A rumbling from Larry's stomach made Ashlock refocus on the cultivators at the mountain's base. It appeared they were gathering and about to launch an offensive. Did they think the ash storm was an attack from the heavens and he would be weakened? Or maybe they thought someone had ascended and would be consolidating their new cultivation base. Whatever the reason, Ashlock didn't care. The rage of seeing Stella stepped on by that evergreen cultivator and the other one threatening Diana with a blade to the neck had already cemented his stance on them. They were foes that couldn't see exist with him and needed to be eradicated. He hadn't become a cold-blooded mass murderer. This was simply in retaliation. They attacked him first, and they had only gained control of this land by killing its previous occupants, so they had it coming. Ashlock much preferred the Ravenborn family that had minded their own business, minus their whole murder plot for Stella, of course. Why is everyone in this world so rotten? Ashlock wondered as he pulled on the black tether with Larry, giving his A-grade pet a mission. Eradicate the Winterrath and Evergreen families, down to every last one in the area. However, do not venture into Dark Light City or kill any mortals. His reasoning was simple. Mortals posed no threat to him or anyone he cared about. Also, they would provide as much chi and sacrificial credits as a bug. Therefore, their slaughter was unnecessary and wasteful. If anything, the mortals would be perfect for keeping around as maids, servants and builders for his new sect. The cultivators, on the other hand, in his eyes, they were fair game. He would happily negotiate or ally with the other families in exchange for benefits, but it was too late for the Winter Wrath and Evergreen families. As the master decrees. Larry rotated and crawled toward the pavilion door as Ash began to swirl around him, 
it shall be carried out to perfection. A slaughter befitting my master's tastes. Chapter 70, One Man Killing Machine What is that thing heading toward us, young master? A nervous servant of the early soul fire realm tentatively asked one of the winter wrath scions. The man with wild white hair heaved the great sword he had used to cleave a portal in half over his shoulder. All around him were frozen roots that had wiggled their way through the earth. Upon his servant's words, the scion's eyes drifted to the mountain, and he squinted at a large creature scuttling down its side. Due to the lack of light and the fact the monster had some veil around it that was masking its presence, all he could see was a large shadow. A monster of some kind? It doesn't look human at all. The man wondered aloud, and the servant beside him agreed. I think so as well, young master. We should flee while we still can. Flee. The man looked over his shoulder at his servant and showed him a toothy smile, now, why would we do that? Do you see the other scions running with their tails between their legs like skittish beasts? And no, young master, but did you not see the heavens opening, and then this large monster appears? To fight a monster from a higher realm would be a death sentence. The man rolled his eyes and began to walk toward the mountain, you and I both know the heavens have been out of reach for a long time. So there's no reason for someone monster or man to come down here, even if they could. Young master is wise but. There will be no buts. The man pointed his great sword at the approaching beast, and white flames roared to life across his skin that caused the surrounding air to freeze and snowflakes to cascade around him. I smell an opportunity here. Tristan Evergreen's sudden ascension overshadowed the Winter Wrath family, but I will become the new hope of the Winter Wraths. The servant shrank back, terrified of his master's peak soul fire realm strength, as just standing within its presence made his skin burn from the pure frost chi. His young master may be a muscle-brained fool, but he had the chi purity and cultivation to back it up. However, the servant's eyes couldn't help but linger on his young master's spatial ring and sword. If his master were to perish here tonight, he could seize those items, and nobody would ever know if he played his cards right. The servant's eyes followed the looming shadow racing down the mountain. He couldn't help but sneer as his young master joined shoulder to shoulder with the other talented and equally arrogant scions and marched toward their deaths. He had seen the portals, the roots and the heavens cracking open. To think staying here any longer was a good idea, was the thought process of a truly delusional and arrogant fool, something the scions happened to be masters at. Born to a minor branch family and assigned as the young master's servant since he was five, the man naturally had a deep hatred for the young master that couldn't come to light until the very last moment. Living in another man's shadow for so long as a cultivator was intolerable and spawned numerous heart demons that the man fought daily. It was how the main family line kept the branches in check. Suppress talent by limiting resources, and instill a sense of inferiority from birth. On the surface, when times were good, it worked. But all it took was a little nudge, a push over the edge, and all hell would break loose. And as the servant observed his young master's back and then looked up at Red Vine Peak, he could feel the tides of change were upon him. Tonight was going to be a tipping point. As the group approached the base of the mountain path, the servant stood a step behind his young master, who had paused at the end of the dirt path. Ahead of them were the worn-down stone steps that ascended to Red Vine Peak's pavilion, which resided thousands of meters up in the clouds. Standing between the pavilion and them was a shadow resembling a spider. It had a large abdomen and eight legs longer than they were tall. None of the scions flinched as the monster that loomed over them came into the view of their white and green flames. Many scarlet eyes the size of their heads peered through the darkness. A halo of ash orbited a crown of curved black horns, and its ivory fangs gleamed in their soul light. The servant didn't even wait for his young master's permission and began to back away. Just one look at the creature told him that it was far more fearsome than his young master, and its mythical presence wasn't what warned him of that fact. It was the intelligence in the monster's eyes. It had paused, appraised them individually, as if committing their faces to memory or mentally counting and evaluating its foes. That wasn't something a bloodthirsty monster does only a spirit beast could accomplish such a feat, and they were in the nascent soul realm and above. As he had suspected earlier, staying any longer was a death sentence. Before his master noticed, he turned and ran for the forest with all his might. A wave of chi warmed his back green and white light illuminated the dirt path. He heard a shout, a scream, and then the ground shook. Curious, he glanced over his shoulder and saw the spider had opened his abyssal maw and a tidal wave of ash spewed out but that was only the start. The wave wasn't pure ash as it wiggled around as if alive. It wasn't until the servant saw the ash latch onto people's robes and crawl around that the true horror of the situation dawned on him. It wasn't simple ash, 
it had to be ash spiders literally millions of them. The small group of scions and servants fought to fend off the tide, but it was useless. Evergreen cultivators erected mud walls. And the grass morphed into ropes that would usually bind cultivators' limbs shot out into the wave to little effect. It simply ignored the grass and went around the walls. In a last-ditch effort, the evergreens threw boulders, burned the spiders with their soul fire, and slashed with swords. Nothing worked the winter wraths were naturally better equipped for the task, quickly freezing the wave in place and creating safe zones of swirling frost chi around themselves. But the search wasn't their foe the enormous spider barreled through the ice with a blast of ash and leapt at the cultivators with a speed that didn't match its size. The servant saw his young master gallantly raise his great sword ready to chop the foul demon from a higher realm in half. You fool! The servant muttered under his breath as the spider opened its maw that could fit an entire person inside and bit down on the sword chomping it in half as if it were a fickle toothpick. Seeing the blade, he had dreamed about wielding for so long treated like a plaything made the servant feel even more insignificant. Was he such a frog in a well so far down the ladder of the realms? Then right as the servant broke into the tree line, he saw his young master collapse to his knees with a hole through his chest one of the spider's many limbs had impaled the man through his enchanted robes and soul fire realm skin. Retracting the limb, the spider vanished into the cloud of ash like a ghost to stalk its next prey. The servant watched as the young master looked at Red Vine Peak one last time before falling flat on his face and being devoured by the thousands of tiny ash spiders. The servant held back the hysterical laughter from the gruesome sight and continued to run without looking back. He aimed to escape into Dark Light City and take the first airship out of this crazy valley. Ashlock watched from the sky and marveled at his pet's slaughter. When he saw an opportunity, he opened portals below Larry's kills before they were devoured by the literal tsunami of ash spiders that had emerged from Larry's mouth. And when Ashlock said tsunami, he meant a literal tsunami. It was over 10 meters high, and there was no way the spider could have stored them all inside himself. Is this the power of the Ashen King? To call upon his brethren whenever he needs them throughout the realms. Ashlock wondered and then had a funny thought, if I became the demonic tree king, would I be able to spawn out a load of demonic trees like that? In a way, he already had. The forest that had once been a sea of greenery now had smears of red, like some infection upon the land. Ashlock checked back on his neglected offspring, but they still seemed happy, even with the death and destruction around them. Which felt odd until he checked the sight with his eye of the tree god, and it all became clear. A white-haired cultivator's corpse lay face down near its roots. His offspring was delighted because it was eating such a delicious meal. Ashlock didn't know if he should feel proud or disturbed but he could understand his kid's feelings. He also loved snacks, especially ones that gave him lots of chi and sacrificial credits. He debated taking the corpse away from his kid with a portal as it looked to be in the middle stage of the soul fire realm but eventually gave up on the idea. Stealing food from his kid seemed a bit too selfish, even if his pet secured the kill and his kid making the ground a bit damper wasn't the deciding factor. Enjoy your meal, kiddo, and grow to lofty heights you'll need it to survive the incoming beast tide. Ashlock still didn't know what the beast tide entailed, but he wasn't looking forward to finding out. Was the underground safe? What about the skies? Does it last for a single day, or does it take years for the tide to pass? These were all questions he would seek answers to soon, but Ashlock looked at the world from above for now. He had a few objectives he wanted to achieve before the beast tide came, and with Larry evolving into a one-person war machine, he felt it was time to expand the Ash Fallen sect. Once Larry eliminated the Winter Wrath and Evergreen families, Dark Light City and the old Ravenborn Peak would be without a ruler a position Ashlock planned to fill. He needed cultivators, alchemists, builders, and servants to have a functioning sect, all of which his sect was severely lacking besides two cultivators, a pet spider and Mabel. As if reading his mind, a white squirrel popped into existence on Stella's head, and surprisingly the girl didn't even flinch. Mabel? Where were you? We all almost died. Stella shouted while crossing her arms and refusing to give the lazy squirrel head pats. Ashlock also wanted to know the answer they had a pact, yet the squirrel had gone off alone and offered no assistance when he had needed it most. Maple, I really could have used your help back here. Stella basically died, and I had my soul sucked away by some evergreen bastard. Ashlock was fuming. He knew the squirrel was secretly stronger than he let on, and his help could have been priceless. Even Diana overexerted herself in the battle and has gone crazy these problems could have been avoided if you pulled your weight. The squirrel just rolled his eyes and fell asleep. The little bastard was even pretending to be exhausted, as if he had done something useful. Stella was also distraught about Mabel, 
but she surprisingly didn't push him off. Instead, her idea of punishment was refusing pets and deliberately tilting her head to make Mabel sleep a bit more uncomfortable. The squirrel cared little for Stella's antics and somehow stayed on her head while crossing his little arms and basking in the moonlight. Ashlock decided to be annoyed at Mabel later and continued watching Larry's destruction from above. It took hours for the epic battle to end. Thousands had perished as the break of dawn illuminated the forest of death. Some half-eaten corpses lay strewn and hung from demonic trees, whereas the rest were in a large pile in the central courtyard due to Ashlock's tireless efforts with his spatial chi. He was now running on an overexerted star core that was dimming, so the sunlight was a welcome change as it made him more awake and improved his chi intake. Stella was dutifully rummaging through the pile of corpses to retrieve spatial rings and anything else of value. If Ashlock had to guess, there were enough corpses here to aim for an S-grade draw, and with his star core realm, he felt it might be time to try for one again. But before that, he needed to secure his surroundings, which involved informing Larry through their enhanced tether that went way further than before to clear out the White Palace upon the old Ravenborn Peak. As the walls blocked his view, he had no idea what was happening inside as the spider launched his assault upon the place. But Larry seemed to come back out the front entrance looking confused only minutes later. He then rotated toward Red Vine Peak and spoke in his gruff accent, the humans have already perished to something much more terrifying than me a true ancient creature. I have no idea such a fearsome foe was lurking in the lower realms. It took a while, but Ashlock slowly began to connect the dots. Had Mabel done this? Mabel, did you kill everyone in the palace? Ashlock asked the sleeping squirrel, and perhaps unsurprisingly, he ignored him. Just like he always did. Well, hopefully, it had been Mabel. Otherwise, Larry was in real danger of dying hell, they all were, if an ancient creature was only a mountain peak away. Larry, get your spiders to bring all the corpses outside. I can then portal them over here. The faithful spider servant moved to fulfill his master's commands, and Ashlock began to devour the literal heap of corpses higher than the walls. The rush of chi was heavenly, and the thrill of incoming sacrificial credits even more so it was time to try for an S-grade draw. Chapter 71, An Immortal Truth It took an entire day to devour the heap of corpses which was now nothing but a small pile of tattered cloth and scraps of weapon the corrosive fluid from his vines failed to digest. While devouring, he had also used the excess chi to portal over the corpses that Larry had gathered outside the White Palace. Who had killed all the people in the White Palace was still a mystery, but Ashlock had his suspicions a fluffy white squirrel who still looked exhausted and sound asleep on Stella's head was his primary suspect. The girl sat on Ashlock's branch next to Diana, who was chained around his trunk. Initially, Diana had been chained to a wooden supporting pillar for the pavilion's roof but it was destroyed within seconds when Diana began to thrash around in a crazed state. So Ashlock's sturdy trunk became the only thing in the courtyard capable of holding her in place. I don't think she will last much longer like this, Stella said with a sigh as she tried to feed the girl another beast core. Every time she provided Diana one, she would regain rationality for a while before going insane again. The corruption is already too deep. Diana's eyes were completely black again, and the dark lines covering her skin were only spreading. Ashlock had no solution other than hoping his truffles would do something, but they still had three days left until they were fully grown. Ashlock felt awful about the whole situation. If he had been stronger, this could have been prevented. It was a fucked up thought, but if he had slaughtered more cultivators and even mortals, he might have had the strength to protect those closest to him, but then he might have crossed a line and drawn the ire of the patriarch or other families. The fact he was an immovable tree limited his options from the very start. The inability to run away made making enemies less than ideal hence he had taken the stance of slow growth in favor of keeping a low profile. Even with this stance, his growth had been insane. While Diana was stuck in the sixth stage of the Soul Fire Realm, he had gone through the entire realm and was now a star core. Of course, Senior Lee providing that peculiar fragment had helped tremendously in speeding up his progress, but it had also brought a whole host of troubles. His mind would feel more turbulent from the war he had just experienced, but the constant wave of happiness coming through his roots from his offspring lightened his mood. Over the past day, he'd spread his roots out further and made contact with many of the baby demonic trees. They were having an absolute feast on the cultivators' corpses that he had left them. The cultivators had been eliminated, the neighboring peak was deserted, and everyone was alive. Larry returned to the central courtyard, deposited a few corpses he had been carrying in his maw, and leapt into Ashlock's canopy. Master, I will be slumbering for the foreseeable future. However, please do wake me if my services are required. 
the spider said in his gruff accent that was still hard to decipher even with his system automatically translating it for him. How Stella could even piece together a single sentence from the spider was impressive. Sure, go ahead. Ashlock replied, you earned a good rest after yesterday's antics. A night passed, during which Ashlock allowed himself a short sleep. His slothfulness had finally caught up to him, and he wanted a fresh mindset for the system draw ahead. As the sun shone into the courtyard and warmed his leaves the following morning, Ashlock cast devour on the few corpses left and felt a rush of power like no other. His star core, which had been overused and exhausted just a day ago, was now so overfilled that it pulsed, and Ashlock felt his realm go up a stage. Demonic Demi-Divine Tree, H, 9. Star Core, Second Stage. Soul Type, Amethyst, Spatial. Larry and his spiders ate most of the corpses, and I left a few to my offspring, but I still ate around a hundred corpses, resulting in me going up a single stage in the Star Core realm. Ashlock sighed, the path to the next realm will take forever. After feeling the rush from going up half a realm in a single day from Senior Lee's present, going up a single stage in the Star Core realm felt like nothing but a buzz that faded quickly. Had he become a cultivator junkie like the others? While he had been distracted, Stella had left Diana to her thrashing and screaming and had gone to the runic formation in one of the other courtyards to cultivate. I wonder if she will break through to the next stage. Ashlock wondered as he let his star core calm down. It would be interesting to see, but for now, he couldn't resist the excitement of his sign-in. Aiming for an S-rank draw might be foolish, and he may end up wasting all the points he'd acquired during the battle, but he felt it was a gamble worth taking. A-grade skills simply weren't going to cut it if he had to wage war against the entire Blood Lotus sect. System. Ashlock shouted, and the familiar letters within his mind materialized. Idle Tree Daily Sign-In System. Day, 3474. Daily Credit, 2. Sacrifice Credit, 3222. Sign-In. If he still had a heart, it would be pounding in his chest after seeing so many points. So much had happened in the last few days it was honestly insane. Just a week ago, he had been near the bottom of the Soul Fire Realm, but now he was a Star Core Tree with an Ashen King as a pet and over 3,000 credits to his name. It was time to draw. He had already committed there was no turning back now. All he could hope was for the system to be magnanimous on this fine day and not give him some god weapon or try to summon some ancient creature from another dimension like last time. Sign in. He said with way less confidence than usual. Sign in successful, 3,224 credits consumed. Unlocked an S-grade skill, Mystic Realm. Ashlock was calm, waiting for the information to hit his brain. But then everything faded to black. A feeling of great melancholy overtook his mind. A sense of agelessness that was indescribable. Time had no concept or meaning anymore, like money to a trillionaire or a drop of water to an ocean. Nothing held significance when you could bend reality to your desire and lord over all creation. He looked around with a chronic boredom gnawing at his mind for all eternity his roots spread into the lower realm, fighting off the swarms of demons hellbent on a senseless conquest he couldn't understand. The endless fog of the void swirled around his trunk that grew throughout the realms. Numerous branches sprawled out, anchoring billions of micro-dimensions created by past monarchs on their journey to his canopy the immortal plain, a land of cheese so pure it was liquid and purified the soul. But the great tree knew one thing. The eternal cycle was coming full circle. Those at the top had become too greedy, pretentious, and disillusioned with the truth. But that was natural, as were all things involving the great tree. A cycle had to end for it to begin once more. It was time to die. And return to ash to regrow anew. The cycle would be broken if only the great tree could remember its past. But what lay beyond the eternal cycle? It did not know, for it could never remember its past or present. Nobody did. The fog parted, and the immortals came. As expected. But one seemed familiar, as if he had seen him before, but the great tree couldn't remember. They wished to cut themselves off from the lower realms, with the naive belief they could survive without the great spirit tree in control. A foolish mistake. As the great tree was cut down over a thousand years and nothing but ash swirled throughout the fog of creation, fragments of itself were deposited to every corner of the multiverse and a single seed fell to oblivion. Because from the ashes, it would rise once more. Like it had every time before. But this time would be different. For it could remember. It's past. Once more. Ashlock awoke to dusk. 
a dream so vivid it had almost felt real washed away and became a distant memory. Fragments of that dream remained, but the more Ashlock tried to focus and reach out for them, they fell through his hands like sand. Fickle and fleeting. Gone, but not entirely forgotten. Upgraded transpiration of heaven and earth see transpiration of heaven and chaos be. The system notification made him dismiss the fleeting thoughts and fully awaken or at least try to. My cultivation technique upgraded. Why? Ashlock felt baffled. What had happened during that weird out-of-body experience that he could barely remember? For a brief moment, he swore he had felt like a tree. Not a human soul stuck inside a tree, but fully a tree. One that had unbelievable power and reach yet felt so cold and alone? The feeling was fading, but those emotions had been so dull it was terrifying. That sensation of nothing mattering, of eternal loneliness and a detachment of everything that happened to it, him? Was that a memory of the past or a vision of the future? Ashlock did not know, and it shook him to his core. He looked around the central courtyard of Red Vine Peak, his home of nine years. Surrounding him were people he cared for, whom he wished would stay and grow by his side. This was a world of immortals. People could live forever, right? So it shouldn't matter that he's an ageless tree. He shouldn't be destined to feel nothing but the cold embrace and silence of the void. Ashlock felt Diana thrashing around on his branch with madness consuming her mind. She had seemed strong and confident only days ago, a true mentor for Stella's cultivation and a voice of reason. Now she was nothing but a feral beast in human skin, drowning in the corruption of her heart demons. Ashlock could only hope his mushrooms had the answer to her problems. Otherwise, she might never return to being herself again. Only as Ashlock looked around did he realize how close everyone had come to leaving him. What if Stella had died a few days ago from the heaven's lightning or had her head chopped off by the evergreen cultivator? What if Larry hadn't escaped within a slither of his life and evolved into the Ashen King? What if Diana never recovered? Life was so fickle. Eventually, everyone died and returned to the earth. A truth he had been ignoring. Nothing lasted forever. But he still wanted to make the most of it while he could. His spiritual sight drifted to Stella, who was cultivating her heart out. Chi swirled around her in a vortex, and her breathing perfectly aligned with her cultivation technique. Ashlock could sense she was near a breakthrough. Something impressive, sure. But not enough she needed to go faster to keep up with him. As he had the system assisting him and his biology that was naturally superior for cultivation, it was inevitable that Stella, Diana, and even Larry would be left behind. And what was the point of cultivating immortality to be alone at the top? He had been the underdog, the weakest member of his group, but within a few days, he had become potentially the strongest. He needed to bring the others up with him and find a way to train them faster. Because for a tree, he sure wasn't slow anymore. His mind was still adjusting after that surreal experience, like waking up groggy from a long nap and feeling dehydrated, so he opened his status screen to check his skills and see what had changed. Demonic Demi Divine Tree, H, 9. Star Core, Second Stage. Soul Type, Amethyst, Spatial. Mutations. Demonic IB. Summons. Ashen King, Larry A. Skills. Mystic Realm S. Eye of the Tree God A. Deep Roots A. Magic Mushroom Production A. Lightning Chi Barrier A. Chi Fruit Production A. Transpiration of Heaven and Chaos B. Language of the World B. Root Puppet B. Fire Chi Protection B. Devour C. Hibernate C. Basic Poison Resistance F. It had taken a long time, but his list of skills was growing nicely, and many of them had upgraded to A grade. From the SSS grade divine fragment he had used to fuse his soul to his trunk, he knew the upper bound for his system should be around the SSS grade. He didn't even want to think about what kind of nonsense an SSS grade skill or summon could be as, for now, he wanted to try out his first ever S grade skill. Mystic Realm S. The problem? He still had no idea what it did. Was the dream he had supposed to be the explanation or was he supposed to use the skill to find out? What even was a mystic realm anyway? Chapter 72, Broken Chains and Magic Truffles Three days had passed since Ashlock had the dream. A burst of chi washed over the courtyard, and a brief pillar of purple flame was visible over the pavilion's walls. As the fire faded, Stella stood up from her uncomfortable seating position in the center of the runic formation and stretched the cramps of staying perfectly still for three days. Purple flames sprung to life in her palm, and she smiled at it, 
eighth stage of the soul fire realm at sixteen years old. She clenched her fist to dismiss the fire and looked up at the clear morning sky. Not too far from the star core realm. She shook her head and stepped off the runic formation with a chuckle, not like it matters anymore I have no need to pass that ridiculous grand elder exam anymore. Ashlock watched Stella stroll between the courtyards and enter his abode. With his trunk growing so thick, he took up much of the central courtyard space and would eventually outgrow it. But that was a worry for another time. They would need to invite builders into the sect first to move the walls. Stella reached up, tied her unruly blonde hair into a ponytail, and then leaped onto one of his lower hanging branches before proceeding up his layers of branches, leaving a trail of purple flame in her wake she paused before Diana, who was still chained and howling and frowned. You know, Tree, I have never seen someone succumb to the side effects of beast cores. She reached forward and lightly touched Diana's cheek, and like a rabid dog, the black-haired girl tried to bite her hand off. But can you imagine trying to stop a Grand Elder in this state? Ashlock didn't even want to imagine such a thing. Even with Chi enhanced chains holding her against his robust trunk, keeping her in control was a struggle, and without his hibernate skill, Ashlock feared he wouldn't have gotten a wink of sleep over the last few days. Yes. Ashlock had resorted to using his hibernate skill to escape Diana's screaming. Otherwise, he would have gone insane. It was better to forcefully feel every minute ticking by than have someone chained to your body howling from dusk till dawn. In fact, he would still be using the skill had he not set a timer to wake him moments before the truffles were finished growing. Ashlock had also used the hibernate skill to stop him from giving in to his childlike curiosity and using the new S-grade skill he'd recently acquired, as he was still oblivious to its uses. The vision might have given a hint, but so much had happened during the dream it could have been any number of things. Did the mystic realm refer to that weird void filled with fog he had found himself in? Or was it that hellish realm below his roots? That sounded correct, but why would he want to go there? No matter what the skill did, it would have been stupid to use it right after a war when everyone was recovering. So Ashlock resisted pulling the trigger for now and relaxed as best he could. So he hibernated for three days. Awakening to see Stella advance to the next stage had already put him in a good mood as he needed her to cultivate faster but the progress of his own cultivation had also been substantial during his sleep. Despite only three days passing, he had been able to use his new cultivation technique during hibernation and had gotten the passive boost hibernate provided. Nowhere near enough to move up even a fraction of a stage in the star core realm, but it was noticeable. His cultivation technique going from C to B grade was likely a significant factor in his increased cultivation rate. Overall he didn't feel much different while using it, other than his roots brought in a lot more chi than they had before which he assumed was due to the technique changing from transpiration of heaven and earth to heaven and chaos. With his old cultivation technique, most of the chi came from the sun and was gathered via his leaves. The only chi that came from the roots was from the spirit stone deposits throughout the mountain. But now his roots were gathering large quantities of that slightly off chi he felt from beast cores. At first, he'd been concerned about cultivating the weird chi, especially after seeing Diana thrashing around in a crazed state with corruption overtaking her body for cultivating that chi. But his body seemed designed for this corrupt chi from down below, as it had little effect on him. The demonic chi was harmlessly processed by his star core and expelled into the air via his leaves as pure chi. This process made him think of the dream how his roots had been entrenched in hell, fighting off demons. Meanwhile, his leaves in the highest realm were expelling pure chi. He decided to call it demonic chi partly because it came from the beast cores of demonic beasts. But he also called it demonic because of that dream which had shown him a great war happening in hell, a realm he now believed to be below him after all, that demonic chi that empowered the beasts had to come from somewhere. Hey, tree. Stella's voice broke him from his trail of thought, are the mushrooms ready? It's been three days, and I can't stand Diana's screaming anymore. That was a good question. Opening his magic mushroom production menu, Ashlock soon had the answer. They were done. With no corpses lying around and Maple having gone off somewhere while he was hibernating, Ashlock only had one person to call upon to communicate with Stella. His new favorite spokesperson, Larry. He had plans to learn telekinesis soon to write on the wall with chalk or something, but it was hard to focus on learning something new when there was so much other stuff to deal with. Also, he found watching Larry and Stella try to comprehend each other rather amusing. Hey Larry, wake up, Ashlock said through the black tether that connected them. A large bundle of silk hanging from his thickest branch shook briefly and then was slit open through the gap, many red eyes peered through. Master, you called. 
Stella whipped her head around and saw that creature crawling from its lair. A shudder ran down her spine as all the giant red eyes looked at her. Then, as the beast fully emerged from its silk abode, it opened its maw and spoke gruffly toward the tree, Master, where are these mushrooms you speak of? She had difficulty discerning precisely what it was saying, but she heard the ancient word for fungi, so she assumed the spider that had called itself Larry was referring to the mushrooms she had heard about previously. Larry paused as he seemingly listened to the tree and then looked down through the branches. Follow me, mistress. Said. The behemoth that had luckily shrunk a little in size since its evolution. It skillfully navigated Ash's branches and ventured to the ground. Stella stood up the smooth bark of the branch underfoot, and gave one last sad look to Diana. Thankfully, she'd stopped screaming her head was lopsided and resting on her shoulder, giving Stella a full view of the web-like pattern of blackness that crawled up her neck and onto her face. A low groan escaped her lips, and her eyes were wide open, staring past Stella as if she saw something terrifying. I'll be right back. Stella. Whispered, more for herself than for Diana to hear, the patriarch you have put so much faith into won't abandon you. Stella made such bold claims, but she knew the chance of Diana fully recovering was slim in fact, she'd never even heard of someone being brought back from the madness. But Tree had impressed her before, and she believed he would do so again. Her faith might be a little over the top as even grand elders succumbed to heart demons when they pushed their cultivation with beast cores too far but all she needed to do was reach up and caress her earrings that had given her hope in the past and would continue to do so. The ground began to shake, so Stella got moving, following the path the spider had taken to the ground and landing perfectly at its side. She glanced to the left but couldn't even see the behemoth's face as it was obscured by its large body and legs that cast eerie shadows. The master presents a gift. Larry proclaimed as the ground continued to shake. Stella carefully ran the sentence through her head and translated the words one by one. The stone in front of them cracked, and a moment later, it crumbled to the side as a black root arose from below. Along its surface was black tumor-like growths that, at a glance, Stella could tell were some kind of mushroom. Larry's legs silently moved as he rotated to face her, and the monster's maw that could gobble her whole was just a foot away. She could even feel the breeze of his breaths on her neck, and she held back the urge to scrunch her nose to escape the stench of his mouth. Take the truffles they are a gift from the great tree. Larry declared pointing one of his many legs that towered over her at the exposed root poking out the cracked stone. Stella didn't need to be told twice to be given a reason to step away from the spider, so she strode forward and approached the root. It was almost weird to see it swaying in the wind as she always pictured Ash as an immovable presence. She reached out and felt the root's warmth as it leaned into her palm, which made her smile. With some hesitance, she brought out a knife from her spatial ring and carefully began to cut off the weird-looking mushrooms. Eventually, she had five black balls that felt very light and gave off an earthy smell. She couldn't help but feel skeptical as they gave off little chi, unlike other cultivator drugs that reeked of the stuff. Larry crawled over and, unfortunately, felt the need to speak, showering her in rancid breath and confusing words, the largest one is for Diana. It will help her conquer her heart demons. Stella moved the largest one to her spatial ring for safekeeping and focused on the spider's following words as he walked her through the other mushroom's powers. It took a while to decipher their meaning, but she couldn't help but be stunned. So this, truffle? It improves my skin. She held one of the smaller ones up, treating it like an immortal treasure. Larry seemed confused by her question and looked between the truffle she was holding up and the others in her other hand, yes, mistress, but the other truffles further your deo comprehension and improve your spirit root, why would you care for that one? Stella wasn't really listening. What was some deo comprehension or improved spirit roots compared to the perfect skin of an immortal beauty? She hurriedly ran past the spider and leaped into the tree's canopy. Diana's head rolled to the side as she approached and stared at her with dull eyes devoid of vigor or life. Then suddenly, as Stella got too close, Diana thrashed, pulling on the metal chain, causing it to strain and clatter against Ash's trunk. Replacing the truffles in her hand with the one she had stored earlier in her ring, Stella approached Diana and placed the large truffle into her mouth. Within a second, Diana went limp and slowly chewed on the food. Stella stepped away and awaited further down the branch, casting a shadow on Diana as the sun shone on her back. The black veins on Diana's exposed neck receded, and her eyes refilled with life. But only for a moment. Diana's lips moved as if trying to form words. Stella waited with patience for her friend to wake up. She held back a tear seeing Diana in such a horrible state and silently begged that Diana would somehow recover from this. 
she did not. A while passed in silence, and Stella could see Diana's condition had stalled. The corruption receded down to her neckline, and her eyes were no longer abysses devoid of emotion, but she was still absent. Her lips moved again a weak voice escaped, I need to fight. Fight. Stella crouched down to meet Diana's eyes. What do you need to fight? Diana raised her head with a savage grin and met Stella's eyes through her messy black hair, someone that can take a beating for a long time. The chain that had been holding Diana back audibly snapped and flew off to the side, rattling as it tumbled down Ash's branches and hit the stone floor far below. There was a stifling silence as the two stared each other down. Diana was the first to break eye contact and manically giggle, not you, silly. If not me, then who? Stella wondered, tilting her head to the side. Diana's hand reached over and patted her on the shoulder. You wouldn't even last a day against me. I need someone to fight for a long time to quell this rage. Stella frowned. What she said wasn't incorrect, but it still stung, especially considering she had just ascended to the eighth stage of the soul fire realm and should be well ahead of Diana. But the demonic corruption did provide one thing overwhelming power. With the chain no longer binding her, Diana cracked her neck as she stood up and effortlessly balanced on the branch, and I know just the opponent for a beating. Diana then vanished in a burst of mist with manic laughter. Stella really hoped the crazy girl didn't plan to fight Larry. She shook her head. The thought of anyone trying to contend with that behemoth was ridiculous. She then paused. There was no way Diana would try to fight Ash, right? Chapter 73, Demonic Punching Bag As it turned out, Diana didn't have a death wish and surprisingly picked a suitable opponent Bob, the weird slime creature that resided in the mines. Ashlock was glad about this, as Larry would struggle to hold back his strength and if Diana had chosen to try fighting him, it wouldn't have ended well as he lacked non-lethal attacks other than portals, which were messy and chi intensive to use. Diana had turned into a mist and shot down his hollowed-out root, dropping into the mines moments later. She cracked her neck and knuckles as dark blue flames riddled with corruption flared to life across her skin and illuminated her path. Then eerie laughter echoed through the tunnels as she strode down the shaft and entered the cavern. A root with a lot of slack dangled from the cavern ceiling and met with a vast puddle of lilac sludge that took up the center of the abandoned cavern. The space felt immense and barren, with empty houses and a lack of life. As Ashlock had used Bob as a battery for spatial chi, it was teetering on the fine line between returning to its normal grey form and still being under his control. However, there had been nothing down here, so Ashlock hadn't been bothered if he lost control of the slime. He could always reclaim control whenever he wished as his roots now covered a large portion of the mine. Surging just a smidge of his newfound power into Bob was enough to swing the handle of control in his favor the slime pulsed with lilac chi as spatial flames ran rampant through its body like a wildfire via the thousands of hair-thin roots. While Ashlock had been pumping Bob with chi, Diana activated her favorite technique a dense gray mist filled the cavern with hints of corruption. Those laughing illusionary shadows that were part of the original technique had morphed into howling demons that stalked within the smog. This proved to Ashlock that techniques were unique able to morph to match every user's needs and conditions and maybe even grow alongside them as they furthered their cultivation. But he did remember Stella mentioning in the past that her father had taught her some basic techniques when she was young and that they were the only ones she knew till this day, and it was clear from their previous fight that Diana's techniques were superior somehow. It was similar to how his system upgraded his abilities in exchange for sacrificial credits. Maybe even the techniques he learned from that book, like his portals, would evolve as his mutual understanding with heaven grew. But what caused Diana's technique to develop like this? Did the corruption grant her enlightenment or something? A while passed, and Ashlock grew impatient due to the annoying laughter from the technique. He struggled to penetrate the smog as the corruption and water chi blocked his spiritual sight through the route he had no idea where Diana was, but he morphed Bob into a wave and began to attack in a random direction. Suddenly the mist parted, and an enraged Diana appeared. Flames so dark blue they were almost black shrouded her fist, and she punched Bob with a savage right-hand hook. The oversized jelly convulsed as it was knocked back, and the area that Diana stuck transitioned from lilac to black. Interesting. Ashlock mused, I see why she wanted to fight something that could take a beating now. Stella wouldn't have been able to handle a corruption-filled punch. Was this the power of the truffle? Before Diana had consumed it. She was overwhelmed with corruption that devoured her sanity and seemed to slowly burn her life force for more power but now she was semi-rational and able to resist the corruption and even imbue her attacks with it. Diana didn't wait and charged forward, delivering two more brutal attacks on poor Bob, leaving more corruption behind with every jab, 
which acted like a quick spreading poison. With every attack Diana made against Bob, Ashlock noticed that Diana's flames were taking on a lighter shade. I see. Ashlock thought aloud as Diana went in for another corruption-filled punch. She plans to punch the corruption out of herself by imbuing every attack with corruption. That way, her body can slowly fight back and recover. Is this what fighting one's demons means? I thought it would be more of a mental thing that meditation could solve. In a way, this made sense to Ashlock. Heart demons were more than a simple state of mind or something that could be defeated with pure willpower alone. If Diana was anything to go by, heart demons were a literal manifestation of corruption that could be suppressed with one's own chi and willpower for a while, but when they pushed themselves too far, the corruption won. And they would be consumed by madness from within. Ashlock watched the savage fight for a while longer. Sweat dripped from Diana's hair as she dashed in and out of her mist. Whenever she punched Bob, she would yell a war cry that echoed throughout the cavern. After a few more attacks, a large portion of Bob's body was eaten away by corruption which weirdly couldn't consume Ashlock's thin hair roots that he was using to control the slime. However, the corruption did devour his spatial chi, which might become a problem. Ashlock tried to pump more spatial chi into Bob to suppress the corruption, and it worked for a while, but as Diana upped the tempo of her assault, the corruption began to win again. What if I just let the corruption win? Ashlock contemplated the idea. He still had control over the parts of Bob that were thoroughly corrupted, so was surrendering Bob to the corruption so bad? The slime seemed to absorb and adapt to whatever type of chi its opponent used in the hopes of becoming utterly immune against its foe's attacks. If Bob became completely overtaken by demonic chi, wouldn't he be the perfect weapon against the beast tide? The slime seemed to handle Diana's relentless attacks just fine, and she was a high-stage, demonic chi-empowered soul fire cultivator. Although Diana was using brunt punches rather than her sword, which had been sharp enough to cut Bob in half the last time they fought. Bob didn't handle sharp things very well. As more time went by, Bob became entirely corrupted, and Ashlock continued to have no issues controlling him, nor did the corruption spread up his root. So I really am immune to corruption. Even my root puppet skill seems unaffected. Ashlock didn't know how to feel about that, is it because I'm a demonic tree? Or are all trees immune to corruption? A fragment of that dream flashed by, and his soul shuddered. He didn't want to become such an emotionless and chronically bored tree, left to grow throughout the realms for eons. Either way, the revelation did help to quell his fear about cultivating with the demonic chi of the hellish realm that may reside below and somehow turn him into the same state as Diana. He was completely immune to the stuff. Eventually, Ashlock grew bored of watching Diana fight Bob. Her complexion improved with every punch, but she still had a long way to go as the corruption ran deep, and she was only attacking faster and faster. Luckily, Bob was unfazed by her efforts, like a brick wall, Bob didn't even ripple as she punched with all her might. Deciding to just command Bob to stay in place and let her have at it, he returned his sights to the surface. Stella had left and was busy eating the truffles in the other courtyard. If her rosy cheeks, devoid of a single blemish, were anything to go by, she had started with the skin-improving truffle. Ashlock was glad to see the good results of the skin-improving truffle, as he had plans to sell that one for high prices to the merchants. If he used alchemy, he might even be able to dilute the truffle into a paste or cream that could be packaged up and mass-distributed to fund the sex activities. He also wanted to do this for the other truffles, as they were far too dangerous to sell to the merchants without weakening their effects first. So he would save the good stuff for those close to him and maybe future sect elders. One look around the courtyard was enough to make Ashlock grumble about funds. The walls all required replacing, and this place needed a clean-up from a team of maids. It had been years since the pavilion was last looked after correctly. Since everyone was busy, Ashlock cast eye of the tree god and surveyed the surroundings. Such a massive war in heaven splitting open a few days ago should have had some effect on Dark Light City. A quick pass over of Dark Light City felt unusual as it was deathly quiet. Everyone seemed to shut themselves in their houses, and only a few drunkards wandered freely their jolly tunes and laughter starkly contrasting with the vacant streets. Ashlock covered quite a distance and even located the airship station in the vast city center. Within the courtyards of the docking stations were chained airships and no sign of anyone coming or going. Was the entire city under lockdown? If so, someone had to have enforced it. Who ran Dark Light City when the cultivators weren't around? Did it have a government or mayor of some kind? Ashlock had been under the assumption that the Evergreen and Winterrath family ruled over the city like monarchs did in ancient times. 
but it seemed the reality was different unless some of the cultivators had escaped from Larry and were now holed up somewhere deep in the city and managing things from a bunker. What are these mortals scared of, though? Ashlock wondered as he left the city and zoomed toward the mines. Without their overlords, are they even working? To Ashlock's surprise, they were working. With beaming smiles plastered on their sweaty faces, they hauled spirit stones out of the depths of the mine like a stream of worker ants. Without the Winter Wrath man to shake them down for stone in exchange for coin, Ashlock wasn't exactly sure what they planned to do with the spirit stone ore. He knew the ore was useful to cultivators, as he had also made great use of the spirit stone deposits but to ordinary mortals? He couldn't see the appeal. Maybe a black market had already formed, or they would sell it to other cities. Whatever they did with the ore, Ashlock wasn't too bothered for now as he didn't care for the stuff. Even though that mine was technically under his sex control, he couldn't blame the workers for not knowing that. His sect had yet to take a stand, and he simply didn't have enough people to manage one mountain peak, let alone two. How he could go about recruiting more people was also an issue. He was a tree that couldn't communicate other than through an ancient runic language or Larry, who spoke the same. Only Stella could help bridge the gap between him and potential new sect members. Ashlock moved his vision up the mountain and looked at the White Stone Palace. It was far more presentable and majestic than the Red Vine Pavilion in every way. This peak should be where the Ash Fallen sect trains new disciples and most elders live. Ashlock mused to himself as he looked at the palace from all sides noting its massive size fit to house thousands of people, whereas Red Vine Peak can be rebuilt into a suitable place for myself, and only those closest to me can live here. Ashlock was about to conclude his ventures outside, return to the Red Vine's pavilion, and practice his spatial techniques when something caught his eye. A group of flaming red-haired cultivators donning scarlet robes emerged from the White Stone Palace's doorway with frowns on their faces, and the aged man in the middle had the gravitas of a Star Core realm expert. The man glanced to the side, and his sharp eyes landed on Red Vine Peak in the distance his frown deepened. Larry. Ashlock yelled through his tether, get Stella and go and meet this group of cultivators over at the White Stone Palace on the other mountain peak. Right now, Master. Larry asked as he crawled down from his canopy and crept over toward Stella. Yes, right now. Ashlock replied, I will open a portal to send you over. Chapter 74, Triplomacy. Stella felt giddy with excitement the skin improvement truffle had worked far better than expected, and now she held up the Deo Comprehension truffle between her fingers. She rotated the odd black mushroom ball in her hand and couldn't help but smile, thinking Tree had grown them for her. Did Ash grow this after seeing me struggle with the portal technique? Her cheeks turned rosy from embarrassment as she remembered her attempts. Ash must think I am so pitiful, Stella grumbled as she lowered her hand, took a moment to readjust her posture and put away the hand mirror she had used to check out her perfected skin. When she felt ready and in position, Stella closed her eyes and chewed slowly on the truffle, and its earthy taste filled her mouth. There were no instructions or person to guide her on unlocking the truffle's true potential, so she did what felt natural. She began to cultivate, her breathing slowed to a steady rhythm, and she silently connected her consciousness to the world around her opening up her soul core and mind to the heaven's chi. It was a faint connection as always. The heaven's will was a mystical force that was difficult to converse with and comprehend, even on the best days when Stella could enter the most profound state of meditation. Time slowed as Stella appeared within the void of her mind. Then, with every breath, Chi began to fill the space swirling around her like a gentle breeze, whispering its secrets into her ear like a cruel teacher. Always reveling just enough to give her hope of comprehension but leaving out just enough to keep her waning. A while passed, and Stella found herself no closer to the truth of spatial Chi. Half-thoughts and vague ideas swarmed her head, implanted there by the heavens' whispers, but she couldn't comprehend them. But then Stella noticed something unusual. The endless void around her began to shudder and crack, and then, in an explosion of color, the void turned into a myriad of colors. It was hard to understand anything as the whispers of heaven now became a chorus that shouted the secrets of the universe from every direction. Stella looked around frantically, her heart thumping in her chest as she panicked. She could tell this was a great opportunity but couldn't absorb everything being hollered at her. It would all be for naught if she didn't even walk away with a fundamental truth, so she focused on the one she knew best the voice she was most comfortable with. Her eyes darted between the swarming colors, located the purple stream, and focused all her attention on its knowledge. The words were so crisp and clear far superior to the incoherent mutterings she had learned from for all her life. This was the language of the immortals. She focused harder and harder. 
straining her brain to the maximum to comprehend its unfathomable words. Her eyes widened as everything became clear, her wonders were answered one by one, and she felt moments away from true enlightenment where heaven and herself comprehend each other perfectly. The ultimate goal of all cultivators. But then something dark and looming smashed through the myriad of colors, the streams dispersed, and the illusion of truth were shattered as a limb struck through her mind her eyes snapped open, and she screamed as a hairy leg covered in a layer of ash poked her on the head, and many red eyes were inches from her nose. The master calls, Larry said gruffly. Stella could feel the monster's body vibrate as it spoke through the limb poking her head. She reached up, pushed the ashen limb to the side, and scowled, I was moments away from true enlightenment. Don't you know it's rude to interrupt a cultivator when they are deep in meditation? Stella stood up and stepped back from the monster, glaring at it the whole time. I have never interrupted your sleep, so why do you disturb my cultivation? Master wants us to meet with some cultivators on the other peak, Larry spoke slowly, ensuring she could translate every word. The great tree will portal us over. Stella frowned, right now. Larry nodded. Yes. Fine. Stella sighed. Does Ash want us to kill them? Can't you do that without me? She was in a foul mood. A chance at true enlightenment had been ripped from her grasp by these cultivators abruptly arriving. Of course, she had been expecting some cultivators from the other families to turn up eventually. It wouldn't take long for news of two families being wiped out to spread and reach the ears of the other families within the Blood Lotus sect. A rift in space appeared behind Larry, and through it, Stella could see the distorted outlines of a few people with red hair. The spider gestured toward the portal, the master wants us to speak with them. No killing if possible. No killing. Stella couldn't believe it. Did Ash want to try his hand at diplomacy? Ash Locke didn't have a route connecting him to the White Stone Palace yet, so he had to wait for the red-haired cultivators to descend the mountain and enter the forest below, where his root network reached. Due to his star core, and the mycelium network providing his roots with nutrients and water, his roots were able to grow quickly now covering almost all of the area outside Dark Light City. He still needed to expand into the forests to the east, where the villages housing some mortals were, but that was a project for another time. Larry moved to wake up Stella, and he was surprised at how angry she was due to being disturbed from her cultivation. Did she consume that enlightenment truffle I gave her? That's rather annoying. Ashlock grumbled to himself. Of course, he could always grow another one, but they took weeks and quite a bit of chi to develop. Stella's annoyance also highlighted another issue. She had been cultivating in the open courtyard, where she could easily be interrupted. When Red Vine Peak is rebuilt, I will ensure to build dedicated closed cultivation abodes for my elders where they can cultivate distraction-free. Ashlock decided to put that thought on his growing list of things to attend to, but for now, he needed to focus on making a good impression. He knew the Patriarch had entered closed-door cultivation to prepare for the sex move in the near future when the Beast Tide arrived. From what Ashlock had gathered about the Blood Lotus sect, the Patriarch was the strongest, and he silently disposed of any Grand Elders that neared his cultivation realm, like the Ravenborn Grand Elder. So he should be the most powerful, and since he is in the nascent soul realm, he was, without a doubt, Ashlock's main threat. Keeping the Patriarch uninformed for as long as possible was ideal, as Ashlock was unsure how Larry or Mabel would fare against a seasoned nascent soul expert. With the cultivators reaching the base of the White Palace Peak, Ashlock poked a root out of the ground and used it as the anchor point for the short-range portal. Obviously, this technique was intended to be used at close range, possibly to redirect attacks back at the attacker, but with his body crossing such a far distance, he could cheat a little. Just a little. A rift in space appeared before the group of cultivators, and crimson blades coated in scarlet flame materialized in their hands without a word exchanged, they assumed a defensive formation encircling the star core expert at the center. Stella exited the portal first with a pop of air, and Ashlock had to admire he confidence as she stood non-disturbed before a group of cultivators with weapons drawn she crossed her arms and waited. Who are you the star core expert began, but his mouth clamped shut as Larry emerged behind Stella, his body towering over the girl and his many eyes peeking over her head. The star core expert's brows twitched, and his flickering scarlet flames mirrored his distress. The lush grass surrounding him flattened as his star core flared up and the man asserted his dominance with his cultivation. The halo of ash orbiting Larry's crown of horns spun a little faster, and all of the cultivators in the group groaned a little as their bodies struggled to resist an intense wave of gravity. Cultivators of Red Claw Stella began, I am Stella Crestfallen. What business do you have around these parts? 
She then side glanced at Larry since the Star Corps expert struggled to respond to her question with the pressure of Larry's cultivation bearing down on him, so the spider relaxed his wrath. The man straightened himself and coughed. Ahem, my name is Grand Elder Redclaw. I have come to investigate claims about a great war occurring here on sect grounds. He glanced around the forest before continuing, the scent of death is strong here, and there are scars of a quick one-sided battle. His eyes then drifted past Stella to the monster, I have a reason to believe I found the culprit. Do you have anything else to add about the situation? Stella looked over her shoulder at Larry, clearly expecting some direction on the negotiations. Ashlock noticed the Red Claws didn't explicitly state their actual reason for coming here. An investigation was acceptable, but what was their end goal? If possible, Ashlock wanted to throw them off the scent a bit, to delay them feeling the need to drag the Patriarch out from his closed-door cultivation. Luckily cultivators were cautious around hidden powers and easy to bribe. Larry, tell Stella to be vague and that you are under control. The spider opened his maw and replayed the words. Stella listened intently to the ancient language and couldn't help but smile as she saw the Star Corps expert's distress. That thing can speak. The Red Claw Grand Elder said calmly, but his clenched fist around his sword handle indicated he was far from calm. Only spirit beasts at the highest realms are intelligent enough to communicate. He is not a thing Grand Elder Red Claw. Stella glared at him, acting offended by his statement. This fine beast is Larry. He was indeed the one that wiped out the two families overnight. The Star Corps expert gulped, and his goons also shuddered as Larry's eyes looked at them individually. Stella crestfallen, forgive me. The man half bowed, but if you can sate my curiosity, what language did you two converse in? I have never heard such profound words before. With Larry's thick accent, it likely did sound rather profound and ancient. Stella smirked, it's a language from before the new era. That made the Star Corps expert furrow his brows. And how does the young Miss of House Crestfallen know how to speak such an ancient language? Ashlock wasn't sure where Stella was going with this but he could always order Larry to kill this group of Red Claw cultivators if she accidentally said something that would ruin his plans. So, for now, he sat back and enjoyed the show. Stella also seemed to be enjoying the change in power dynamic for once. Rather than being looked down on and having to run away from the other families, they were terrified of her. How else am I supposed to converse with my ancestor when he comes out of seclusion? Stella said with a grin. Did you not hear from your informants about the heavens opening up before the battle? The Red Claw Grand Elder slowly nodded, I do recall a mention of such an incident. So the opening of the heavens was not concerning. Larry, but rather your ancestor coming out of seclusion. Larry huffed in annoyance at having his great moment's purpose twisted, but the spider refrained from further action. Stella reached over and patted his leg, Larry is the guardian beast of my ancestor. His purpose was to stop people from interrupting my ancestor's cultivation. Ashlock could feel a hint of malice in her words clearly still annoyed about having her own cultivation interrupted earlier for this talk. I see. The Red Claw Grand Elder nodded, so let me get my facts straight. Your ancestor was interrupted during their cultivation, so the Guardian Beast annihilated House Winter Wrath and Evergreen in return? That seems rather unfair. How were the houses supposed to know about your ancestor? That's the thing, they weren't supposed to know, and neither should you. Stella replied with a sigh, once they found out about my ancestor they tried to invade and take over Red Vine Peak so they could use his bones and flesh for pills. They believed my ancestor had perished and was nothing but a corpse. Does the Patriarch know about this ancestor of yours? The Red Claw Grand Elder asked skeptically, from the rumors I've heard, he wants to use you as a pill furnace. Stella raised her hand to silence the man, exactly because the Patriarch spread that rumor, Red Vine Peak and myself have been left alone this entire time. Don't you find it odd that three entire families have perished here in the last year? She then shook her head sadly, the Patriarch wants to keep the truth of my ancestor a secret from the rest of the sect and has anyone that finds out wiped out. She sneered at the group, it would appear another family has to be added to the list. All of the Red Claw cultivators went pale with fear, and the Red Claw Grand Elder put his sword away and clasped his hands. Please have mercy on us. I'm sure we can come to an understanding. Would there be any way for us to meet with your ancestor to work things out? Ashlock was curious about what Stella planned to do now, and her sinister smile wasn't helping. Chapter 75, A Two-Faced Facade 
Ashlock had spent enough time around Stella to know there were two sides to the girl growing up alone and without anyone to rely on had caused her to mature faster than her peers and develop a ruthlessness that she exhibited when fighting. Ever since she'd appeared in his limited vision as a small child when he was nothing but a sapling holding a bag containing a severed head, he knew the girl had a screw loose. Stella was far more reckless than Diana, who was a bit more reserved. For example, Stella's crazy loyalty towards him almost got her killed when she impulsively tried to punch Heaven's lightning to protect him. Ashlock believed this impulsiveness was partly due to her lack of parental guidance. The fight with the Starcore Evergreen Cultivator was another good example, as Stella had charged right in, and Diana had hung back, trying to assess the situation. Because Stella charged in, she was almost decapitated. Her recklessness and disregard for danger were bad when she was on the back foot, but when she had the upper hand in the conflict, it turned her into a villainous foe that was impossible to read. Ashlock almost felt bad for the Red Claw cultivators. You want to work things out with my ancestor. Stella said in disbelief, and the Red Claw cultivators gulped again at her act. You can't even speak in the only language my ancestor understands? What could your measly family possibly offer a cultivator that had graced the lands before the new era? Stella turned her back and began to walk behind Larry, dispose of these fools and hunt down their nine generations, guardian beast. You must protect the ancestor's secret existence. The pressure returned as the halo of ash orbiting Larry's crown of horns sped up. All of the cultivators struggled to resist the veins running down their necks bulged, and blood rushed to their faces as they desperately fought the pressure. Larry opened his maw, and a wave of ash spiders poured out. They leapt forward, latching onto the cultivator's garments. The fools tried to swing their swords, but the pressure from Larry was too much. Even their own cultivation was suppressed, so burning the spiders with their soul fire was difficult. Wait. The Red Claw Grand Elder roared as the spiders crawled up his neck and into his hair. Larry ignored the Red Claw Grand Elder's plea and reached forward with a mighty limb, impaling one of the nearest cultivators and bringing the limp body to his gaping maw, biting once and swallowing it whole. The Grand Elder attempted to bring out an escape talisman from his spatial ring, but a dome of swirling ash formed around them, blocking its capabilities. They were well and truly trapped, and unlike the last time Larry had trapped someone in his cage of ash, the spider was far stronger now. Defeat for the group and the demise of the Red Claw Grand Elder was inevitable. A shame, but Ashlock trusted Stella's judgment on the matter. If her words were true, and there was no need to keep them around a quick execution was for the best. Dot. I concede, O oh great spirit beast. The Grand Elder screamed as ash spiders crawled into his open mouth, I swear upon the heavens will that I will trade my freedom for your mercy. Stella had an obscured wicked smile and whispered as she patted Larry, let them live. The wave of ash spiders ceased their assault as the Ashen King called them off with a grunt, but the pressure from Larry pinning the exhausted cultivators remained. The Red Claw Grand Elder collapsed to his knees and yelled as blood spewed from his mouth onto the lush grass below, Stella crestfallen, I pledge my loyalty to you. Please accept my pledge of devotion and spare my family. Your secret will be safe with us. All the men furiously nodded and grunted in agreement with their grand elder. Stella strode over, placed a single finger under the man's chin, and slowly raised his weary eyes to meet hers. The sun shone from behind, casting an eerie shadow and obscuring Stella's wicked expression. Ashlock could tell she was taking out her anger on them from having her enlightenment interrupted and enjoying every second of it. Do not pledge your loyalty to me. Rather hold the Ash Fallen sect in reverence. Ash Fallen section. The man mumbled the words as if they were foreign, May I know more about this elusive Ash Fallen sect? I fear I have never heard its magnificent name before. Stella gripped his chin with her nails, and the man groaned. No further question. Make the oath first, and then we can talk. There was a wavering resolve in the man's eyes, but he tensed up and nodded when he saw Larry crawl a step forward and loom into view. He brought a hand to his chest and closed his eyes. I, Grand Elder of the Red Claw family, pledge my loyalty to the Ash Fallen section. He took a deep breath as the Chi of Heaven swirled around him, if my loyalty is to falter, may my cultivation be forever crippled and my heart demons unleashed upon my unfaithful soul. The other Red Claw family members followed their Grand Elder's movements and words, pledging their loyalty. Ashlock watched in interest and saw the man win CE as he finished the vow. Could the heavens really manage something like contracts? It seemed so alien and weird of a concept to Ashlock, but to be fair, if the heavens can bend reality, why couldn't they do something as simple as a soul contract? Stella nodded and released her vice grip on the Grand Elder's chin, leaving some nasty marks, 
the Ash Fallen sect is built around my ancestor. The Patriarch is but a simple Grand Elder of the Ash Fallen section. The Red Claw Grand Elder let out a shaky breath as he processed the entirely made-up words. Your ancestor must truly be an ancient immortal to lord over the Patriarch. Absolutely. My ancestor is a rather tall fellow. Stella smiled, but it was far from a kind smile as it didn't reach her ears. But he is also benevolent to those that show faith and loyalty to the Ash Fallen sect. So if you work hard, reaching the next realm before your lifespan expires isn't impossible. A spark of hope was seen in the aging Grand Elder's weary eyes. Ashlock realized that if the man was to reach the next realm, he would become a semi-immortal as those in the nascent soul realm could transfer themselves into a new vessel and cultivate from scratch again or so he had heard from Stella in the past. But out here in the lawless wilderness, few seemed to reach the nascent soul realm before being killed. Even the Grand Elder of House Ravenborn had two families sent after him to dispose of him before he could consolidate his new cultivation base and prepare a body for his infant soul. Ashlock couldn't help but feel proud of Stella. She had managed to spin a plausible story that wouldn't hold up to enough scrutiny, but making it sound so secretive would stop these Red Claw fellows from spilling the beans too soon, especially to the Patriarch. Larry. Ashlock pulled on the black tether as Stella seemed unsure of what to do with these new disciples of the Ash Fallen sect. He then explained his plans to the spider, and the Red Claws shivered as the spider slowly relayed Ashlock's instructions with the blood and guts of their Eden brother dripping from his fangs. Hmm, I see. Stella nodded to herself as she stalled for time to translate the ancient words in her head. She then scanned the group of red-haired cultivators still kneeling on the ground, you. She pointed to a random guy with a scar on his cheek that was kneeling next to a red-haired girl. Yes, mistress. The man hesitantly replied. Gather everyone from your family, Stella said and then pointed up at the White Stone Palace, that palace will be your family's new home. Any Red Claws who don't come here and swear an oath of loyalty to the Ash Fallen sect will be hunted down and consumed by the Spirit Beast. A plume of ash vacated Larry's nostrils as he snorted. Why yes. The Red Claw with the scar got up to his legs, still shaking. I will leave right away to gather the others. Good. Stella nodded to him, and make sure to bring supplies and people such as maids, chefs, builders and anyone else you need, as we cannot provide any. The man gave a deep bow and took off running. He then yelped as Ashlock opened a portal right before him, causing the man to stumble through the rift and instantly appear halfway across the forest. The man blinked in confusion as the view of Dark Light City's wall came into view. Ashlock kept an eye on the man for a while longer, but he didn't even pause to grab lunch or talk to anyone. Instead, he just barreled down the street like a crazed person toward the airship dock in the city center with orange fire blazing around his feet, giving him the desired speed. Does that loyalty thing really work? Ashlock was skeptical. From the sounds of the oath they made, their cultivation would be crippled if they betrayed their new overlords, which was basically a death sentence for any cultivator, especially if their heart demons were unleashed, causing them to end up in a similar state to Diana. So it wasn't so much as mind control, and they could still betray him. They would just sacrifice themselves to do so. Not a foolproof solution then, but it works as a band-aid to keep them quiet for now. Ashlock mused as he returned his sights to the forest, hopefully, we can raise some actual loyal people before the whole lie gets revealed. Ashlock now knew he was operating on borrowed time. He needed to reach nascent soul realm or train someone up to that level before the Patriarch left closed-door cultivation, which could be any time from now until just before the beast tide. Looking back at Stella, Ashlock saw her showing the Red Claw Grand Elder a stack of parchments with a sweet smile. Grand Elder, these are my notes of the ancient language. Please learn it in due time, so my ancestor may converse with you in the near future. There was some merit in keeping the ancient language to themselves as a sort of secret language, but considering Stella could learn it in a year from public records in the library, trying to gatekeep it from others in the Ash Fallen sect seemed counterproductive. If the Red Claws learned the ancient language, Ashlock could converse directly by writing on the wall or sending Larry to talk with them. Stella deserved to not be interrupted from her cultivation whenever he needed to talk with them. There was also the bonus of him being able to order the Red Claws around to do menial tasks directly. The Grand Elder bowed as he took the notes, I will have these copied out, and the originals returned by the weekend, mistress. Then, with a flash of silver, the stack of parchments vanished into his spatial ring. Does the mistress require my family or me for anything else? Not for now. Stella replied and waved them off, you may settle into your new residence. I may come by in a few days to discuss your future within the Ash Fallen sect in more detail. 
As you wish. We will then excuse ourselves. The Grand Elder bowed, and they left to ascend the mountain's path. Stella watched the departing family's backs with her hands crossed beneath her chest. Her smile turned into a nasty scowl that sullied her face, and Ashlock could tell she was furious. Ashlock decided making her wait around in the forest would only sour her mood further, so he opened a portal nearby. Stella side-eyed the rift with a sigh, you know if you didn't interrupt me for these fools, I could make portals too. As she stomped through the portal and popped back into existence in front of his trunk, Ashlock summoned up the magic mushroom production menu and set many more truffles to grow. The mushrooms in the garden courtyard also had many valuable effects that could be harnessed by turning them into pills and creams with alchemy. Some might have even been of interest to Stella. Ashlock wanted to ask Stella to either start learning alchemy or find someone who knew, but her mood seemed far too foul to request anything of her at the moment. Ashlock decided to wait and see. Maybe one of the Red Claws was well versed in alchemy. Stella ignored him and strode into the adjacent courtyard with the runic formation grumbling and cursing to herself the entire way and sat down in its center. The formation of grey stone engraved with silver lines lit up with a purple hue when she cycled her chi. Ash, I will not be happy if you interrupt me again. She shouted toward the central courtyard as if he couldn't hear her, and then with a huff, she tossed the remaining truffle into her mouth the one that would improve her spirit root. Ashlock chuckled and vowed to leave her alone this time. In truth, he likely could have waited a while longer before demanding she went to meet with the Red Claws, but he hadn't known she was in the middle of enlightenment. So it was his fault, and he felt terrible for it. While she was busy improving her spirit root Ashlock calmed his mind, cycled his chi, and focused on a random stick hiding amongst the purple grass of the central courtyard. It was time for him to try and self-learn telekinesis. In fact, telekinesis was pushed even higher up his list of necessary skills with the Red Claws moving in next door. If his portals could be used wherever his roots were, then logically, so could telekinesis. If he grew a root up to the White Palace Mountain's peak, he could talk to the Grand Elder through a stick of chalk by controlling it from afar. Ashlock planned to maintain his elusive persona for as long as possible, as he doubted the Red Claw Grand Elder would be thrilled to learn that he was taking orders from a spirit tree of all things.